Greetings and salutations, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the Archcast with our guest for today being Maka from the Outer Circle. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Just lovely. Let's see. Uh, two super chats snuck their way in uh, just before we started, so you to wipe those off the log, obviously, as it does. So let me just do those quick before we get into it. Otherwise, I will forget, and then Desert Hamster will be neither sadder Serbian than he already is. True. Uh, Mate Svek says, "Hi Arch, will you ever do a Necromunda gang series? Never say never. Possibly. Maybe. Maybe." And Desert Hamster says, you should get Lindsay Ellis to marry Movie Blob. That would be funny. Unfortunately, I still believe that it is semi-illegal to forcibly marry someone in the US. Not to my knowledge. Might okay. depend on the state. Well, never mind then. It is, in fact, entirely legal to force someone to marry someone against their will in the United States, according to our legal expert, Kyle. I think he's deaf. I don't think he can hear what I say. <laughs> I think that's fine. Right, well, shotgun weddings aside, we are going to talk primarily today about uh, GWU aren't we? Because they put out their investor report not too long ago. It contains some interesting passages and a lot of obfuscation here and there, which came out last uh, Tuesday, as their stocks continue their ever more steady downward decline. They are now at their lowest point for over a year, last I checked. They're still above the uh, the lowest point uh, last year, like pre-COVID, because COVID has given them an enormous boost. Uh, but they are steadily heading back towards the 2019 levels of uh, value. So, Maka, why do you think uh, GWR, you know, representing the Hindenburg on this occasion, uh, well, first things first, when it comes to financial reports, they always, this is any company, will use fluffy speech to try and disguise the reality, because they really just want to please the shareholders. And the last thing they want to do is tell their shareholders the bad things that are happening, because who wants honesty and transparency when it comes to managing finances? Uh, I think the big, th yeah, the, the big thing with Games Workshop, though, is that there's a few passages of where they say things, and it's what's not being said in those passages that you've really got to look at. Uh, but we'll obviously get to some of those. Uh, but it all starts even from like the first line, where they're saying, we're on the front foot and confident in our ability to continue to deliver our strategy. Then you've got to go, what is their strategy? And you don't find their strategy until you go about three, four pages down. And then they're saying what their strategy is, is to continue to make the best miniatures in the world, in ever-increasing volumes, and to engage and inspire our customers new and old. Do you think they are doing those things? Well, I wouldn't even say that's a strategy. That's a, we don't really know what we're doing, but we're going to continue doing the things that sound good. Hell, I would even start to argue that uh, GW's stranglehold on the miniature quality scene is beginning to to wane. If anything, the only part of actual strategy involved there is the increase in production, because they have been messing up massively for a very long time now, being unable to actually deliver the product people have paid for, in some cases over the course of months. Um, even in the more extreme cases, refusing refunds to actually hand out those products. Yeah, very interesting to see that, because we had uh, a few debacles I noted in my live streams where customers had gone to them and pre-ordered, and then they'd not received their pre-orders before the local stores had actually received their orders. So these customers then turned around and said, well, you haven't even shipped my pre-order yet. Um, why don't I just cancel my pre-order? Because there's no actual physical product on the line yet. And I'll just buy the parts instead from my local store. And the company did not want to do that, which I do believe is very, very illegal in my country. But 
I can't speak for others. I know they've been having a lot of problems with their um, delivery routes as of recently. A uh, a few GW store managers tend to email me when they get particularly uh, displeased, shall we say, with GW. It's been more than normal uh, recently, because even though they are ordering things, a lot of it just has not been arriving in the quantity they've been expecting, and stuff like pre-order lists have been almost useless in certain places, because they don't have enough. And so they almost have to do raffles to figure out who's going to get what. And that's GW's success kind of shooting themselves a little bit in the foot, as they have been quite aggressive with some fairly decent boxes recently as well. But it also makes me think like, okay, so they've finished their factory upgrade, right? They've increased their capabilities. Why are they still having all of these issues? Because they started doing this like two years ago. I'm kind of expecting that they might be printing less than anybody than they are expecting to sell, kind of to keep up the hype, because they were riding a huge wave there under COVID, which when they saw that starting to peter off, maybe they tried to create an artificial demand? I don't know. Yeah, so I'm a little bit curious, uh, because I was actually reading up in the latest section, which I'm sure we'll get to, talking about the actual amount of machinery they've installed. And with the amount of staff available and the machinery they've got, they should be producing way more than they appear to be producing. They really should, because they started this expansion years ago now, and they have a lot of room now, tons of room. They've got good amounts of employees. It might be that they're just not utilizing their machines in an effective way, I guess, but oh, if anything, that makes it worse. It could, could be. Uh, so for those who don't know, I am actually run a plastic injection molding factory. So I understand a lot of what goes into the machine process. Like, you know, I've done die setting, run the machines, understand the materials, you know, I run one. So when I look at Games Workshop and I compare it to my own factory, I go, okay, they've got X amount of machines. This is the type of material they're casting with. This is what they should be able to achieve. And the numbers don't sync up from where I'm sitting. But I'm sure we'll get there. Um, yeah, so going into the interim uh, management report, which is the uh, third page of the document, it's very interesting to see that they actually started off by saying Games Workshop and the Warhammer Hobby are in great shape. I'm curious about how you actually define that or measure it. This is where the fluffy speech sort of comes into it. What do you define well, as great shape? Great shape. I would probably say that, I mean, they're correct in a way. COVID has been tremendously useful for them. Interestingly enough, they, they don't mention that, which... It would go against the narrative, I suppose, if they say that, oh, hey, as a company, we've actually benefited tremendously from COVID. And yet that is absolutely the truth. So financially speaking, they are in very good shape. They've had an incredible year, hell, incredible two years now, with the steady decline beginning now, and we'll have to see how far that goes. But beyond the mere, the, the simply financial, like there's... There's so many questions to talk about when it comes to the long-term longevity of Warhammer in its current form. Because as I've said on multiple occasions, I think you've mentioned this as well, I think that they're starting to slowly but surely move away from miniatures and beginning to monetize their IP, as they say, in different ways. One of those being, of course, Warhammer Plus, which was very much so their flagship effort the last year to try and launch this into the mainstream and get a different revenue source on a steady basis on subscriptions rather than just the sale of miniatures, which they don't seem to be putting enough resources and time into actually creating. So do we define this as their current financial situation? Do we look at this in terms of their effort to try and get the broader appeal, the mainstream audience? It's a question we almost have to define the answer to before we can begin answering it. Well, again, that, that fluffy talk in that interim management report, like that whole second paragraph, well, I suppose it's third if you count the first sentence of it as its own paragraph, but they're talking about the resilience of their global team and how 
you know, COVID has hit them so hard with travel restrictions. And they, I don't think travel restrictions have hit them particularly hard at all. In fact, I think the only part of their operation that really suffered was their brick and mortar stores with people being unable to actually go in, pick up product at their local gaming stores. Games Workshop's online sales seem to have had no problem because all throughout uh, the entire of the last couple of years, every release they've done, you notice that it always was sold out, except for Age of Sigma version 3. Being Age of Sigma. Well, it's an interesting thing you bring up too, because they, they do mention the whole uh, COVID several times with how they're dealing with it, how it's their foremost priority health-wise, blah, 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 blah. But again, if it has hit them, nobody's noticed beyond the brick and mortar stores, which undoubtedly have seen a, uh, a fall. And we also saw that in the decrease in trade last year, which has only now started to uh, pick its way back up again. What's, what's their main now? Uh, hang on. So the very interesting thing is when you get to that third paragraph, if you, if you want some real corporate doublespeak, they say, we are proud and humbled most days with the feedback that we receive, particularly that the Warhammer hobby continues to be a happy place for most people. Who's giving them feedback? That's just, just a, you know, a point of note. When do we actually get to give them feedback? And when is that feedback taken on board? I'm assuming they're basing this entirely of their heavily curated social media feed, basically. Like, they're looking at their Twitter profile, for which they block and ban people if they speak the wrong words, or even just raise questions. Uh, there was one person uh, recently, he had the audacity to uh, respond to their uh, community post, where it's like, there's no heroes in 40k, and he said that, actually, uh, I'm quite fond of the Ultramarines, and I think they are heroes. They blocked him from that. Very interesting to note with that, because they uh, have been trying to position the Imperium, and especially the Space Marines, as their poster children and the good guys, you know, really watering down the Grimdark, you could say, ever since 8th edition 40k, where it's really become a case of black and white Imperium good, and putting them up against black and white evil forces ever since then. So, you know, who the Ultramarines had to face? Well, they've had to face the Death Guard, they've had to face the Thousand Suns, they've had to face um, the Necrons. All of these things are being portrayed as objectively the bad guys. I mean, the Necrons, you don't follow the Necrons, do you, through the 9th edition 40k trailer. You follow a sister of battle and then the Ultramarines coming to her rescue. So when they have statements like that where they say there are no good guys and yet they seem to go out of their way with their marketing to show one side as being the good guys. Well, that's, not, that's the other thing, too. When they say there are no good guys, it's bullshit. <laughs> we know this. And yet it is the, it's, it's the modern-day disavowal of it. Um, we had a long talk with, a talk with Sargon on this as well, where they will not win this marketing battle, because what they're trying to do, they're trying to virtue signal when they say this, they're trying to go like, oh, it's a very dark and horrible universe. We don't condone any of this, whilst also condoning it. And amusingly enough, the people they are virtue signaling to are not having any of it either. But to get back on track for a second there, the feedback they are receiving that they are saying is positive is, I believe, almost coming entirely from that social media team, which is also, again, heavily curating their own feeds and what feedback is allowed to make it to them. So it's literally, it's the blind leading the blind at this point. And, you know, that wouldn't surprise me. And, again, just to remind the people, these corporate documents are always full of fluffy speech uh, because they want to hide the realities of the situation. So they will turn around to their shareholders and such like they are in this document and say we have great feedback from our customers and no one will actually question that mm -hmm. because why would they that's uh, that's what they want to hear yes except i think this is part of why the shares are taking such a dip at the moment is because some of the shareholders have cottoned onto it and going hang on a minute 
what happened with this whole uh, like text to speech and such on the internet? Yeah, that's a thing too. I that's a, that's a bit strange, and it seems that they're no go on. Oh, your internet lagged a bit, so I thought you were done speaking. So I was about to launch into my own thing. Ah, go for it. Uh, but yeah, to to briefly um point out that because you're entirely right. Um, a lot of the shareholders in Forty K are actually fans of Forty K because you got to remember, Games Workers only actually became a big quote unquote company over the course of the last five, six years tops. Before that, a lot of their investors and owners were actually a bunch of fairly small, enthusiastic people. And when they start hearing that fan animations are being wiped out, they do react. I've received several emails from people who uh, claim to be, uh, you know, shareholders. I can't confirm that, but, you know, I believe, uh, believe them. And they tend to be rather pissed off about this because it is a very obvious misstep. And if they're not read in to the wider strategy, which I don't think they are, because you can notice in the um, in the entire document, the only mention of Warhammer Plus is basically that it launched and it's totally doing fine. Trust us. There's no mention of where it fits into their broader strategy. Well, it's its own new strategy, isn't it? Because as we think, they're trying to do something else uh with their IP. Mm -hmm. And so naturally that's going to freak out the shareholders because what they see is a service that nobody seems to like that is ruining the best free marketing in the history of the internet, pretty much. And that is why their stocks are taking it up. Despite, I read an article which was basically scratching its head, going like, hold on, GW is doing really well. Like They've earned a lot of money during COVID. Their fundamentals are solid. They've got tons of money. Why is their stock tanking? And it's because it's from the outside perspective looking in, going like, okay, well, traditionally speaking, this is all solid. But later on, they mention all of the anger within the actual fandom. And until GW fully finishes their transition, it is still us, the old school fans, who are propping GW up, and you can see a lot of the uh, discontentment with their recent decisions being reflected in the skepticism in the market. When you get to the uh, growth section as well, in their interim management report, they talk about how they had uh, delivered uh, record sales uh, performance at constant currency rates and this and that, and then they get down to the uh, next section report that we continue to perform well in most countries, the exception being Australia. Now, they're blaming the restrictions here for it, and that is true to an extent, but it was only really my state that was locked down for the better part of a whole year. The other states weren't affected too heavily. So what that says to me is that they're trying to hide a little bit of the reality, which is that they've finally hit the point, in my country at least, where they're selling the product for higher than the customer is willing to pay. They finally reached that breaking point because uh, it's it's an inevitability that they've been pushing towards for quite some time globally, but particularly in Australia too, where uh, as a people, uh, you are getting fucked by literally every corporation, pretty much. Feels great. I'm sure it feels, does. Feels, feels really great when you pay like 30% more because of your postcode. Not even because of shipping, like the product will be, you pay the shipping, you know, and yet you still get charged more. Feels fantastic. Because there, there's another thing too, so a slight, uh, slight deviation before hopefully getting back on track again. A lot of my uh, Australian friends have also talked to me about this. Like a lot of us um, non-prisoners, uh, we hear on the news that Australia is going hard crazy with insane lockdowns, incredibly straight up fascistic rule in certain areas. And it sounds like it's the whole country, but it isn't. It's actually a fairly small section that has gone full batshit and is doing most of it. And a lot of it for the protection of the Aboriginal population as well. Well, they say that, but uh, the reality is the Aboriginal population is not really located in and around your COVID hotspots. So they're much more, as a majority, you know, um, located centrally in Australia, away from the big cities, regional towns, 
uh, and regional towns haven't really been hit hard at all by it because of the heavy-handed lockdowns. So we spent over 270-odd days locked down in my state, um, and that's the full-on, pretty much the only ones that got to work were people doing like rubbish and food. Everything else was just closed. And yeah, the, the Aboriginal community is not really, they're being locked down, but they were very isolated from it to begin with. There were country towns like my, my town went a year without a single case. So, yeah, it was very excessive um, by our government, and I won't go into it because, yeah, I will go down that rabbit hole and spew fire and brimstone at my government. I don't blame you. <laughs> but yeah, the, uh, the biggest reason why they're the probably world. failing... <laughs> <Get out. laughs> the, the lag is playing havoc on our ability to communicate. It is. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I too think that your idea is more correct, namely that they've finally hit that pain threshold in Australia where people are going, I'm not paying like two times the price for plastic miniatures at this point. And I hear that a lot from Games Workshop managers. I know a lot of Games Workshop managers all around this country, um, for better or worse. Some were people that I used to game with when I was a teenager. Some I've met since, you know, adulthood and through my 30s and but a lot of them don't have faith in the brand long term. I mean, a lot of managers. It's not just one or two here and there. You know, so anyone listening goes, "Oh, it must be your local games workshop or whatever." No, no, it's. I'm talking guys in Queensland, guys in Western Australia. They say, you know, I, I don't see it. We're not getting the foot traffic, and the biggest lack that they're getting is a lack of fresh blood that they're retaining. People are coming in, people are buying kits off the shelves. You know, they buy a starter kit, the the FOMO, the hype, whatever you want to call it. They see it, they think it's cool, they get their parents to buy it or whatever, and then they never see that kit again. Yeah, this is one of those things too, because um, if we're going to start talking properly about how well GW is doing overall, we got to talk about their whole transitioning, what they're moving towards. And one of the things that they were trying to move more and more towards was that introduction of kids into the market. And in my opinion, that was as a move of the overall strategy to try and get uh, more mainstream, more casualized. But the problem is they're focusing too heavily on the extremes again. Meanwhile, the regular fans the regular hobbyists are being forgotten and especially in the hobby stores like i've heard so many stories from managers basically saying that their gw contact person is almost their worst enemy in this because stuff like demo games or events the kind of stuff that is for the hobbyist to come join have fun create an environment create a community all of that they are not supposed to be doing it at all no, and you hear it a lot from especially former Games Workshop staff like um, Northern Exile, great example, talks about it, how their staff trainers and company people would come down and say to them, like, what are you doing? What are you having these people in for? You know, you're supposed to be driving sales. And these staff would try and explain it to their, you know, quote unquote superiors that, hey, if I host an event, people are, you know, it's a, it's a slow grow league or something. People are coming in. They're buying kits to participate directly in the event. That's how I'm driving the sales at this store. The sales mm -hmm. that are making up the majority of the money this store is making. It's bump being done by these veterans who are dropping all their money on a brand new army just to participate in a store event. And those veterans are the ones being driven away because instead some guy who's from management has no care for the game, was hired entirely because of his business sense, you know, just a typical salesperson, is the guy who's managing these stores not a former store staffer? They have a very different view of how the business should be run from the people who are actually in the stores. And I usually get the, uh, the things too, that the middle managers, there's some good ones in there too. They're not all bad by any stretch of the imagination. There are people who genuinely do understand the problem but their hands are tied. Like This directive isn't just a bunch of middle manager assholes who come in and get a power trip because they've finally been given some influence. 
this is coming down from the top, so there's very little anyone can really do about it. And it's a real shame, too, because I think a lot of the store managers, most of them are pretty good. Um, they're only dry-humping your wallet because they're doing it on command for the people above them. Um, but they've got the right idea. They're trying to grow their community because they understand that at some point, if you don't try and grow your community, you don't keep sinking resources into it, your community is going to whittle away and you will not survive just on that random kids coming into your store and selling them a box. If they come into that store and the store is deserted of people, what is going to make them want to stay? They're going to go, oh, this is popular, an empty store. Yeah, because that's the thing too. The reason why GW is in the position where it is on the verge of going mainstream and has become a topic of conversation in a lot of the more mainstream newspapers as well is because of that core fandom. Like, we were the ones who created GW, to say it straight out, and we will probably be the ones to destroy it, too, if they keep heading in this weird direction. As it's not a new thing that GW has been moving more and more away from their established customers. It's just over the last couple of years that they have truly had a direction to do it in towards the mainstream, towards Warhammer Plus, and more directly away from the core fandom. It's it's a really bizarre uh, set of priorities they've got on their hands because the veterans, okay, call me biased, veterans won't be around forever, truly, but we are the ones who, you know, created these YouTube channels who have been talking about their war and doing all the things that they basically have neglected for their entire existence. They could have started the YouTube channel, you know, 15 years ago and and filled it full of interesting content and really dominate the market. They wouldn't be having to do takedowns and uh, Warhammer YouTubers if they themselves had got in early enough there wouldn't have been a need for Warhammer YouTubers instead they've come in really late to the party like uh, someone like you know CBS All Access they saw the success of someone like Netflix and went oh we can have the exact same level of success if, if we, we just totally do know, that yeah just copy their business model right it's that easy it's not like the market's already saturated and then you've got Warhammer Plus, which is looking at CBS All Access and going, we can copy that. <laughs> uh, good luck to them. But if you've got no content to offer and you're charging as much as a traditional streaming service, uh, when it comes time for people to decide what they're going to spend their limited amounts of disposable cash on, what do you think they're going to pick? There's also the uh, the fact that their the YouTube channel like, as as well is an excellent example of GW's attitude towards the fan. It is a one hundred percent one way street. the The comments are turned off. They don't want to hear from you. They're not interested in what you have to say. To them, their YouTube channel is not a place for law. It's not a place for the hobby. It's not a place for the gaming. It is another advertisement window that they hope people will be stupid enough to subscribe to. I think one of the best things they have done in a long time is doing some reworking of the Orcs and the Craft World Elder. The Orcs is an interesting one because they completely, I won't swear, but they, they F-handed the handling of the orcs with having a box set, which is, you know, half choppers and melee and the other half is shooters. Uh, they do not mix. It's either you make it so that all the models can be one or the other. You can't have a mix of both because they do neither job well and nobody's taking it on the tabletop. It shows a disconnect from the actual game. Uh, and the Eldar, of course, well, great. It's finally time that they got a rework because those Eldar kits were already, you know, some of them were already been out for some time when I got into the hobby in 1994. So it's great that they're doing it, but why did it take so long? If they were listening to the fans, they should have been doing an Eldar rework nearly 10 years ago because they've got kits in their range now that they've been charging full price for. They've been constantly jacking the prices on and those kits are over 30 years old and they look like they're over 30 years old. And then they wonder why people aren't buying those particular factions because it's a chore. It's expensive. Who wants to get, uh, you know, striking scorpions or handling banshees and, and, and they all fell over at the ankle because they were made of crap cast? Nobody. Uh, it's not worth sinking your money and time into. And then 
you know, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where all these ranges that potentially they have massive growth in because it's closer to being their own thing, their own IP, uh, they don't grow it because they spend too much time fixated on the Imperium, which has all these nice new kits and they're easy to build and such. So, I mean, great work for them and good job to them for finally getting around to them, but it shouldn't have taken 30 years to do an Eldar. Well, that too is... I, we, we were going to talk uh, quite a bit about GW's detachment because it is the fundament upon which everything else rests in terms of how they're they're messing up because they do not value their customers and they have been incredibly spoiled for the longest time for literally decades they have been able to put out a kit which they don't update which grows older and older and older and older and older I think some of the oldest kits on the market was um how Ah, oh, I looked into this a while ago. I think there were actually like a decade old models. I I have uh, pictures in my Warhammer 40k second and third edition rule books that show you most of the existing aspect warriors and the avatar of Kang. Uh, even yeah. in 1998, the avatar of Kang was already about five, six years old. Yeah, it's they're old. <laughs> There are people who weren't even uh, weren't even born uh, when the Avatar of Cain was released, and those people are in their twenties and thirties. Yeah, and yet, year. and yet, despite of that incredible um, age, have they ever gotten cheaper? No, they've only gone up in price. Uh, in fact, one of the craziest things is when they went from white metal, which is uh, about seventeen times more expensive than resin by the by, uh, the prices actually went up on the kits when they went to Finecast, even though white mm-hmm. metal is a lot more expensive than resin. And, and that's, I mean, that's, that's, an, a, that's a whole other too. conversation too. Like they're, how they, they told us literally that this was going to make everything so much cheaper and it made everything so much more expensive. But without even getting into that, the, the core of the point is any other business... If you have an old product, it will eventually decrease in cost to allow people to continue to buy it. It is an almost inevitable necessity. But GW have been so spoiled with such a loyal and dedicated fan base that they have been able to not only maintain prices of shit massively outdated, they have been able to increase those prices in keeping with inflation. Don't just forget, uh, they also drop the amount of models they would sell you in a box at the same time as they increase those prices. Just to double down on the salt in the wound on that one. Uh, great example, I think Corn Berserkers. Corn Berserkers kit is from, they were one of the first plastic kits uh, in the mid to late 90s. And that same Corn Berserker kit is the same kit you're using today. And that die has well and truly paid for itself. In, in that time frame. Yes. And, and yet here we are, still paying top dollar. And I just want to hammer that point home, because at no point has the fans betrayed GW. We have supported them above and beyond any reasonable expectation for any goddamn company. And yet, we're still not their key focus. And maybe they're finally starting to... Um, Suffer the consequence from that? I damn well hope so, but there are still far too many people who will defend them at any cost, regardless of what they do. And, you know, Kyle, we've been ignoring you for a bit. You've been sitting there, poor, sad, and alone, haven't no, you? No, actually, I've been listening. Because, honestly, I don't really follow Games Workshop, and I actually do listen to Maka's videos, which is the perfect time to shill his channel right now. Uh, Let me get a link to it real quick. I'm subscribed. Mute that real. But yeah, I've I've listened to a few of his videos about it because I'm I am woefully I naive when it comes to the whole Games Workshop thing because I told you ages ago when the end times thing was happening I went to Games Workshop for the first time forever right and this dude pitched like these these Warhammer Fantasy models to me and I was like holy shit this sounds so cool I want to get into this this sounds cool and right. And then the end time stuff happens, and then I found out that the world blows up, and that none of that really mattered, and they're just gonna reset it, and you're gonna have to buy new minis and whatnot. And um, I was very mad 
so I I left. I was like, nope, I'm not gonna buy Warhammer stuff. I didn't mind Warhammer video games, but I I was not big on the miniatures after that point at all. <laughs> but uh, you and I are both fans of another franchise that is kind of in in a little bit of the same vein, and that is uh, Creative Assembly's Total War, oh, where boy. they too have been able to rely on a tremendous amount of goodwill whilst continuously shafting their core of fans more and more. Remember the debacles, oh. the two, or two debacles that they had with Rome, Rome 2, and that release date, and then making Chaos a DLC faction for pre-ordering on Warhammer. Like, of mm-hmm. all the... All the factions you would do it to. Tell me that's not holding people hostage. Oh, you're not wrong. We could complain about this forever. The fact that you need all three games to bit to make the map pieces come together in order to play with your friends. If I found out recently, by the way, if someone has Total Warhammer 2 and your friend has Total Warhammer 1 and 2 and he hosts a game and you only have the second one, if you, you can't join his game if he hosts the Mortal, Mortal Empires map or something along that line, and I thought that was the most ridiculous thing I think I've ever heard. Like, it's already bad enough that they're selling, selling faction DLC, right? That's something they've always done. But they, they said they would never do, like, uh, what was it, unit packs. And they sell us lord packs, is what they call them, right? With the two lords. Yes. And it slowly completes the roster. So you need multiple lord packs to complete the Skaven faction. If I buy Total War Armor 2 to get the Skaven for the third one, right? That should be all the Skaven. No, you need to buy every one of the DLCs to get all the Skaven. And now, if you want the complete Beastman army, you need to buy Total Warhammer 1. You need to buy the Beastman for Total War Warhammer 1. Then you need to buy Total Warhammer 2 and buy the DLC for the Beastman to get the rest of their unit pack uh, for their armies. Uh, then you need to buy Total Warhammer 3 to get access to the third map. <laughs> and that's 60 bucks a pop. Oh, it's criminal. It doesn't help that most of those lords packs as well are the ones that you really want to play because either you've got a real attraction to them from the game background history or because they're really powerful in game and have good abilities for your force that that hurts when when you don't have access to them it's like i am not a Tyrion fan for example um but i am a fan of imric and i'm a fan of altharion so you know getting a hold of those was more important to me and going into total warhammer 3 Chaos Dwarves don't seem to be uh, a faction that they're too keen on implementing straight away, but they've gone out and from scratch built Cathay. Like, yep, really? That's your priority? Yeah, not the not even because the Chaos it's China. Dwarves. Oh, it's annoying. It's it is China. That's why they have been salivating over the Chinese market for a long time, despite the fact that none of their products have actually been accepted in China. Not a one. They can still sell them over Steam, which is the Steam International version, which is still partially accessible in China, up until who knows, anyways. But they are desperate for that market, and so they would rather scratch build an entire faction than reintroduce the Chaos Wars. If, if actually, I'm going to bring it up a little early now because you've mentioned China, but in this report, they talk about breaking the Chinese market. And uh, they say, and I'll quote it first so we can talk about it, we've been producing our core products in Mandarin for years using translation agencies, but in this period, we moved all translation in-house to improve consistency and quality of our offer in this key market. Although suffering from disruptions in global shipping, there is a steady flow of new miniatures for our other intellectual properties, IPs, such as Blood Bowl, Necromunda, as we continue to provide customers with even more depth of choice. China is a really, really tough market to break into. I don't think Games Workshop appreciates this. So I'm Australian, which means I'm Asia-Pacific based. And being in industry in Australia means dealing with China, and I deal with China a lot. Games Workshop has almost no clue what they're doing in China, because China is not one homogenous entity like people like to portray it as. China is full of these little mini-cultures within it. You know, especially around, like, say, Hong Kong, where the British were, is one way, versus, you know, Shanghai is a completely different way. Far Western China is a different way. And they're treating it like they can just go in there and just, oh, well, every other company's in China and has a share of the Chinese market. We'll just do the same thing as them and, you know, profit. Forgetting the fact that their IP is full of things like the supernatural, 
Okay, China does not like the supernatural. The people might, but the government of China that has a vested monetary interest in all companies in China does not like those things. And uh, to speak to the point of Creative Assembly, I think it's the same thing there. Creative Assembly thinks that you know something like Three Kingdoms would, would pull them into the Chinese market, and then they're trying to go total warhammer into the Chinese market. Well, it's full of ghosts and things like that. They don't like that. The government is really against depictions of the supernatural over there. It's because these companies don't understand the market they're trying to get into. Like, they... They think this is just be like any other market in the world. They'll just make a product and they'll just move in there and that's fine. You don't need to worry about anything. They fail to understand that China is an entirely different beast from almost any other country they're operating in. There are very different rules in China and they are completely unaware of those. Like they think that translating their stuff to Mandarin is like, oh, there you go. You'll, you'll let us sell our products there now, right? No. I, I bet you $100 right now, Australian, which is like uh, three American dollars, one, one um, British pound, it feels like, um, that if you translated into, didn't even bother translating, just shipped in English, you'd probably succeed better in China shipping in English than you would shipping in Mandarin. Probably. They'd have a hard time reading it. But not just that. Uh, the people doing the translating don't have the the feel of the local lingo. So whilst it's broadly a Chinese language, uh, it's going to work really well around some cities. And the minute it goes outside of that and try to get into the regional market, good luck. Because remember, China is a very, very rural country. As much as they portray it as being this modern urban utopia, most of China is still out in the farms. And if you want to get those, you know, billion customers, well, you're going out to the farms to get them. Somehow, I doubt that's going to happen with GW, but we will we'll wait and see. They have already fulfilled one of the key requirements, which is to manufacture stuff in China, as they have um, they've given them a lot of the scenery box set, amongst other things, to basically have something there, because you must produce in China to be allowed to sell in China. That is correct. They also are uh, produced through a subsidiary called Panda Games. Uh, that's what they produced, like the Betrayal at Kelf, the Burning Prospero, and a couple of other games uh, of their box sets that they released, which is a Canadian-owned, but the guys who own it are Chinese nationals. So it's technically a Canadian company, but it's really a Chinese company, and Games Workshop used them uh, under license to manufacture components for them. So, again, things people don't know, because everyone likes to say, oh, it costs so much because it's made in the UK. <laughs> no, it is not. Some things are made in the UK. Uh, also, another great lie in this report here is on page uh, five, just above community there. The second last paragraph is, our epic Horace Heresy novel series is drawing to a close uh, to its galaxy-changing conclusion. Currently standing at over 7.5 million words, we aren't aware of a more detailed and in-depth story in any fantasy or science fiction IP. Do you guys reckon you could name any IPs off the top of your head even that may have more words than the, uh, or, uh, the Horace Heresy novel series? Any IPs? I have no idea about the word count in most IPs, but... Word count total in total? I'd probably be willing to bet Star Wars has more, honestly. Well, that depends on how you define it. If you add in Extended Universe, all of the other nonsense, the source book, blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, if we're, if we're just comparing the Horus Heresy, which is what, 40 plus novels now, right? Yes. It's a lot. Okay. Uh, the only IP that does tabletop stuff is Battletech. But there's not like, they don't have like a single series. Like, they don't have like a Horus Heresy equivalent. If that makes sense. They well, sort of do, but not really. Star Wars does do tabletop. And do. Star Wars, I can tell you as a fact, because I went and Googled it beforehand. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, the Expanded Universe Star Wars has over 177 novels as of 2017 and had 40 in production in 2018. 
That was the mm-hmm. newest figures I could get a hold of. So in 2018 alone, they were making basically the entire equivalent of the Horus Heresy. And, and this is not to, you know, crap on GW. It's just, you know, if you're going to tell a lie, make it a believable lie, like, you know, uh, cornering the adult market or something like that. We we market the Horus Heresy at a more mature player base than any other science fiction. You know, uh, competitors like Star Wars are targeted at tweens or something. You know, they could have lied that way, but this is just patently false. Mm, they're just selling false falsehoods, but Games Workshop's not known for ever telling the truth. Well, the brilliant part is, like, again, you are not allowed to lie in investor reports. That is literally legal. You, you can't. But you can say, we are not aware of any. And if you point it out, they'll just go, like, oh, well, we didn't know that. We didn't know Star Wars was a thing. <laughs> we didn't maybe, know it was maybe, bigger than us. Maybe they were betting on, like, the last Jedi had killed it off. Well, it tried. That's that's sure. So there's actually one um, paragraph that comes up a little later that makes me think the person who wrote this was just an intern because it's so badly worded. But uh, anyway, under the community, they do state that within this, um, they talk about the Warhammer community and social channels. They've noticed uh, more Warhammer fans than ever did before uh, on social despite ever more restrictive algorithms from the big players, we're reaching more people compared to the same period last year. Is it anyone one. find it rich that Games Workshop says they're being hampered by the algorithms? Yeah, that one fucking pissed me off more than anything. Like, fucking hell. You are a massive corporation. You get tons of benefit. You get tons of free coverage. You are undoubtedly boosted by the algorithm, yet you still turn off your comment section, reducing your algorithm scores massively, and you sit there and going, oh, we're being suppressed. Oh, really? Oh, fucking really are you? By whom? Where? How? Like, this Holy is some stuff. idiot who has read on the internet. It's like, oh, big tech is doing mean things. And they're like, oh, that's cool. All the rebels are being suppressed. I, we should be suppressed too. Like, fucking. We're underdogs, says the mega corporation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> says the mega corporation. The billion-dollar company who has uh, <laughs> people who've licensed their product who come to your channel and say, hey, do you want to talk about our Warhammer mobile game? Yeah, yeah. Th- they're the underdog when they're the ones who are able to put advertising on your videos. It's just unreal. Oh, man. Uh, We're being they're suppressed. Help us. <laughs> Big corporations have- love doing that because it gets them lots of sympathy sales. Like, the, have you ever seen Steam with the indie tag? And how many of them are like, "We're indie." It's like you have a publisher, though. It's like you're not indie. Get out of here. <laughs> no, I think they just use that so that when they do their early access and the game's a piece of crap and it sits in early access for four years, that they can turn around and be like, "Oh, but we're indie. We don't have the big development team." Uh, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> oh. Uh, or us. <laughs> they go on to say that WarhammerCommunity.com uh, users are up 15% across all territories. Even more encouraging, our email marketing is up across all metrics. Subscribers, opens, clicks, and revenue. All telling us that we continue to grow and retain and engage customer base. Now, I've labeled that a false equivalency. Because, for a start, you don't know how many of those clicks are unique views. And not the same person like me. Uh, for example, logging in on Mozilla Firefox and then logging in on Google Chrome to go look at Warhammer Community because maybe I'm at work, maybe I'm using my mobile phone. They don't know that, you know, they just think, oh, uh, that's a, just another unique user. And then saying things like, uh, oh, we are engaging and retaining our customer base because people uh, have our emails and they open them and have a look. I get emails from companies all the time. I was a huge fan of uh, World of Warships and to a lesser degree World of Tanks. I still get those emails even though I've uninstalled both games. And I occasionally click on them because I'm just curious what's going on. If they fix the game yet, no, nah, still a piece of crap. Great. I'm not a retained customer. I'm not spending anything on the product. I'm not playing the product. I'm not consuming it in any form apart from just reading their updates. Hmm. So again, the reality is saying, oh, we're up 15% across all territories, how many people do you know that have quit the hobby but still keep tabs on it? I know quite a few. They, 
it's also uh, it's shown in a previous segment where they talk about um, the views and they claim what was it? They claim one of their videos had had like twenty eight million views or something. Let's see if I can find that. Yeah, just send me the link as soon as you do. Let me see here. I'll just search for the word million and see if we can't find something. Because they, they were talking about their views on their channel, I presume. They were talking about one of their latest trailers for Age of Sigma, which had performed so incredibly well. Better than any fantasy release ever. Which I'm presuming is fantasy after they killed fantasy. <laughs> Ah, here it is, yeah. Uh, on page five in the search, uh, they claim that the Mortal Realms showcase was viewed 28 million times uh, in the period of its launch. Which is very interesting because I could not find any video they have ever made that had been viewed 28 million times. In fact, they seem to have exaggerated that number by, well, about 28 times. How many views does it have in total? Uh, I think it was a million four or something was their highest video. So their eyes don't work. <laughs> or alternatively, uh, they are having some very, some very alternative ways to number things. Like maybe, like Maka said, they are just going like, oh, everyone who's ever clicked on this ever, that's a view. Regardless of if it's a repeat view, regardless of if it's even somebody scrolls past the video in a newsletter, that's a view, and so on and so on. Oh, so anybody who signed up for the newsletter must have watched it, right? Because everybody opens up every single email and clicks on every single thing somebody sends them. <laughs> and every time you scroll past it on Warhammer Plus, uh, Warhammer Plus or uh, Warhammer Community, that's a view. I guess the only way I can imagine them getting 28 million views on a video that... I think got 900,000 views. I'm, I'm not going to look it up here now. Let's see. The Mortal Realms video on Warhammer, the cinematic trailer. Let's look at their most viewed videos ever. Sort by most popular. Uh, right, so the, the cinematic for 40k, that was 4.5 million views. That's their highest video ever. Uh, then there's the Kill Team cinematic trailer, that's 1.7. Uh, Codex Space Marines, 1.5. And then comes the only Age of Sigma video up here. So I'm assuming that has got to be the Mortal Trailers one. Cinematic trailer. Uh, it's got 997,000 views. So again, presumably, they took that number and times it by 28 to arrive at their supposed 28 million views figure. It still sounds like a lie. <laughs> well, you know, Carl, uh, a, a funny way that you can, you can lie without lying in these reports is when Age of Sigma first dropped, they had a massive decline in sales because people weren't interested in it. All the old Warhammer fantasy players, basically. And ever since then, it's been a, a battle to recover from what they lost, from the position they set themselves off in when they created that game. And I think there are definitely positive aspects to that game. Uh, so don't think I'm just being the prick here. But if you're down on a game system like that, and your sales aren't there, uh, you're doing an investor report, and you want to try and convince your investors that, no, no, everything is well, ignore the fire behind me, what can you do? Well, in their case, what I'm presuming, because I don't know this, this is just... um speculation on my behalf is that they looked at anything that could be used in that system that was being sold to 40k and they just sort of borrowed it. Oh, some Chaos Demons. No, it was probably an Age of Sigma player, not a 40k player that used that. Well, tape measure sale? Let's just uh, put that tape measure sale up against the uh, Age of Sigma, why don't we? And that way, you know, someone buys a paint set. Could be a 40k paint set, but you just label it as they bought it for age of sigma that paint set oh man and that way you know you borrow just a couple of numbers a few dollars here and there from that other game system like the person who you know siphons a dollar off every customer at the bank and they become a millionaire by just taking a dollar every pay off every customer yeah it's the same sort of thing they just grafted some money from one over to the other to say that their sales were great even though when you went to the hobby stores 
you never saw anyone playing Age of Sigmar, you know, in the year that it released. And yet it did very well. Would not surprise me, because, uh, again, 28 million views is just literally a lie. Like, they have no video even within a million miles of that. So whatever metric they are using is ex an extremely misleading metric. So if you think, would you call, if it was 28 million, hypothetically, would you call that um, their ideal number, okay? So what would you then call 2 million views in its entire life on Warhammer Plus? Well, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the question, isn't it? And it wasn't, uh, was it two million? Wasn't it three? three million they, they say two million. Um, they said Warhammer, our brand new subscription service, Warhammer Plus, got off to a great start. Citation needed. Uh, in particular, our animation and in-house shows have been extremely popular with two million views in total across all shows in just three months. Ah. Well, that's even worse. So let's talk about Warhammer Plus. A little bit, shall we? Because oh that's uh, oh that, that's that's the real beauty, isn't it? Because Warhammer Plus was their their big thing. That was their launch. They were gonna be like, "Oh my god, this will be it. We can we can kill all of those filthy, dirty bastards who are abusing our franchise by making super popular advertisement for our stuff. We we don't like that. They're they're creating too many sales for us. So let's kill that. And then, since this is hugely popular, surely. If we put it on a paid platform, it'll still be hugely popular, right? It turns out that much like mods, there is a difference between receiving something for free and having to pay for it. And not just having to pay for it, having to pay for it from the people who took it away from you in the first place. This is at the same time as well that they're saying that they're growing the community and they're having more engagement with the community than ever, and yet they've artis artificially restricted it by putting a paywall in place. You know, well, the stuff um, you want to be giving to your community for free is now being paywalled. Here's here's my argument. I launch a counter argument here that uh, GW has seen more engagement than ever due to the ridiculous increase in angry emails and hatred thrown towards their company. True, <laughs> you know. You know what's probably been better spokesman for them has been Henry Cavill than their Warhammer Plus. Ah, <sighs> Cavill. Cavill needs to stop being a casual. That's uh, that's all I have to say on that. Filthy casuals, ruining everything. He needs to get. He needs to get on the correct side of history. <laughs> Real quick. <laughs> uh. No, oh, I, I am a massive fanboy of Henry Cavill, because I view him as one of very, very, very few actors or individuals of uh, who are in the popular consciousness right now who at the least appear to give a shit about fandoms and the community and the IP in general. But he is still a bit of a filthy, dirty casual, and he needs to be chastised for that. It's it's funny because I've liked the guy since uh, since he was uh, Count of Monte Cristo and uh, the Tudors, whereas he only really sort of made it into the popular mainstream with uh, obviously Man of Steel. But he is collecting custodes, so that's never a good sign. It is not. It's like, hey, let me show you me painting Warhammer. Oh, that's cool. What are you playing? Custodes. Oh, no, oh. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's pretty rough. It's um, it's like it's like when a person uh, says like, you know, oh, I'm a firearms collector or something, and I'm like, oh, that's awesome. You know, what do you got? Like American, British, German, Russian, oh, Italian. Ugh. Yes, I'm I'm particularly fond of Italian small arms. Yes. Yeah, Italian bolt actions from World War One never fired, only dropped once. <laughs> Sorry, Italians. I had to. I mean, they don't have any... Uh, they don't have a counter-argument, frankly. No. But yeah, Warmer Plus, by, by every apparent metric, has been a tremendous failure. Because 
they did so much damage to the community, so much like, actual genuine damage. They've driven away so many talented co content creators. They have taken away so much, and they have delivered almost nothing in return. Like, okay, we've lost Astartes, but we have received Hammer and Bolter. Fuck you. <laughs> Genuinely fuck you. <laughs> and I guess we'll have to wait and see um, when Astartes eventually makes a return. Because I remember they put up an Astartes video and everyone was really excited for a moment. Um, even Sargon in the super secret conspiracy channel was like, oh my god, it's another Astartes video. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's the old Astartes video. Except with worse music because, uh, you know, DW. Because of course. Because of yeah, course. Yeah, I... <laughs> I, I, it's it's just one of those funny things. Like they gave us, I don't know why you're so upset about it, Arch. They gave us some great things, or they gave us that painting tutorial on how to spray paint black. But come on, that's a painting mean, tutorial. Their 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 most advanced painting tutorial to date has pretty much been how to apply pink and then a wash. Like this is this is the height of Warhammer Plus. It's goddamn. <laughs> It's amazing. It is actually kind of amazing. And they're demanding money for this. If Warhammer Plus had been launched uh, with content, I think we'd be having a completely different conversation right now. If they'd gone out of their way to produce a series of shows and did it all sort of behind the scenes, undercover, had eight or ten shows already on the platform, had ported over all those old copies of White Dwarf onto there with the missing rules. Uh, that's one of the most despicable things they did was removing the rules content from old White Dwarf magazines mm -hmm. because I don't know what people were going to see it and enjoy it. Uh, if they'd ported all of that over and then said, um, by the way, we're releasing Warhammer Plus and here's what it has to offer, people would have been like, holy heck, I can go and... Look at all those old episodes of White Dwarf. Uh, I can I can see all these new shows they've come up with. This is awesome. But instead what they did was release no content, cut the legs out from under a heap of creators, and basically said, work for us or get sued off YouTube. And then when people actually went on there, they saw it was a vast wasteland. So, if you know, what did they expect to happen, basically? Well, that's the problem, too. Like... Like, just like with China and so many other things, I believe they had a completely rose-tinted idea of what's good, what they were going to do. They saw YouTubers making content, and they figured, like, okay, well, if the filthy, dirty plebeians can do it, we can do it with even less effort and twice the results, right? And so they created this idea where we're going to have three YouTube videos. We're going to have painting tutorials. We're going to have bout reports, and everyone's going to love us. And then they didn't even manage to film those. And eventually they're sitting there releasing one YouTube video a week, usually a battle report, and not being able to make lore or painting tutorials. Like, this is a company that had a, a profit of, um, let's, let's scroll up to the top here. So revenue of 191 million pounds. They have hundreds of employees. They cannot create three YouTube videos a week. It's parody is 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 too weak a word. They're pocketing that money. I want to point out. Oh, there's some serious mismanagement, or both. Well, we'll, we'll get more into that later on. Oh boy, it's, it's isn't it funny though how like, they have all that money and resources, and re remembering that like we expect if we're going to be paying for a service, the production value to be exponentially higher uh, than if we were getting the service for free. So if I go on YouTube and I look at uh, free content, I I have, you know, an expectation there where I'm not going to judge it too harshly because it's free content versus if I look at a subscriber service like One Heart Plus, I'm going to go, well, this is being paid for. This should be way better than it is. So if they have a battle report, it should be blowing YouTube battle reports out of the wind, out of the, out of the water. And you can see, like, you know, mini war game battle reports, uh, just crap all over Games Workshop spell reports, and it's being made by a couple of guys essentially in a basement. And it's, yeah. you know, why couldn't they have... They could they could cheap out if they wanted. They could have a person sit there on camera with a codex in hand and just read out things from the codex and talk about tactics. They could go that cheap if they wanted, and people would be happy as long as it was content. 
but they can't even cheap out to that degree. They just don't make it. That's their solution to their problem is let's just not make content. And again, that's that's the point that needs to be repeated time and time and again too. This is not a YouTube channel. If Hammer and Bolter had been created by, you know, five dudes on the internet, I would say it's it's bloody amazing. It's not. It is created by an enormous studio filled with professionals who are charging a monthly fee for access to this. At that point, I am expecting you to create very high quality stuff continuously. And for five bucks, I mean, at that point, you're competing with services that give me access to a few hundred TV shows. Yeah. You just cannot just put out a fucking YouTube video and go, good enough. That is an also that... most. What? Sorry, Kyle. Yeah. I was just going to, I was like, I was going to further the point like, yeah, you use Netflix and Amazon Prime or whatever, any of those big corporation streaming services, you get access to movies, TV shows, all for a couple bucks a month. And what is what is what does this give you? It gives you some out of date magazines with missing pages. It gives you some like half baked animation that is extremely low budget and it's inconsistent with its releases on top of that. I noticed they love their animation where it's like the uh, the still frame animation where like you know one arm moves on on the thing in frame. They love that animation style. It's cheap. Uh, they also do this with the faces. <laughs> they have a face and they just warp it to make it talk. Oh, uh, it's so cheap. I, I hate it. <laughs> they do it a lot though. They do it for everything. Yes, um, and and. It you know, like most things, Games Workshop, I love the hobby. I don't want to see them fail, but gee, they make it hard to support them sometimes. They really do, and Warhammer Plus is just the perfect storm. It really is. See, this is where I have transcended. I have become greater <laughs> than you. I wish for them to fail now, unequivocally. Like, no, no, Warhammer Plus Good. needs to be a burning crater in the ground. And when they look upon the ashes of their creation with quivering little lips looking up at the fandom, I fervently hope that the only response is an avalanche of feces. Yeah, I kind of agree. I'm actually curious, Marco, why do you want them to, like, do you, do you actually think they will actually genuinely change, though? Like, do you think they'll... Are they capable of internal change? They are capable of internal change. It's what are they willing to go through to achieve it. I think you're right on that note. I just doubt they'll do it, though, sadly. If enough money is hemorrhaged, if they don't get their break into the cultural zeitgeist, into that, like, that mainstream that they want that's what will force the change. If they realize that, okay, we've failed to successfully point our IP across to a different revenue stream and we're forced to actually do something with miniatures, even though they seem to be going out of their way not to, uh, that's the point at which they'll have to change, adapt or die. They might just die. I don't know. Because in, in this, I mean, when you get to their challenges, they, they aren't acknowledging all the things that I would point out as being their major challenges. Is there's uh, there's another key issue right there. If they do not manage to break into the mainstream, and right now I am highly doubting their ability to do so, for the simple reason that they had a lot of momentum. They had a tremendous amount of momentum going with uh, COVID and their increased sales, which has since tapered up off and is seemingly heading straight back down to the level that they were at before COVID. If they don't get that big deal I think they're fishing for soon, they never will. Like, they were already looked at by Hasbro, who they've now uh, gotten an executive from, and Hasbro said, no, we don't want you. And now they're on the decline. And they do not have the money to run this themselves. I I just don't think they do. Warner Plus, 2 million views over the course of three months, if we think about that realistically, and we realize also that they also uh, reuse views and clicks, and they're very dishonest in how they count those views, I would be highly surprised to learn that they have more than, say, 10k paying subs. 
at most during that period. And I don't think that number is increasing. Like, if, if they can't bring new people into their core hobby, I don't see how Warmer Plus is suddenly going to bring in all of the new people. Like, oh yes, I don't know what this Warmer thing is, but I'll totally pay for a five bucks a month subscription service to it. Well, you know, you can easily work out uh, how many roughly uh, people are watching their shows. If they had two million views, just take all of the shows they've released on Warhammer Plus, divide the two million by that, and that'll get you into a ballpark of, you know, roughly how many people have watched their shows, and then divide that again uh, because you're going to, you know, some amount of people are rewatching shows. So if you said that uh, they only released 40 things in total on Warhammer Plus, then if you had, you know, 2 million uh, divided by 40, you'd still be looking at only 50,000 people. And they do have more than 40 things. So you can you can quite quickly sort of eliminate that 2 million views does not extrapolate well on their behalf. No. It does not. And that's also assuming, because there's, there's a very nifty little weasel word in there. Uh, Two million views across all content. Hold on. You ju don't just put up videos on Warmer Plus. You also put up a ton of other content, e.g. 10-year-old commercial magazines. Is that included in the old content? Because if it is, suddenly that number rises dramatically. Oh, I didn't think about that. Yep. Again, just like with the taking stock from 40k to puff out the orders for Age of Sigma, you can just creatively reword and shift a few things around, and you haven't done anything illegal. You know, one could argue maybe you've morally misrepresented, but, you know, again, this is just speculation on our behalf as well. Um, but let, who's going to say it's beyond the realms of plausible? Just going mm -hmm. off the language used. You know, at Games Workshop sales as a whole, like, I have this analogy I use, for better or worse, I think I saddled poor Arch with it, is the fruit store. You open a fruit store and you sell apples, right? So this is Games Workshop when they first opened. And people love their apples, and they sell them for a dollar each. And pretty soon they've got 100 customers a day buying an apple each, and they make 100 bucks a day. But the company starts to get bigger, they want to expand their operations, they want to sell more apples, bills go up, all of that. So they go, look, sorry, customers, we're going to have to raise the price to $2 an apple. And the customers, well, they understand it. They think it's fair, so they go with it. And your 100 apples is now making $200 a day. All as well. But then what happens is you go public and you get investors. And those investors, they want a dividend. They want to increase prices on apples for more profit. And they go, look, you increase the price by just $1 an apple. And you went to double the money each day. Well, if we go up another dollar, it'll only be $3 an apple. That's half of the price rise the last one was, really. So we'll make $300. But that doesn't happen. Instead, half the people who are buying apples go, you know what, $3 for a single apple, it's just not worth it, and they leave. And now the company only makes 150 bucks for the day. And they go, what the hell, this isn't right. We need to raise prices more to try and counter these lost sales. So let's go up to $4 an apple. But now only the most diehard of your fans remain. and yeah, you're only selling 25 apples a day. They're still great apples, but you're only making $100 a day now, which was the same amount you made when you sold your apples at a dollar each. I mean, on the bright side, you're moving less stock, so the cost of that stock is less, but what's that worth to you? Because the stock is cheap. It's the other expenses you've still got that aren't, and that dividend needs to be paid out. And I feel like Games Workshop is somewhere in that $3 to $4 spectrum where all of those people that they built up through the 80s, the 90s, and the early 2000s, either they've left or it's the diehards that hang on. And the diehards are hanging on and paying four times, you know, well, three times in Australia for a tactical squad what they were in the late 90s, even though inflation is like 30%, we're paying 300% more per box. Those are the people who are funding this company. Does, does they that are. make sense or... Yeah. And no, no, because it's what you see it too. Because <clears throat> again, we've talked about this. They are having a trouble bringing in new people, despite ever more predatory tactics to bring in those new people. They are not succeeding. Now, I can tell you who was bringing in new people. It was it was me. 
it was um, text to speech device. It was it was you. It was the YouTube content creators. We were bringing in new people. I've received so many emails from people going like, "Oh, hey, you brought me into this hobby. That's great." GW isn't doing that because they don't want to show you how cool their setting is. They just want you to purchase plastic. It's yeah, it, it's true and it's troubling because again, I don't think they're going to get that. Uh, I don't think they're going to get the big sale that they want. Getting bought out by some major conglomerate, tech conglomerate, probably, or toy toy salesman. I don't think they're going to get that before they're overtaken by other threats in the market. Because that's the thing. I am almost certain that is what they have been aiming toward. Because they purchased, I will keep using that word, they purchased a Hasbro executive. These companies do not just trade their employees willy-nilly. Like, nobody goes from a million dollars plus a year at Hasbro to GW on a whim. It's like, oh, I really love your plastic miniatures. I want to work for you. Bullshit. Actual bullshit. That was a move because they knew that he has connections within Hasbro, and they are hoping to be able to leverage that into another inn. That's what I'm almost certain of at this point. And I think they were on the right path with the massive explosion in sales, but right now, with the market being so skeptical towards them, I think think their window might already have closed before they even were ready to try and appreciate it. Like, Worm Plus was kind of the Hail Mary. If it had done very well, I think they would be already in negotiations right now. But since it didn't, they now have to explain, well, hold on, where is this wider market you promised us? Where, where are all of these new people? Where is these... Uh, this explosion of the casuals, you know? You, you promised a subscription service. Where is it? They shot themselves in the foot massively over the COVID thing. If the company wouldn't be hemorrhaging share money right now, if they had turned around a year and a half ago in the you know, 2020 financials and said, look, this has actually been a bit of a boon for us, uh, rather, than, rather than saying that, oh, it really made things difficult for them when it didn't, because by saying it made things difficult for them, they now can't go back and use it as an excuse as to why their sales went up so high and then why they've dropped off so much. Because if, yep. they, if they turned around, being honest, and said, look, we, uh, we have experienced a sales surge thanks to people being isolated at home. Uh, this is great for us as a company, but shareholders, please note, this is not the norm. This is exceptional circumstances. And things will eventually normalize. If they'd done that, they they would have had a slight dip then, and it would have normalized. And instead, what we have now is we're at the point where that exact situation has happened, but now all those investors who didn't realize just how volatile this particular market is are like, well, hang on a minute. Why why the hell is sales starting to drop? Not And now it's sort of starting to come out that, hang on, this whole sales surge that these investors bought into where they thought the company was going to make them a squillion dollars that was all artificially inflated by the commie cough. So, yeah, well, shot themselves in the foot is the only analogy I can think of, uh, or metaphor, sorry, for, for that. It wasn't a great decision, and it will have severely damaged their hopes at getting you know, properly bought out. I think their chance of going mainstream might already be, uh, if not down the drain, then severely hemorrhaged and dampened, uh, dampened, damaged. The question then is, what's the next move? Now, what well, now? Will they will they double down? Will they continue with Warhammer Plus? Because I think they probably they probably counted on maybe two years of just straight up bleed practically from Warhammer Plus. Because I think they knew that this was a, a chance, a gamble, and they would be very expensive. And it is very expensive, too. You cannot compare this to being a YouTube channel. Like, the people they've got working on this are people who are doing this exclusively now. That person doing the, uh, the painting tours was apparently very good, by the way, no matter how much GW might try to hide that. 
they're now being paid a full wage to do this. That wage alone is going to be a tremendous amount of money. When you then try to add on the, the editing cost, the studios they have, all of this, I'd be surprised if they're earning money. Very surprised. Well, how many more revenue sources can one company try and bend over uh, and present towards? They've gone what, Marvel for comics, uh, trying to get in on that Disney, on that Disney train. Uh, they've gone to obviously Hasbro, poaching executives, uh, trying to do stuff with like those Space Marine action figures. I don't know. What else? They're they're trying to break into movies, like using their writers and such. Have gone off to have uh, some some success in Hollywood, like Dan Abnett and that. And they're probably leaning heavily on that, like, hey, put in a good word to you know some producer about our IP and how they should make it a movie. Uh, how many things? Like they've hoarded their IP out to to the mobile market, especially, and to video games in general. Like how many how many Warhammer video games are out? I've lost track. Absolutely lost track of how many are out there, but I can only count on one hand how many I think are good. So, at what point have you tried all possible revenue streams for monetization and come up, basically come up stumps? That's another good point as well. Like, where are they on this monetization of their IP? Because, uh, admittedly, they are in the early stages of monetization. Let's put it like that. The, the early stages of monetization. Sure. They have a reputation. They're out there. They're very new to what's going on. They don't have that uh, Marvel reputation. No, they're not a success yet. They have, in fact, yet to produce their first genuine success. And the closest they come is the Horus Heresy, which they can look at and go like, hey, we made a pretty cool book series, which, yeah. Yeah, it's bigger I'd than Star Wars, did. don't forget. Yes, bigger than Star Wars. Yeah, well, I can't think of any other intellectual property which has... Like, like take Battletech as, as a sort of competitor, you know? Also from the sort of 1980s time period, long-term tabletop games, multiple PC games. There is way, way less Battletech being thrown around for video games. And, you know, when... It, it's notable when a game comes along for Battletech. Mm -hmm. It is event. not notable when a game comes along for Warhammer, unless it's something like Dawn of War or uh, Total Warhammer. They, yep. They're the biggest two. Very true. And those aren't even popular because of the franchise. Total War is popular because it's Total War. And Dawn of War was popular because it was Relic strategy. And then Relic decided to, uh, to take care of that success in their own unique way. Oh, this this one of my favorite movies is Sin City, and there's this shot where uh, I think it's at the end of it. Bruce Willis character kills himself in the snow, and that's just the image I have of um, what happened with Relic and uh, Dawn of War Three. Yeah, just in silhouette, just kneeling down in the snow with the gun to the head. Dawn of War Three was a decision which I don't think. Anyone is ever going to truly understand. Well, it's what happens when the people that made something great leave, and the people that come in don't respect that thing that was made by the previous people in the studio. Instead, well, they... Know your they, audience, uh, though. Know your audience. They try like, to go for that wider audience. Yeah, why try and compete with StarCraft? StarCraft already dominates that niche. So, wouldn't you try and dominate something else? I mean, they had a dominant well, that's... control of the tactics, like squad-based market, for a while, with Company Heroes and Dawn of War. Which, which is absolutely fun. Like, Company Heroes is awesome. I mean, they're bringing out Company Heroes 3. I don't know if it's dropped yet. I think it has. But I play Company Heroes 1 a lot, and I love Dawn of War 1. I love Dawn of War 2. But Dawn of War 3 is like... It's, it's not true to the war of the universe. It's not true to the games that came before it. So who was it marketed to? That's what I don't get. Hybrid you're genre. Not gonna, it was, you're uh, not going to bring... Oh, go ahead. I was just saying, you're not going to bring StarCraft players across because they're already happy with the game they've got called StarCraft. 
Yep. They were going for a hybrid, though. They are actually aiming for the MOBA market. That's what, with the lane pushing. But they also, like you said with StarCraft, they're also aiming for a little bit of that StarCraft audience as well. So they were hoping that they could bridge the gap with something fresh and a new take on MOBA strategy, you know? To try to get people into it with base building and units, but the problem is, is it, it wasn't very good. It was yeah, not very good. <laughs> I'd like to. Can I get that on like the, the poster of the game? Like it's on the shelf there, at the the store, and it's like it wasn't very good. Just just slapped across the front of it. Some genres don't mix well together. <laughs> it was a disappointment. <laughs> Arch made me buy that, by the way, because we streamed them. We had to stream. We had to play the multiplayer because we had to, right? Because he wanted to. Oh, answer. Well, this is why you actually no. I think you owe me something still from that. Yeah. No, that was quite a while ago. So to get into some uh, back on topic and something you might find interesting. Uh, they say, we are committed to ensuring that all staff are paid fairly for the job they perform and to rewarding our staff for their considerable contribution. We always manage the business for the long term and aim to get the right mix of annual pay rises and variable cash rewards. In the last five years, we've increased fixed base pay on average of 3% per year, a total of £20 million over the period. Over the same period, we've also rewarded staff with a discretionary payment and group profit share payments of £35 million equating to £15,000 per staff member on top of their base salary. Now, 3% wage increase is actually higher than inflation, so kudos to them for that, but they also started with wages that are well below what they should be. But 15000 per staff member on top of their base pay, that doesn't sound right to me. How so? I don't... I, well, that's averaged out. Do you think they gave £15,000 bonus to every one of their staff members in the UK? Or have they gone, look, out of that £35 million of bonuses we gave out, uh, we gave most of it to the executive management team. <laughs> we gave £4,000 to, you know, or less to our guys on the ground, maybe £2,000 each. But if we say that we gave most of it to management, that looks pretty bad. So we'll just say what the average amount was once we take all our staff and divide the $35 million by that. Uh, what do you think, Adam? That sounds like something they would do. Yeah, the execs and management normally takes most of the money in these, in these situations. If it's £15,000, that'd have to be close on half of their annual salary. Yeah, that would be a very generous bonus from a company that does not necessarily have a reputation for being quite so generous. Like, you know, is Larry the guy who, you know, packs boxes down the shop floor, do you reckon he got a £15,000 bonus? I highly doubt it. Nothing against Larry. Larry performs a more important job than half of the management does. But, yeah, I, I just, it stuck out to me because really what they said to me there was that they had £35 million and they pissed it away on their executives and they tried to frame it as looking after their employees. And, I mean, whatever bonuses they did give to their employees, I highly approve of. Yes, but I don't think uh, they're, they're the good guys that they try to portray themselves as in that. Uh, which is so amplified by the next section, uh, which is on page, uh, the bottom of page six, the social responsibility and sustainability. Uh, oh, are you guys here we go. familiar with this section? Yeah, I did uh, look at that briefly. Our new head of social responsibility and sustainability will have joined us by the time you're reading this. This new recruit, we hope, brings with them a wealth of expertise and experience on this key subject, an area we would like to see some significant progress on in the years ahead. Working alongside our department heads across the global business, they'll be reviewing and redefining our sustainability action list. Once complete, we intend to communicate the plan to our shareholders, customers, and staff to ensure that everyone is clear on both our priorities and progress. What do you reckon that means, Carl? I don't know, man. Arch, can you take a, take a swing at it? Well, here's the thing. The, the way the entire title comes across <laughs> sounds like classic SJW bullshit. And I will also point out, 
this is a person who's had long, long terms knowledge, very, very experienced. This whole social responsibility bullshit hasn't been around for long enough to anyone to develop any kind of long term experience or knowledge, frankly. It is very much so a, a recent invention of the modern world. But what they do mention, too, is that they are not uh, turning PC, which I thought was a very interesting choice of words, because I think they realize that they will be getting a lot of pushback if they say stuff like that. But they might still be trying to do it covertly under the rug. Basically, I'm like, oh, no, 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 we're, this, is, this is totally fine. We're doing this because of uh, environmental bullshit reasons. Yeah, subversion might be. Because it depends on who's in charge and positions of power. And if there are certain people in power that favor these ideologies, then yes, they're going to try to subvert the company and insert them into it regardless. So... Most big companies, to, to put this into perspective, again, from my experience in industry, mm. most big companies have this. Usually it's just some BS department that, you know, they staff it so they can say on reports that they're staffing it. Um, it's a little bit different, though, with plastics companies because the social sustain the sustainability thing. My company deals mostly with recycling plastics, so we look great when it comes to this stuff because we're doing the right thing. We're taking problematic plastics and turning them into useful products. Gangs Workshop, though, are, are purchases of virgin product. They are buying raw plastics, so they are directly taking petroleum products and using... Uh, basically, they're doing nothing but creating greenhouse. Yeah, so for people who are uh, of that greeny mindset they're they're a big bad basically as a company so this is their attempt to try and look like less of a big bad trying to ignore the fact that they're taking styrene and petroleum products heating them up in a factory using all this energy and running all these machines this is their chance to try and offset it that's what they want that's really what this boils down to and they've tagged it in with the social responsibility department Less so for the PC aspect of it, but more so that they can try and turn around to people and say, oh, we're, uh, we are looking after the community and spreading awareness of the subject. Because that's one of the companies love to say, we're spreading awareness. We're not actually achieving anything. We're not doing anything. We're not spending money. We're, we're doing awareness. Spreading awareness. It's just more of that corporate bloody blah Hell, I kind of hope that's all it is. Because environmentalist bullshit, right. The company will whinge and whine and do nothing. Fair enough. SJW bullshit. The company will whinge and whine and then kill itself in the most horrendously messy way imaginable. They can't do too much more damage to themselves than they've already done with their blanket statements. Uh, that's, well, I'm sure they can try. They're... they're... They, they will definitely try, but their PR department is atrocious. They need someone who knows how to format and write documents correctly that's doing their press releases. Because right now, whoever is doing it is not doing... I don't know where it's like Tom Kirby's wife or something. Uh, you know, just get her on the payroll. Give her one of those £15,000 bonuses for writing one financial statement. Or Yeah, whoever's doing their statements is not thinking them through. They're too black and white. When the whole point of a good PR release for a company is something very grey, uh, very ambiguous, where you let the customer project what they want onto it. That's that's what you have. So uh, that way, anyone on either side of the fence can project their positive stuff onto it. If they can only project negatives onto it, then you've failed. And if they can only take a negative meaning away from it, they failed. So, uh, yeah, moving on to something interesting the facilities so uh on the bottom of page six is the facilities and that is the this period has been one of consolidation within our two factories with staff health and safety being an ever-present priority we have maintained elements of social distancing throughout the factories despite this the planned installation of additional equipment and five more injector molding machines was successful this takes the number of our live injection molding machines up to 43 uh, they also have a second tool room, fully operational, uh, which has greatly increased our tooling capability. 
and with the renewed focus of small dedicated team, product innovation remains a key area of focus. We've created 35 jobs in this period, taking our total number of jobs in our factories to 432. These additional jobs and the annual pay rise, increased payroll has cost uh, increased cost by 1.8 million to 6.3 million annual, uh, increasing by 3.3% from 2.4% of group sales. So 43 injection molding machines is a lot. That is a huge um, number, yes. That is a lot of molding machines. And keep in mind they're doing styrene in these. You're talking cast times in the seconds on these products. I can produce 8 kilo parts, uh, 2 4 kilo parts in a single die in about, say, 10 minutes, including cooling time, injection time, all that. These will be literally like a pneumatic done, done, done if they're if they're set up correctly uh incredibly fast so they are producing a ridiculous amount of product so so quick uh with that many machines but what shocked me was the number of staff 432 is a huge amount of staff for that few machines like especially most, too because most... um here's the thing i'm i'm presuming these injection molding machines what kind of automation are surrounding them? Do, is there a person there who has to stand there and pick these models up, or? Well, they won't be using robots. I I highly doubt they'd be using robots there. So I don't think they have the at, to do that now. They they would have pneumatic uh, ejection systems, so little air little air burst into the back mm -hmm. of the die, so that when the die opens up, this little air you know this sprays and it blows the the piece off, and then that piece falls down into a bucket or whatever below yes. and then so, someone grabs the bucket out at the end of you know ever many parts and then boxes them up that would be so to uh, illustrate this for those who are not initiated into this field Ima imagine a large machine that makes space marines it makes a space marine very quickly in a matter of seconds and then a puff of air shoots the space marine out of the thing into a box a very large box and then the machine fetches another bit of plastic to make another Space Marine. And so it goes, and it just spits out these models. Or more correctly, the individual pieces of the models and the, uh, the sprues. They could, they could be buying this styrene for cents, like 20 kilo bag for like 30 cents. Well within the realms of possibility of what a company their size gets their styrene for. One and man the per key takeaway machines, point there too is that this isn't a manual job. Highly, highly automated. The only time the manual is coming into it, they probably, uh, depending what their packaging system is, that's where most staff would be allocated. I couldn't see needing more than, say, 21, 22 people to run the machines. And that's, that's being generous because one guy running two machines, well, as long as that machine is topped up with uh, raw materials, He's essentially just keeping an eye on them to make sure that the die is functioning correctly and not miscasting product, and then collecting the product once it gets full. That would my, be my assumption of their process, uh, coming from plastics myself. And the fact that they're running two tool rooms, those tool rooms, uh, for those who aren't in plastics, is that's where they're going to do their die reconditioning. So after a die has run for a certain period of time in a machine, they're going to pull that die out, they're going to take it into their tool room, uh, any bits of plastic that have stuck or adhered to that die, that all needs to be cleaned off. Uh, so things like the detail on faces starts to get a bit smudgy, I guess you can describe it as, after a while, on miniatures, because tiny little bits of plastic are starting to stick inside the die in the cavity where the face is located. So someone has to manually get in there and clean that. They'll they'll pour acetone in, scrub with a toothbrush type thing. Uh, and a part of those tool room teams will be the guys who are also doing your die changes. So all of that adds up to, again, you won't have constant die changes on these machines. If you're doing a proper product run, you want to leave a die in a machine as long as practicable in order to produce not just what you need to fulfill orders, but also to create excess stock. So if you're doing that, your die change should be every few days. So you want to produce several thousand you know, tactical squads before you pull that die out and put something else in. 
Understandable. So the fact that they've, yeah, the fact that they've got, I I don't know. I think maybe you could you could talk say twenty staff running machines, probably only sixty staff therefore on three shifts if you're running twenty four hours a day, you know, uh, and then probably half that many again, say eight to ten guys working in die setting and die repairs in your factory who are cleaning your dies and the die setting is the putting them in and out of the machines, uh, which is a lot easier process with Games Workshop because their dies are very small. Um, the dies I work with are mostly 1.2 ton category dies, so quite large. Uh, R&D, they say it's a small team. What do you define as a small team? What, maybe another 20 people or something like that. So where are they getting 400 from? It's got to be something to do with maybe packaging and distribution of the goods. But either way, that is a lot of staff, 432, like 10 staff to one machine. I've never seen that in industry. They might simply be doing something really retarded and having, because, okay, they can produce all of these packages. They can produce all of these machines. They can produce all of these uh, things, right? But they might not have any system set up for actually um, packaging it for putting them in the fucking boxes and shipping them out. There might literally be 200 little old ladies sitting there manually <laughs> packaging all of this. That would be... That'd be weird. You'd think GW, as a company, wouldn't want to do that, though, because, like, even GW doesn't... They don't care about their staff or personnel. We know that. Why would they want to pay more for more people? Wouldn't they want to automize that? Well, you automate it if you if you were able to. You would automate things like um, high gloss packaging, for example, like what their boxes are. Uh, notoriously difficult to automate because folding them into the right shape and that is hard because the glossy surface is hard for the machines to grip. But mm -hmm. it can be done. It can be done. And they do have a lot of products that are sold in different size packaging. That's one of the biggest areas they shoot themselves in the foot they'd be better off to buy bigger boxes um for smaller uh, sprues and just suck it up because it's not going to cost them that much difference and be able to utilize one machine to package more product but if they are sitting there and again we don't think highly people have probably guessed from this video of the people doing their finances They've probably gone and looked at it and said, you know what, we made 135 million profit or whatever this year. Do we want to spend, you know, 80 million of that on hire, on building a machine that will package everything for us and it's great and it's done and we never have to do it again? Uh, but our annual cost is only 6.3 million on labor, so it's going to take like 10 years to make its money back. Ah, oh, stuff it. It's not worth it. That's my guess. Because, uh... what they did. True. This is the thing too. Those hundred little old ladies are sitting there working for chips and headpats. Mm. No, no, they got a fifteen thousand pound bonus. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> oh. So, call call me cynical, but yeah, coming coming from the industry, I'm just looking at it, going, you know what? This is probably what I think they're up to. You know, companies do it all the time, man. If you want to try and sell it as, um, you know, there they could be a, a political bent to it where the local politician comes to her and they say, look at all the people we're employing. That, that could be a part of it. Part of that uh, social responsibility and sustainability. We are, we are giving hardworking British people jobs so they can eat and all the land, starchy food they want. Little old ladies manually packaging these things into boxes. Like, I can see it because I've seen it in so many other businesses. It sounds ridiculous, but I have seen so many super advanced production lines with all kinds of, like, full on mechanical solutions, too, not just robots, mechanical solutions. So, specifically designed to do one thing and one thing only, like packaging, like gum or something. And it can only do that thing. And it costs millions and ridiculous amounts of research etc and yet at the end of this super high-tech factory line stands 12 old ladies putting them into plastic bags <laughs> yep it happens they ran out of money okay <laughs> 
or there is also the, the, the social responsibility thing. It again sounds stupid, but this is a thing. Now in the UK, I don't know how the um, the union system is or the labor law system, but I know in in the US there are a lot of companies that have had to cut their automation systems short because the unions have demanded that they they keep so and so many jobs in each area. So they started with um, 30 jobs in packaging, just to take a number, and they demand like, okay, you can do this, but we demand 12 jobs will remain no matter what. And so sitting at the end of the automation process, they're like, well, we somehow have to employ 12 people now. Well, there's plenty of space in the board. Well, going on, they also talk about their warehousing in North America, which is interesting. So they've, uh, again, pulled the COVID card. Oh, COVID has really held us up, yada, yada. Uh, their new system and technology center in Memphis is now operational, significantly increasing the number of orders they can pick and pack. The £5 million of back orders at the end of November 2021 will be cleared by early January. Hooray. They now have a team of 71, up 7 in the period. To ensure we realise the benefits of this investment, the short-term goal is to maintain a full team. Job market in Memphis has been more fluid than historical trends, resulting in some shortages in this period reported. That says to me people are quitting. Yes. <laughs> the job market has been fluid in a period of near-universal economic recession. Hmm. And people are quitting. It's very interesting. Now, there is also uh, the point of the uh, the Trump bucks and the Biden bucks and the many free handouts that have happened over in the US, which, oddly enough, it turns out that people tend to not want to work if they are given the option to not work and still be able to purchase things they want. Yeah, that's been a huge problem in the US. Like, a lot of stores even here, there's nobody. Like, there's hiring signs everywhere, desperate to get, uh, you know, workers, especially, you know, for the lower end places like fast food and stuff like that. Mm hmm. Uh, there was an article I saw on this recently that I did a segment on as well, where uh, a, um, a restaurant had literally just gone, F it, we're using robots now because nobody wants to work here. Like, nobody wants to be a server no matter the wage they offered them. They just, they didn't want to. And so it's they just that, got robots. It's that wonderful situation where people are going, oh, well, it turns out you could afford to raise the minimum wage and not realizing like they've just robbed Pierre to pay Paul because every time the, the company increases your wage, like I know everyone wants to be paid more and I agree, but every time they raise your wage, they have to get that money from somewhere, which means increasing the cost, which means that pay rise you just got you're going to waste it paying for the exact same shit you were paying for before because all the companies you're buying from had to raise their prices because their employees wanted more. Mm -hmm. Welcome to economics. Money loses its value. <laughs> oh, isn't it great? No. But, but yeah. I, I want to say, too, <laughs> there was another interesting mention they had there about the, uh, the price of their... Uh their materials, which the theatre had gone up by, I think it was 3%, which I'm very impressed by. Like, they must have some absolute... Like, somebody's daughter is being held hostage somewhere. That's the only explanation I can really come up with for this, because 3% price increase is nothing right now. Like, everything has gotten so much more expensive due to a variety of factors. COVID murdering a lot of the economy, China being a douchebag, California deciding to murder his own import-export business, etc. So many prices have riven, risen so drastically, and yet GW has only seen a 3% cost increase? Damn. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw it, because I think, like, you know, one of the things that has affected my business the most is pallets. Wooden mm -hmm. pallets that we ship product on have, have gone up like something like 30%. You know, just that one item alone has gone up like 30% in Australia, let alone what, you know, problems in internationally might be. 
for their plastics to have gone up so little, the only thing I can think of is that someone in their senior managing team or in the board is probably on a senior management team or a board of another company. That Because usually they're all interlinked companies, especially in plastics. Everyone knows everyone. They're probably on the board of a company that produces virgin product and just said, hey, I'm part of this other company. Can you do me a favor? And just give them a good good deal. Because they, they also mentioned that um, some of our suppliers have unfortunately passed the cost on to us. It was like, yeah, like every single other company in the world has done. And that they were looking carefully at this trend to make sure that this was a fair um, uh, this was a fair process. I'm just wondering what well, how what kind of power do they have? Like, because normally you don't get to to turn to your deliver your distributor distributor uh, your delivery person and go like, so I think your price increase is unfair. I don't want it because he'll just tell you to go fuck yourself, and then you'll have to deal with somebody else with probably a higher price. <laughs> you know, you know the irony in it though is Kane's Workshop says, oh, unfortunately, price is raised by. By three percent, uh, and they made us pay for it. It's like, okay, Games Workshop, what about us, the customer? How much you raise your prices for, and why is it okay to make us pay for it? They they didn't think the the full uh, outcome of that statement through. Because it's very true, they pass on all their problems to us. Why why do they act like somehow it's, you know, I will never recover from this financial stress when it's happening to them. Yep, suddenly a 3% price increase, and GW is like, holy hell, this is unbelievably terrible. Uh, is it now? We'll raise it triple on the customers, though. Make up for it. <laughs> yeah, they can afford it. <laughs> With all those stimulus, spend all their stimulus checks on Warhammer. That's probably what they were, that's probably, that probably happened. <laughs> it definitely would have happened, I, I guarantee it, because... Uh, what's that classic uh, saying in economics? Money that's come in too easily is money that people misuse. Yep. Because they have not worked for it, therefore it means nothing to them and they just see it as uh, a windfall to be spent as opposed to investing it wisely. Very true. So they also talk about Brexit affecting them in here, but not in the way that you would think, well, they talk a little bit and say, oh, it cost us 2 million extra pounds in the last six months for shipping and freight costs. Um, but they also note that they've had a problem with getting foreign staff in. It was, yeah, it was just, just an interesting little thing to note. Oh, we had a hard I'm just wondering where the hell is this staff. foreign staff going? Like, what, what part of GW operates based on foreign staff precisely? I don't know. Is this like some sort of scam thing, like the European Parliament, where like, they're hiring people in from like cheap countries to work as cheap labor in their factories or something? Poland. Yeah. Little Leo there, <laughs> changing very hot to die and burning himself. Like, please stop. We can easily yeah. replace you, Julio. <laughs> yeah, Zutro here is as American as apple pie. Oh, no. I do love how they keep complaining about COVID. It's, it's, it pisses me off almost as much as the whole we're being suppressed by the tech giants part. It's like, oh yes, yeah, so you've had a huge problem with, uh, with COVID. I do like the like victimhood here. <laughs> they're like that one girl on Facebook who, like, everything that goes wrong in her life has to go up on Facebook. You know, she's, like, she's married to like a rich electrician or something. They have like this gorgeous house, wonderful kids. And she's there like, oh my god, post postman came today, crumpled up my letter when he put it in the letterbox. This is such bullshit. Why does this always happen to me? It's, that's Games Workshop, the company. So this whole way through the financial report, it's like, we made all this money, but, you know, Brexit and shipping and COVID. And it's just so hard to be a business. It's just so hard. We made $139 million in profit, but it's just really hard, okay? Mm-hmm. So terrible. So, uh, there's uh, going on through capital investment, and then we get down into non-core business on bottom of page seven, which is licensing, media, and entertainment. 
None core. We have again found great successes in licensing Warhammer into computer games with some world class partners. Uh, that'll be all those mobile uh, video game developers of the world class partners, keep in mind. Oh my god, tell uh, me. We have a number of major video games that are due to be launched in 2022, including uh, Total War, Warhammer 3, Warhammer 40,000, Dark Tide, and Lost Crusade. Deals have been announced to launch a major online game set in the Age of Sigma universe, as well as Space Marine 2. We continue to search for the right long-term partners to exploit other IP opportunities. I love they use exploit all the time in their <laughs> reports. It's great. We what have some further IP opportunities. We have some further exciting plans in development. Well, they can't have plans in development. It's it's the video game developers. Games yeah. Workshop can only ask them politely, Please unless make... they're going to make unless they're going to make like Warhammer Plus into a subscription video game service as well. They're just going to add trying to like fight Steam on their own turf <laughs> next. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Why the hell not? Total War Warhammer Four will be exclusive to Warhammer Plus. <laughs> The, the server is like one of those like 1950s computers with all the tape reels and shit. <laughs> That's all they had, the budget. The thing is, you joke, but I would not put it past them at all to be like, hey, um, this exclusive skin or whatever, or this unit or oh, whatever. No, be quiet, Arch. Don't give them ideas. You, you must have a Warhammer Plus subscription to get it. No, no, don't say it. Don't say it. You're giving them ideas. <laughs> you give this them is, ideas. They listen to this. Like they may hate you two. Okay, they don't even know who I am, so that's good. But they'll listen to you guys, and they'll be like, mm, "Yeah, that is a good idea. Thank you." <laughs> it's just, it'll, oh, be, uh, no. it'll be good, and they'll be, be excited and watch you negatively react to it, as if they're getting off to it. You know, that's what they do. <laughs> it'll be fun and engaging gameplay. Is what it will be. Is it gonna be like when um, Disney got was doing Force Awakens, and there was like you go to the grocery store, and there was like bags of oranges with Force Awakens labels on them? Oh God, yep. yeah. Oh, that man. was beautiful. I mean, you're you're a fan of the Total War franchise, are you, Maka? Oh yes. You remember? I don't know if it did it for you, but in the United States, I remember when Napoleon Total War came out. If you went to Target it would give you an exclusive unit. If you went to Best Buy, it would give you an exclusive unit. And these were alternative stores. But you couldn't you couldn't get them all, so you'd have to buy them as DLC. It was cancer. <laughs> we we have a lot less of the American stores. In fact, they, some of them are completely different in Australia. Like Wendy's in Australia is just an ice cream shop. And they just sell like soft serve ice cream and hot dogs. Right? Whereas Wendy's in the US is like a restaurant chain. Yeah. So... Um, we didn't have all those promotions, but we did have some, like I think Dr. Pepper, which is not a very popular drink here, they had like a promotion for it. So when it comes to food, we're, we're much closer to uh, the old world. We're much closer to the UK and that with our bland starchy substance that keeps us, you know, sustained. You poor guys. Well, hey, I went to an American... Uh, I went to a Walmart when I was over there and I couldn't believe what it was like. Like, what you guys think is cereal, I think you would get put in jail for in most totalitarian government uh, controlled stronghold because that is child cruelty. That is not cereal. Heroes are not cereal. Little pieces of like wheat stuffed with ice cream and marshmallow is not cereal. Oh my god. There's a, there's a massive culinary disparity, but you are right about something. Like, our our obsession with corn and the corn industry, this is a bit of a segue, but corn syrup is in everything here, and it's disgusting. Like, especially soda. Like, find, it's rare when you find a good brand of soda, because it'll say, real sugar, and then you'll have to check to be like, is there any corn syrup? Is there any <laughs> corn? I, I, I'm not a, a skinny guy. I put on heaps of weight over the last few years, because I've got really really bad knees i got like no cartilage in that so i can't do any of the exercise i used to do when i was younger mm. and slowly i'm getting fatter unfortunately <laughs> but when i went to the u.s i got to the point where i was just it was like i had the diabetes setting in i could just feel it and i was having to go and try and find like fruit and vegetables just so i could eat something that wasn't sugar and corn and 
and just con- concentrated carbohydrates. And I just felt so, I felt like crap, like legitimately felt like crap. Um, yep. The food was fantastic. The country was awesome. People were wonderful. But yeah, I am not built for eating that food. I'm sorry. I mean, we have a fat problem for a literal reason. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's something that yeah. you have to live with here. You learn how to eat around it, so to speak. So going back into... Uh, sorry, because I, I, I went off on a tangent there. But back into video games. Total Warhammer 3. Uh, great. Cool. Down with it. But Space Marine 2. Isn't that like 10 years too late? A little bit. That, uh, that depends to be seen. Uh, I'm very skeptical towards it because the first person we heard about that they hired for it is a uh, trans woman with a capital political T, which almost almost always means bad yeah, things. Yeah, one of the supporting writers was lauding Star, the new Star Wars for it, saying, like, I was literally shaking. It's like, oh... That's not a good sign. <laughs> oh, hey, is the kind of character you want to get in this, huh? Oh, uh, see, I I have low low expectations for that one, especially that one, mostly because they're gonna ride on the coattails of the predecessor, right? And I'm worried that they're gonna try to substitute the combat with tons of enemies on screen, but it's gonna be like almost like Dynasty Warriors, because some of the little bits of clips of in-game rendered footage that we saw. Like, it looked like just nids everywhere, and when you eat the whack stuff, like, you can't really see. Like, it's just too much clutter. Screen space clutter. And there was a lot of enemies you fought in the original, because remember when you fought those big hordes of orcs? But it felt like, you know, you were killing them pretty effectively, and it wasn't too much clutter. I'm worried that they're going to have the opposite problem here, where it's just going to come off as too much on screen. Yeah, I, I just... I don't have any confidence because this is not this isn't relic. This is the original crew. We have no idea about the pedigree of these people, and they've hired a person who I immediately distrust because of their political position. Now, may- maybe I hope I'm wrong. Maybe she's one of those few people who can manage to put their bullshit aside and just write a decent story. But there are too many little suspicious things. Like how, to begin with, for example, she announced that she was the lead writer, and I was like, no, 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 oh, I, I made a mistake. I'm not the lead writer. Do you, do you make that fucking mistake? Do you? Like, how? I'm the lead writer on this. No, hold on. I forgot my job title. It's not lead writer. It's assistant writer. Oh, I, I just got caught up. I'm the lead writer. Meanwhile, the lead writer's like looking at her like, the fuck? <laughs> Give, giving, her, giving her evil over the fucking counter. Yeah. She's now, she's now employed writing financial statements for the company that's getting 28 million views on videos. Yeah. I mean, you saw the KOTOR remake, right? Where the the one writer's like, hey, Star Wars is cringe. And then, like, later's like, I'm working on Knights of the Old Republic remastered. Well, also, we're going to change oh the story. <laughs> Star Wars has always been my favorite. People dig up a tweet. Yeah, I don't actually like Star Wars. I yeah. hate Star Wars. It's cringe. I'm paraphrasing, but basically. <laughs> we need to and get, of like, course, these... KOTOR. KOTOR's yeah, an excellent get... example because they're turning that into some kind of like actiony game yes. now apparently they're doing what they did to the final fi- uh, fantasy 7 remake where it switched over to a different sort of actiony styled rpg and they're citing like oh the combat's boring but they're not even just changing the gameplay right they're like they're changing the story it's like at this point it's not even the same game anymore like you're not preserving any aspect of this game at you're all. not making KOTOR. You're slapping KOTOR on the box so you can sell your own fucking fanfic. Yes. It's it's basically... Sounds like it's going to be a distorted fanfic of what Knights of the Old Republic was. Which is You know, disgusting. the sad thing is, you're just describing all media in a nutshell at the moment. Where they just take an existing IP, they... they it's, you know what it is? It's like the Hannibal Lecter skin suit. You know? Yeah. So someone... They, they peel, like, the skin... Of a of a popular franchise, and they're like wearing it over a completely <laughs> different thing. Oh my god! Despicable! It really is. You know, can we can we get like some new Star Wars like advertising uh, for Space Marine Two? Because you know how like with the the last film they released for Star Wars, they were they were trying to like harken back to the old original Star Wars. So half the trail was just clips from the original series instead of from their new sequel trilogy. And then just get the like the voiceover clip as like the Marines like running into that tyranny to cut him up. 
and then it's like Carrie Fisher's ghost. You know, it's a story about family. <laughs> Just that real like baseline marketing. The uncanny effect is what that also created. It was just almost haunting, wasn't it? You know, since that, uh, since that Space Marine as well in Space Marine 2 is a Primaris now, does that mean he's just going to, like, cakewalk through the Tyranids? Or is it like the game has difficulty modes? It's like when you play on hard mode, you get to unlock the old school Marine instead. You're an actual well, Marine. <laughs> it's, it's why they had to put the, uh, the story, like, 200 years into the future, because you can't have a Space Marine. In Space Marine 2. That, w- that would be silly. I mean, oh, God. Who, who would think about that? That's just that's I'm, ridiculous. I'm really annoyed by it, because there's so many people that would be, quote-unquote, on our side of the fence in this regard, and being critical of it, but they're, like, blindly simping for it. And I've had a lot of conversations with people, friend, uh, friends of mine, that they're like, oh, you guys are just over being paranoid about it. But the thing is, I think there's genuine concern here. Like, not only did they do a time skip, right? So the story's going to be discombobulated, excuse me, because we, we're going to have, like, at the end of Space Marine 1, the Inquisition takes basically takes Titus, and the developers said, the original developers, that their intention for the sequel was that Titus was going to have to go renegade to prove his loyalty to the Emperor. And that was going to be the second game. Uh, that was the, the premise. They've scratched that, thrown that in the dumpster, and they've decided to just time skip, like, a couple hundred years in the future, and he's in Primaris Armor. And we all know what reason it is. And we know who told them to do that. That was Games Workshop. And that's specifically because, well, the old Space Marines, it's plastic. And it's not about story. It's not about characters. It's about selling plastic garbage. So. Yeah, family. Okay. <laughs> shut the fuck up. <laughs> <I'm> like, <yeah. laughs> about family. Yeah, sure, whatever. It's about family now. And so <laughs> that's what they want to do. They want the Ooh. people to buy the new crap. Fast and the Furious crossover. Get uh, Dominic Torino in there as well. Yo, family. I don't see why not. Tyranids are strong, but they aren't as strong as family. Oh my god. (laughs) We're going to have to dox him, Arch. Give me his eyes right. (laughs) You'll get some spam mail all right. (laughs) Uh, Okay, Uh, entertainment. In terms of media and entertainment, progress continues and we are delighted to have signed up a major LA-based agency to help us. Eisenhorn is in development and the subject of discussions with potential distribution partners. We've made some solid progress in our writer's room and have a number of further exciting live-action animated projects in development. We remain ambitious and patient. My Translation. Big we don't know what the fuck's happening. We've been reassured <laughs> that something's happening. But all we can do is pray. Yeah, the thing that I took away from that was, why are you only signing an LA-based agency now? That should have been done well before Wyma Plus, because you need to, you know, get your content in place before you... They've done it ass about. They've put their Warhammer Plus in, and they're like, great, we've got a streaming service. Now what are we going to put on it? Everyone just sort of looked around the room, like, wait, we've got to put something... Oh, fuck, wasn't that your job? I thought it was your job. Uh, this company is this that they've hired has probably turned around to them gone, Wait, you already have something? What are your writers? What is what is your layout? What is your you know your plan going forward? And Games Workshop's just giving them the blank stare. Hey, the blank stare is too optimistic. I think they just left the room at that point. <laughs> We've hired you. It's your problem now, and they just like close the door. <laughs> this is not our issue anymore. It's out of our hands. <laughs> Because like if they're putting it on this shareholders report, that means it's happened within the last six months. I would also like to point out that not only that, but Eisenhorn is making solid progress. You finally talk to distributors now? Hold on. So you started this massive live action undertaking that we know nothing about. We don't know any casting. We don't know any actors. We don't know anything about the script. We don't know if it'll be based on the books, whether it'll be the original. We ha- Beyond hearing that it exists, we've heard nothing else. And now, two years or so after the announcement, you're talking with a distributor? So you don't even know where to put this when it's done? I thought it was supposed to be on Netflix. So they've just... they they. You know what this sounds like? Somebody's like, oh yeah, we're going to have a show, it'll be on Netflix. 
Oh, put that in the report. That'll sound good. <laughs> That's like an idea they were throwing around in the uh, the room, in the dev room or whatever they have. It's just so weird. It's so backwards. Like, it's probably in just a state of absolute disaster in all due likelihood. It's probably shaping up to be Ultramarines 2. And they showed that to the executives, and half of them just hung themselves with their ties then and there. Anyone who was alive for the first one, yeah. <laughs> They're dead. <laughs> Aren't they working on Ultramarines too? I think they are. Oh god, why? Why? That's a good just, question. Just call it something else. Don't don't link it to the last thing. That was so bad. Half the voice cast of the Ultramarine movie, I think, are dead now, so that's not going to help. Oof. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Their performance wasn't there, bad, but that's that's stellar, so. I'm not saying it was directly related to that project, but you know, I mean, it's not, not it, related. It hasn't stopped Disney before. If you know, like people are dead, and like, well, we can still sell them. It hasn't stopped both uh, people. I I saw. Um, oh God, what was his name? The the Marvel person who's in all the cameos. Oh, Stan Lee. Oh, yeah, Stan Lee. Uh, Stan Lee was selling NFTs the other day. Oh, God, that's... That's horrific. That was Bob Ross. All these dead people huh. are really into NFTs. Yeah, they're really into NFTs, as it turns out. So this is Nigerian up. prince who contacts me quite a bit. He might be interested in working with them. <laughs> He's about as real well. as they are now. <laughs> There was one I saw the other day that this dude, uh, and and it was, please help me, brother, for I am lost both my arms and legs in car accident. I'm thinking, how the fuck are you typing then? But um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, licensing income, royalties receivable in the period increased by 11.4 million pounds to 20.1 million pounds. This includes 13.7 million pounds uh, of guaranteed royalty income, which is recognised on the signing of new licence contracts, whilst uh, additional royalty income earned was equal to the prior period at $6.4 million. As always, the income continues to be uncertain, and as we recognise guaranteed royalty income in future, uh, sorry, in full on signing the contract, it is even harder to predict when further income will be recognised. Hmm. So, they made a deal with someone, for a lot of money. Question is who? Uh, so it, it seems like in general they were down slightly. They say holding steady at six point four million, uh, but at an additional thirteen point seven million over the last period. Uh, yeah, who did who they do a deal with? I wonder. Yeah, I'm curious about that too. Is this for the live action thing? It's just licensing income. It doesn't give any more details. So I'm guessing something like uh, scented candles. Oh, uh, well, the thing is, well, it might not also be a big deal with anyone. It might just be a lot of deals because they have been whoring their IP out like nobody's business, really. Like there are 40K jackets, there are 40K pens, lunch boxes, fucking bathrobes. Like oh, they're I think printing. Have my 40K beach towel. They're printing their logo on anything right now in the desperate hope that someone will give a shit, I guess. I mean, they're it... trying the shotgun spread approach to just getting their IP's name recognition out there. Like, what's the strategy here? Well, it works well, for a video game, so it's just... I think a video game is a rather different proposition than a hoodie. That's true. Halo, did so... Halo 3 was on, on Burger King boxes, I remember that. <laughs> Pretty cringe, yeah. Well, I mean, what are some of the things that they have put? Because uh, obviously, thirteen point seven is not just one person. You're dead right about that. But who? Like, okay, clothing. Yep, merchandising like coffee mugs. Uh, the Space Marine action figures, maybe like that would have to come under there because it's not under entertainment video game. So, all those Space Marine quote unquote collectible action figures that are like seven inch tall, crappy versions of Gundams. Uh, there's those. Then you've got, of course, your scented candles. Uh, I, if I bought that for my wife for Valentine's Day, I would be divorced. I think the next day. But uh, what else? What else is there? Anything in particular? 
that's not video games, not movies, anything like that, that they've been just slapping their name on? Like, would Marvel come under that, or would they come under entertainment, like the comic books, that ever-popular Marnius Kelgar comic? I would think entertainment. And they they have tried a couple of things with that. They've also tried a couple of things with the um, the books, of course, as well, but none of them have been particularly popular. Like, the Horus Heresy has been their mainstay series for a while now, and they don't really have another one. Like, back in the day, they had Cyphus Kane, they had Gaunt's Ghosts, they had uh, the Space Wolf series. They had quite a lot of standalone series that were doing quite well and racking up long uh, an extended, uh, you know, ten years. What do what do they have now? Like, what's what's their currently ongoing popular series? <laughs> I just had a funny thought. Could it could it be like, uh, is it like you know how they were like clown franchises, like your Bozo the Clown type thing? Is there like a Primara Space Marine, eating, like some shitty van that goes around doing kids parties? Oh my god! It's just like not? hi. <laughs> it's just it's just someone bought the license. Buy plastic miniatures, kid. Just send space marines around to kids' parties. There's like some guy in like a foam cosplay <laughs> in a cosplay space marine, you know, at kids' parties trying like he's got a kid on his knee trying to like take photos. You're not a real space marine. But... <laughs> Sorry, all correct, the worst kid. ideas. All the worst ideas this stream are all mine, I apologize. I think he's trying to get a job at DW, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> they have stolen some of my best content, some of my least salty, most uh, best intent content. They have deliberately stolen it and put out like an article on Warhammer Community within the week. That has happened to me multiple times. Starting to get over, pretty over that, actually. I mean, they don't need to pay the ideas guy if he's just going to keep spitting them out for free, do they? <laughs> it's true. Where's my Warhammer Plus deal? Where's your 15,000 pounds? <laughs> Oh, on that point, too, there was the very interesting portion in their uh, write-up where they stated that they would, uh, that they were creating a new community outreach team, too, because people just loved fan-made animations, you see, and they, they want to help that along a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's funny. So, scrolling further down, uh... They did open up four new retail locations after closing eight stores, and their net total number of stores at the end of the retail period is 519. Retail, they say, remains a challenging environment, so they're being pragmatic with their store opening program. Our stores are improving at different rates as a direct consequence of whether they can open or not. Our Warhammer World store at our HQ in Nottingham has been over for eight months now, and is trading at pre-COVID levels. Our Warhammer Cafe it's stores... Flooded with sewage for only one month. <laughs> that's that's a bonus. That's a feature. What are you talking about? Uh, our Warhammer Cafe stores in Dallas and Los Angeles together with our relocated store on Tottenham Court Road in London are also performing well. We hope the second half gives us the opportunity to once again show our full and unique retail offer and get back to our face-to-face -face training sessions. And then the last thing they point out is the majority of our stores are profitable, 34 of which are not. Yeah. Things are starting That's... to tank a little, maybe. Well, the majority. Because majority. you said they closed down eight stores and they opened the total of four, right? Correct. So their net gain is, well, they don't have a net gain. They, they have a net loss, so it's four uh, stores. And based on what this sounds like, it sounds like there's actually slow decay happening here. Like they're actually on a downward trend. And there's well, also where we see the uh, the trade, because they mention a, what was it, 2-3% increase in trade? Hmm. They're, but they're saying there that 6.5%, so we'll round up to 7, so it's just over 6.5% of their stores are unprofitable. Mm -hmm. And that's on top of the 8 that they just closed. So I'm guessing the 8 they closed were the ones that um, were at least probably. really... Yeah, really unprofitable. So obviously these other ones are the ones that are next on the chopping block. 
And this is also in the context of an, a general increase in trade after COVID, because these shops have actually suffered under COVID because they're brick and mortar stores. And in some areas that has been hit fairly hard, though. Fortunately for GW, uh, they don't actually want to have any community activities at their store anyway, so that part didn't take care. It's yeah, it's, it's just interesting to note because I'd be interested to compare and contrast with other similar types of hobbies because there's this weird thing where people always trying to find games with shop practices by using these really weird analogies like. Well, of course it's expensive. All hobbies are expensive. Look at pro fighter jet races. Like, it's an expensive hobby to get into. I would imagine that pro fighter jet races are a pretty expensive hobby to get into, yes. Yeah, that's right. I have like. I also imagine the vetted of it is made of plastic. Yeah, I have like three SU-27 flankers in the backyard. I need to offload one because I'm trying to buy a new F-35, but even our government can't get a hold of those things. But, yeah, it, it's just interesting because they're... What would you compare them to? I think you'd have to compare them with just regular retail chains. And what regular retail chains have a 7% unprofitability um, for their stores? Good question. And that is also, um, we know COVID, though, again, did a number on all retail. So it might just be that lingering, but... What strikes me as most interesting was that this is the year where stuff has been opening up again. Like, we are heading towards less problems on this front. And yet they've only seen a, a tiny increase of a few percent in this area. Really, you've had all of this trouble. You've got all of these problems. Your, your profits have been tanking because of COVID. And yet now that COVID is going away, you've only had a tiny bump. Meanwhile, you've lost 10% of your online sales. Something's wrong here. Well, if you include those eight stores as well uh, and take away the four additional ones that have been created, you're actually over 8% uh, on profitability of stores. So that's a significant amount because you're starting to close in on that magical 10% figure. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so... In the online space, they say their on online sales declined by 10% compared to the same period last year. Maintain the step change in sales order levels against the prior year is the plan. So As when you take planned. into account when you take into account that okay, brick and mortar stores, you got eight percent, seven best case percent unprofitable. You have most of those retail stores being hit hard by the lockdowns and all of the associated stuff to do with that then you have online sales dropping by 10 percent, and yet they still made three percent additional sales so are they selling they're, they're selling less kits they're more unprofitable as a company but they made more profits so i'm guessing they sold more expensive kits which wouldn't surprise me because a lot of their uh, their new stuff has been focused on the high high light expensive stuff too. Uh, you've probably seen the uh, the early looks at the Tau redesign with one particularly large and expensive tank uh, taking the lead. Yes. So I guess the question is, are they making more of those big box sets? And uh, one of their greatest little like FOMO things, one of their big restrictions they like to do, I've noticed, is. They release a box with miniatures that they just don't release for a very long time individually. So take the Chaos Space Marines when they got their last uh, getting started box or whatever. It had like that big demon engine spider thingy and the obliterators in it, neither of which, and I don't, I don't think the Greater Possessed as well, I don't think any of them are available individually. You have to buy the big box. Which is a very good thing if uh, you want to squeeze the maximum amount of cash out of somebody. You know, is is I think this is something that has happened across the board. Stuff is released, and then when it is released individually, man, they crank those prices. The Marines out of that uh, ninth edition starter set weren't they almost as much just for the, like the Marine component as like the whole box? If you're to buy all the Marine stuff separately, it's the box. People say, "Oh, the box is a fifty percent discount." No, I think the stuff from the box is a hundred percent increase in price. 
I'm going to play the cynical card there. I don't think they they lose money on those big box sets at all. I think those big box sets are, are made deliberately to make a profit. Uh, they just make less profit. Like less. I wouldn't overall. be able to comment on that honestly, but I wouldn't be surprised. I assume you mean like less sales overall, but they still are profitable. Yes. They also note in here that our customers have a lot of uh, options when it comes to shopping for Warhammer Online and are able to buy our products both through our own web store and those of independent retailers. Now, keep in mind, independent retailers are immediately 50% price. That's what they buy Games Workshop stock at. And Games Workshop has their recommended retail price that they should sell at, which is Games Workshop's price that they themselves charge. Games Workshop makes money off independent retailers. So at 50%, Games Workshop is already making a profit. May not be as much of a profit, might be stuff all in it. You know, maybe they can justify that, oh, you know, at 50%, we only make 1% profit. Who knows? But that means that every time someone walks into a hobby store, buys a kit for $100 off the shelf, you they got $50 additional profit on top of whatever profit they would have made selling it to some third party. Even more money. It's, you know, so when they say, oh, they can't afford to drop their prices, yes, they can. They have a 50% additional margin in there. And, but if they did, of course, the arse would completely fall out of their business looking at this financial report. Uh, the board has signed off on the first phase of a web store upgrade. The capital investment is approximately £6 million. To date, we have spent about uh, £300,000. They replaced the web store, what, five years ago? And I think it's objectively worse than it used to be. So it is at least good to see them doing a update. But what are they going to turn it into with the update that is actually going to improve the functionality is my question. Well, I can answer that. Uh, having been a YouTuber for an extended period of time now and seen YouTube update my back end several times, uh, they're going to make it worse than it was. Yep. I think we all agree with that. I don't think... I don't think there's a single YouTuber among us that would be like, oh, I there's, love There's changes. really no other option. Like, <laughs> improving the service is not an option. Like, it's, it's not they don't, even have a, they don't even have a dislike button to disable, though. So, where, where do you go from here? Well, they could add it and then take it away. Maybe, maybe you just go into the Games Workshop web store and they have some algorithm. It's, like, recommended for you. And they just, like, pre-fill your basket with a bunch of shit. I wouldn't be surprised. It would also be a wonderful way to clean out some of the uh, the backstage stock. It's like, oh, hello, the, your browsing history indicates to us that you would really love Age of Sigmar. And as it turns out, we have got warehouses full of this shit. Please buy it. <laughs> the item you're looking to purchase is currently out of stock, but would you like Age of Sigmar instead? Based upon your browsing history of Tyranids, we have selected a range of uh, Age of Sigma Stormcast Eternals that we think would suit you. They're very close. We see you've been looking for uh, Valhallen for uh, Valhallens for your Imperial Guard for the last six months. Unfortunately, uh, we decided to cancel those because we've downsized the entirety of Forge World to six men and their mothers. But we do have a lot of Stormcast Eternals for you. Different types, varieties, perhaps? <laughs> they have conversion kits. Look, these can be blue. Yeah. I, I want some Forge World. Best I can do is some Stormcast. <laughs> Best I yeah. can do is some... I'm sure you can, you know, make it work. <laughs> I, got a, I, got of course... a, I got a friend who's a specialist in Stormcast Eternals. He'll tell you what they're worth. God. Some uh, helpful links to Warhammer Plus as well. We see you haven't been browsing Starcast uh, Stormcast Eternals. We've changed this for you. Incidentally, would you like to purchase a five dollar painting tutorial for your Stormcast Eternals? I had a horrible thought. Now that you say that, like a really cynical, horrible. What if they start to curate it like uh, some of the more shonky, like your Blizzard, your Activisions of this world, curating? Um, so you go to purchase like a Tactical Squad, and they say. If you buy this tactical squad now, we'll chuck in this Primaris Lieutenant and knock four pounds off the cost of it. Like, do those targeted sales. 
yep. so that Games Workshop can finally say they do do sales and they're just trying to target you with the crap that just doesn't shift off the shelves. What we fucking need is loot boxes. Warhammer Plus loot boxes. Oh. Yeah, you can, if, if you get a Warhammer Plus subscription, there's a chance that if you open, you know, it'll come with different copies of White Dwarf that aren't regularly available on Warhammer Plus and even a free miniature. In, in like one every yes. 400 billion boxes. <clears throat> yep. And every every month. There's a Stormcast Eternal. Every month you're subscribed, you get a loot box and it contains like fucking pictures of Space Marines, something absolutely terrible. Here's a show. And digital as well. Digital. <laughs> Di- digital pictures, yes. Of course. Like they're fan art. They're like, or concept art from Space Marine 2 after it's failed miserably. Or just concept art for Stormcast Eternal. It's just nothing but. Free, free copy of Dawn of War 3. Mm-hmm. And oh, once, oh, oh. once a year, you get a premium loot box, and it's got this long list of things. Like, oh my god, you could get, uh, like, a demon prince and shit, or you could get a thousand-point army, something insane. That and you need to purchase you... a key for it. You need a key to open that this you... box, otherwise it crushes its contents. Yes. <laughs> no, they they tied in with they tied in with their with their crappy um, mobile video game market. So like you get like I don't know six gems. You know if it's like some premium currency for one of their video games, they'll give you like six bonus gems on your Warhammer Plus subscription. Mm-hmm. Oh my! And you only need seven to unlock the key. In before Games Workshop's website has these special currencies like a mobile game, you need thirteen premium gems to get a fifteen percent discount. How much is premium? You need gem? thirteen Stormcast Eternals to purchase this item. Oh, after you earn enough, uh, instead of skulls, it'll be like Primaris Marine helmets. So it's after you earn, uh, make enough purchases of Games Workshop, you earn enough Primaris Marine helmets. You get a special unlock which allows you to purchase not not get for free, but allows you into a secret area to purchase an item. They're all just you can add an item to cart. <laughs> yep, that you normally can't get. It's it's all just like forty Primaris lieutenants, but. And they're all real, like, it's really shitty, too. So it's like, it's an exclusive store that you premium access to. And the exclusive store is like, here's a hat. Got a sticker printed on it with our logo. It's a little bit lopsided because it was made in China. <laughs> it's like being it's one of those, like, find on logos where, like, someone, you know, where like, you put it in the washing machine, it just peels off. <laughs> Listen, you already paid for it. It's like, whatever happened to it, happened to it. It's been past a week. And the final thing they need to add in, because this is a, a digital upgrade to their storefront, they need what every uh, self-respecting storefront needs to have in the current year. If you spend enough money, you can gain access to an exclusive Primaris Lieutenant NFT. Ooh, ooh! When is Games Workshop doing NFTs? <laughs> I'm surprised they haven't started. No, wait, they already have. They just haven't released anything yet. I'm sure they're working on it. There's probably some like intern at Games Workshop just furiously scribbling down notes right now. Just fuck, that's a good idea. Why didn't we think of that? Oh my God, we could have made millions already. <laughs> and the NFT will be tied like, oh, if you purchase this NFT right now, you'll get exclusive in-game item for Dawn of War Three. Uh, <laughs> why? <laughs> that's why, a dead game, why is bro. it we're releasing? Why is it we're releasing unit cards in, in the box sets when we could be releasing? rare unit cards like shinies like in other collectible tabletop games so instead of just pulling your rules for your primaris intercessor squad out of the box someone could pull out a set of the shiny rules and then it becomes a tradable commodity like oh Mm. look at this and (laughs) the final step will be to add extra rules to these things you're like i killed your demon prince and like a fucking Yu-Gi-Oh game you go like haha you've activated my nft trap card (laughs) he lives and you lose, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> you your, your Warhammer Plus uh, gets you like a certain amount of re-rolls per month. Yep. With your subscription. Oh my you just God. pull it out. Like, as you can see here, I'm entitled to exactly three re-rolls this game. I, actually, I'm a level three premium subscriber. <laughs> I'm yeah, well, I have two subscriptions to Warhammer Plus. Which gives me access to the I revoke your re-rolls. <laughs> 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 oh, it hurts. We, we it should hurts. open up our own game studio for uh, tabletop games, guys. We'd do pretty good. 
uh, all you got to get is, is enough loyal fans to put up with it. And we're working uh, on it. So, <laughs> so uh, they, they've moved into the Asian market. They continue to make some good progress, hampered a little by the process of toy safety certification. We had our first external audit, which was passed. Various delays have resulted in the decision to remove uh, to move our new release schedule by approximately 10 weeks to allow us to catch up. Not great for our customers in Asia. However, with the accreditation, our long-term growth would be threatened by legal restrictions without it. The work on the new... We decided to break our toys out of lead. Unfortunately, people were dying. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> The work on a new Warhammer Cafe store in Shanghai has also been pragmatically paused to ensure it gets off to the best possible start. And I'm Brilliant. sure it has nothing to do with the fact that Shanghai people are being uh, you know, repressed ever so slightly. They're going to have to remove yeah, the read, skulls read. on the model. That reads as government interference to me, but mm -hmm. uh, they also say, like all of our stores, it will be run as a profitable store. Just ignore the other 8% of stores we mentioned earlier that we yeah. are profitable. Like all um, of our stores. <laughs> <laughs> we are hoping, uh, we are hopeful about opening a new cafe style store in Tokyo in 2022. We have in the period increased uh, retail purchasing by approximately 25%, uh, aligning with our global pricing strategy. I hope it's something incredibly racist. I hope Did it's just reckon? Tao everywhere. <laughs> just Tao. And they they ext they extol the virtues of communism. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Prim Taoist, the uh, the new Tao, like super Tao. Tao is meant. actually a uh, reference to uh, Maoism, which is very lo is lauded as a. I don't even know. Is it? I don't even remember. Didn't they disavow Mao at some? Is it like some like Tao ethereal in like a glass coffin, and the people like pilgrimage to see him? Oh my god. Why not? Just like Can Stalin. that be a thing? Could be. The, the right People's brain. Republic of Tao. There's nothing that can't be a thing, if applied liberally enough. The PRT. But again, this is the funny thing about like not understanding like the Asian market and trying to open stores at basically the same time in Japan and China. Like, just, just tackle one, guys. Get that one right, because you're talking about two incredibly different markets, which also have a lot of animosity towards each other. There's every chance that one of those stores could be boycotted simply for the fact that it's also in the other country. They go, oh, what Chinese people go, oh, what the Japanese like this store? Well, then we don't like it anymore, and vice versa. That's true. There, well, there's a high level of racism in Asia that's actually not talked about between the different cultures, especially China, Japan. Fortunately, there's also a high level of racism in Nottingham as they just look at the uh, the slanty-eyed people and go, what, they're all the same? Oh my god, that's true. Based on this document, that's basically what they're doing. Like, they're all the same. They're no different. This document's racist, guys. Yeah, you can treat Asia, you know, the largest continent, as just a homogenous entity. They're all the same. It, it, it's basically like putting a Warhammer store into the US and Canada. It's it's basically the same. Yeah. You know, I didn't realize this, but GW is remarkab remarkably narrow-minded when you think about it. <laughs> Only when you think about it. You know, in a, in a racial yeah, degree, yeah. of course. Yeah, you just treat them as exactly the same culture. And the Japanese are definitely not going to compare it to, because they're already a, a very heavily... Um, a culture that's already heavily marketed towards by like toys and video games and you know uh, those sort of genres. Notoriously, like Western comics and wokeism has failed in Japan, and it's going to be very interesting to see as well with like having like Gundam and all these famous like modeling companies and that that come from Japan. That's a tough market to crack into successfully. Yep, because there's already established big shots over there. Good luck. You know, it's like why Starbucks failed in Australia because Australia has like great coffee and that, and Starbucks couldn't just come in with like crap coffee into that market. But then they realized they could be hip and cool, and then everyone would drink their shit coffee just because it's Starbucks. Yeah, still no. They've completely failed in our market. Yes, good. Hmm. One less cancerous coffee shop. 
chain to spread. There's, an, there's another there's another store that I think completely failed. I think a Taco Bell. They they exist here, but like it's super rare. What? Taco Bell doesn't sell tacos. They sell pretend tacos. They're... I just can't believe they won the franchise wars. What do you mean? Which one? <laughs> the uh, I was just a Demolition Man reference. God damn. Tons of features. He has over my that. head. It's on my list of things to watch, but I need people to watch it. With... I'm sorry. There's no way Taco Bell is winning the franchise wars. Taco they're, they're Bell, like fancy restaurants. Good. Yeah. They're they're like first out. You know you know who's gonna win? It's gonna be whoever convinces people that their food is healthy. Like a subway or um yeah, one of one of those like salad joints. That's who's gonna win the franchise wars. No, it's gonna be fucking McDonald's because they're gonna be like, We're still eating salad now and people will go, Whoa, salad Ooh, and McDonald's they'll be eating salad. them and it's crunching their teeth and it's like there's an awfully lot of sugar in the salad. Yeah. That's why you like it so well. True. With a little bit of heroin. <laughs> hey, that's what's reintroducing Coca Cola now with the original formula uh -oh. cocaine. <laughs> Our users are addicted, but hey. <laughs> that's gonna be great when you're lining up for McDonald's and everyone is like scratching themselves around you. Yeah, great. <laughs> They're fighting in line. Oh my god, that already happens in like third world parts of the United States because the United States has third world parts. Where you'll see, like, you know, people like, where are my chicken candies? <laughs> I think I went to one of those, like, really um, impoverished, run-down parts of America. I believe it's called Chicago. Ah, yes. They're a neighbor. They're quite cancerous. Yeah. Chirac. It was... Just avoid yeah. Chicago. Sh avoid Chicago altogether. Chicago deep dish style pizza? Fantastic. This, the, but you don't need to go to Chicago to have that, by the way. Other states have just copied it to make it easier for the rest of us. I also went to uh, San Fran, where they've got the poop track app. Oh, fuck. So you can track where all the homeless people have defecated on the ground, so you can not step in it. Did you only visit the places that are basically no-go zones? <laughs> no, no, I was actually, I had to go through those parts as part of the travel. Where I was actually headed was Indiana. Oh, that's a nice state. It was lovely, yeah. Really rain it. Would gladly go back there. I uh, also got to go through Texas on the way home, which is also pretty nice. Another good state to visit. Very similar weather to here, actually. I would imagine. In Texas. Hell. <laughs> Hot and uh, close. Okay, so now we get into the, into the meat, the best parts of this um, financial report. Risks and uncertainties. The board has overall responsibility for ensuring risk is appropriately managed across the group and has carried out a robust assessment of the principal risks to the business. The top four strategic risks of the group are regularly reviewed by the board. The principal strategic risks identified in 21-22 are discussed below. These risks are not intended to be an extensive analysis of all risks that may arise, but more importantly, are the ones which we believe could cause business interruption in the period ahead. So, the four big risks that they think exist are the digital selling strategy, the IT strategy and delivery, media, and social responsibility. <laughs> you got. You don't think that 3D printing would merit a mention in there? They don't no, want to mention because... that. They're scared. Yes, just like the dodo, the, the head is buried in the sand. This is fine. It's, it's not a problem, guys. It's not a problem. It'll go away. It's a fad. It's a fad. <laughs> It will not be a problem. I remember that article that said video oh, the toy companies were like, video games are just a fad. Kids will stop doing that weird shit and get back to buying toys. Poor bastards. I've been, I've been meaning to make a video with like that clip from um, Naked Gun where there's like the building exploding in the background and, and these, the policeman stand there's nothing to see here. There is nothing to see here. Like all this crazy shit's happening. <laughs> that is this in a nutshell. There's like 3D printing in the background, there's recasters, there's competitor companies, there's all these Kickstarters for model kits and games workshops. They're like, the biggest problem is our digital selling strategy. Yeah, it's that. And don't look at the other problems. <laughs> and social responsibility, where they state, we don't intend to greenwash or to be politically correct. Ooh. We believe we are already good corporate citizens and we have been making some good progress quietly in the background. 
We are looking Shout for ways bro, bro. we can support global initiatives, including climate change, <laughs> diversity, oh. and equality. We have recruited a senior manager to document a realistic plan to make some progress, comma, forever. <laughs> Look, they are not good corporate citizens unless they have served the state. Service guarantees citizenship, not corporatism, you shills. <laughs> corporate citizen. Well, what on the right is side, a corporate citizen? I have no Consumers? Idea. They are taking a brave and laudable stance in favor of climate uh, climate change. We need more climate change, because frankly, this year was a little bit chilly. <laughs> That's why they're trying to you know heat up more uh, plastic. <laughs> like, come on, guys, it's getting cold. <laughs> Now, corporate citizen, that actually does mean something. That's the thing. That is an actual term that, unfortunately, is far too popular these days. Um, there was a, um, a poll done over in Hell, uh, also known as America, uh, a while ago, where they approached many of the sheep who live in that cursed place and asked them, hey, what do you think is a corporation's responsibility as, like, good corporate citizens? And a lot of them said that they need to take social responsibility, that the corporations should be taking actions where politicians are not to uh, fix injustices or social problems. This is an American problem that is waffling its way into England. Yeah, good. But, but, but politicians are supposedly at least elected into their positions. Well. Like they've been given the right and the responsibility to enact change for the citizens of, you know, your nation versus some company just arbitrarily crowning themselves as king. Hold on, But Marka. I mean, the social media companies have already done that, so too late well, like to go back now. Well, Mark, you're not entirely correct. Remember, they, they, they are elected by the board. <laughs> this, this just by true. a smaller electorate. <laughs> That's not the and, same. <laughs> and really, who better to know what, you know, big companies throwing their weight around really does, because Games Workshop, as you know, are affected by the YouTube algorithm quite negatively. And, um... Poor I cannot YouTube. say that with a straight face. Those poor guys. God, I feel so bad for them. <laughs> it's just... But the things that read really bizarrely about this is that you've got both a... a, a, a what you don't point out in a document like you're talking to, an, to the audience... You're talking to the board. It's a formal document. You don't say we. Uh, you don't mention things like politically correct or greenwashing, because what you're saying there is we know already the backlash that this policy is going to bring. You don't do that, in, you know, in these sort of things. You just leave it as its own sentence. You just say social responsibility. We um, want to have a anti-discrimination policy, and we don't want to pollute the environment. You just leave it at that. Like that's that's the that's it that's the extreme you go to if you're going to write this policy. You don't write in there. By the way, we're not greenwashing it. We're not politically correct, and we're going to make some progress. And then end it with like that chilling line that just says "forever." I do like that "forever" there. It's very cute and how it's placed. It's like all this stuff and like forever. Like we're not going to stop, even if it's financially unsustainable. We're going to keep doing it till we're you know in the ground. It's just, it feels so wrong. It feels like Harvey Weinstein reaching his hand across to my leg. Like, how you doing? I'm going to keep my hand here forever. <laughs> the thing is, they, they still haven't given up on using these things as weapons. This is something that, well, the, the Wokers have been telling the corporations for ages that this can totally be used to their advantage. As long as they behave like good corporate citizens and they uh, they drag along to the SJW narrative, the social justice narrative, they will receive way more customers. Oh, if you only market these things to women, women will totally play Wormer 40k. It's great, etc. And they keep thinking that this will actually happen. It doesn't, but they keep thinking it. However, it's gotten such a negative sound to it now that they are kind of starting to try and cover their bases. They want to virtue signal by saying, our universe is awful, while still going, Ultramarines are cool, please buy them. Yep. It's strange that they would try and market towards, like, social justice warrior types when social justice warrior types don't have money. It's true. They don't. Well... 
like many of them uh, spend their lives in academia and not even like running academia, just life on studies. You know, many of these people that you see, quote unquote, on television that are that way inclined politically are on TV. And, and it says like, you know, member of some crappy society, but they're not actually like a professor. They're not a doctor or anything like that. They've just spent their whole life in university, just going from class to class to class, racking up debt on that they're never going to repay because they're never going to get a meaningful job. And yet they're, they're an expert, quote unquote. Uh, these people aren't buying Glamour. They think your, your product's problematic. That's why they're not buying it. So unless you change to something they no longer think is problematic, then they might buy it, but it's going to be like a bland vanilla paste at the end of that process, which won't interest them. So they won't buy it. <laughs> all, of it all of this circles back to they won't buy it. So why even try and target them? Just this is the right time for the company to just fly under the, under the radar, to fly under the radar and, and just lay low, let, let the social justice mob blow over, get up, dust yourself off, and continue selling money to nerds, selling your product to nerds for lots of money. Well, the thing is, it's the same problem with how they can't recognize the primary strength of their product is the community. They don't want shops running community events because they view that as a waste of time because an event isn't money. It isn't a physical, tangible benefit immediately. It's long term and they're too silly to see this. It's because they don't understand their customer base. They don't understand that it's loyal fans that have put them where they are. They don't understand that these are the people purchasing their overpriced products. And they're heading towards this ephemeral supposed market off into the distance. And the wokeists are the ones telling them that they can get them there. Because they're saying that, hey, we're in politics. We are in academia. We have a lot of power. And they do. And they are trying to convince GW that they can absolutely use this power to make GW break into the mainstream. That's what they're thinking. They have lost complete sight of that previous market, their market, their audience. But here's, here's where that all falls apart, because if, let's say you successfully uh, planned it to uh, people who are greens, right? They don't want any like fossil fuel emissions and they want carbon neutrality and all this other crap, right? Games Workshop is not a tolerable entity to those people because a tolerable entity is something like airplanes, automobiles, public transport. It creates carbon, but it's there for a purpose and we need it in order to maintain some kind of quality of life. Games Workshop is a niche luxury hobby that exists only to create waste. And sure, it can bring enjoyment to people, but what's enjoyment to a political ideologue? Games Ruining Workshop, as far as most people. Things. Yeah, as far as they're concerned, the company would be better off to just not exist because then they can't pollute the environment at all, right? And there comes the twist because they're not actually interested in the company or the hobby or the products or anything like that. They're interested in power. That it's the overriding principle. Whenever you see the workers do anything, it's about power. They want to get into the company because the company is currently popular. It's currently in the uh, it's in the now. It's in the news. It's doing well, they think, and so they they want a part of it. And they will tell whatever lie they have to to get in the door. And furthermore, to continue to get more power, they will point out all of those problematic things you just mentioned to increase their influence. When eventually the company begins tanking under this, they don't care. They'll simply move on to the next company. My work here is done. It's a company like Burns in the background. But this is a very persuasive line of reasoning for a lot of the top executives because there will be politicians, there will be academic people, there will be those accepted by the mainstream talking to them. And if they aren't in the know on this, they won't see the danger. They won't understand it. Though I do know from people I've talked to inside GW that the whole Warhammer is for everyone thing, that was not well received. And GW recognized that. And they set up a bunch of little hearings, basically, to figure out, well, what did we do wrong? Like, we did this because everyone would love us, and yet people were throwing shit at us in the streets. What, what went wrong? So much shit in the streets, actually, that it came up in their front lawn. 
Indeed. So they are they are aware of that a lot of this does have a very negative sound, but these companies take forever to turn. Like even if they know now that wokeism is not a hundred percent winning move, it's gonna take them ten years to finally go like, hmm, shit, we've we've bashed our head against the wall for so long and it isn't working. Maybe we try something else. Lucky lucky they've got that uh person who's been in wokeism for so long and climate and social responsibility for so long, even though it's only a brand new thing. They've been in it for so long, it is definitely going to be a good move for the company. He's going to fix their rickety image. The person sitting yeah. there going like, yeah, so this is how you include more females. First, you need more female models. We already have an entire female faction, though. Not good enough. What are they clamoring for? It's female space marines. Oh, well, there you go. I still yep. kind of hope they'll do it just, just so I can finally hit them over the head with it. For the meme value. Because it will but probably it, fail. Isn't that kind of argument, though, is just so disingenuous to women? Like, they, for all their talk of equality, they have they don't demonstrate it because you're basically saying women can't identify with someone who's not a woman. Oh, yeah. Like, they well, can't yeah. possibly de- identify with this universe, even though I've seen tons of women playing orcs. But they've got to be one of the most popular factions I've seen amongst female wargamers is orcs. They just like them. They think they're comical or whatever, or they enjoy painting them. Uh, also, Eldar. Eldar are big among women as well. Making female marines, I don't see how that would improve things uh, beyond the fact that you're catering to that group of people who have a very loud voice about why they can go through 30 years of background in the universe, find one sentence that justifies it, and then go, well, there you go, there it is. Well, like, again, it's it's the ideologue. There's a Black Library author, um, Danny Ware. She is exactly that kind of ideologue. There was a warmer community post not that long ago with the title, I will die on the hill of a woman's right to geek, promoting her new book about the Sisters of Battle. This is a woman who is a professional writer, who is hired by Games Workshop, by Black Library, the creators of 40k. They are paying her to write about 40k, and yet still she sits there going, there's not enough representation. We, we aren't allowed to enjoy the hobby. I'm just a poor, paid professional. I don't understand. Because it's not about reality. It's not about women not being able to play anything but Adeptus Horroritas. It's ridiculous. It is about power. This is their in, and the stupid-ass executives at the top will go, yes, women are indeed sheep. I agree. Well, it's really silly, no matter what way you cut it, to portray it as if women don't have the agency to uh, identify with things other than... Like, you know, look at a film like Lord of the Rings. Basically, the only female in that entire trilogy is Liv Tyler's character, Arwen. And yet I remember a lot of women sitting around to watch a full nine hours of that. Yeah, she doesn't have a lot of screen time. So, uh, also, I noticed in here, they talk about their IT strategy and delivery, which has been really tied with their digital selling strategy uh, about how they want to achieve all these global strategic goals and yada yada. And I just sort of realized that they're spending uh, $6 million, they said, on delivering their new um, web store, that's twice what they spend annually on their staff salaries. Well, a web store is profitable. Employees is uh, just a headache. I agree on this point. Employees are wasteful, greedy, and downright bastards all around. In fact, they should be grateful even having jobs. Well, it kind of reads that way. So Kyle yeah, just... agrees with me. Look at Arch. He's like, somebody, please. I need validation. <laughs> just <laughs> think of employees as artists and you'll understand. Yeah, but I still treat them like human beings, though. Or just like that. Yeah, disgusting. and it's people like you that are the fucking problem. Why are you working with him when you should just be saying you'll give him exposure? Come on. Ooh. You gotta, you gotta go full on like late stage capitalist. I mean, exp- the exposure thing's a little, almost a little too harsh. Even even Arch's soulless, cold, dead heart can't even go that. 
<laughs> but I do absolutely agree that we should uh, take take many breaking devices to hold workers' right things. I I don't understand why they should be treated this way. Like this, firstly, they aren't even human. Secondly, <laughs> they're property. He That's correct. Break. He wants a meal break. Why does he need to eat? Yeah. Much like women and hammers, employees are property. You're not burning enough calories to sanction a, a feeding period. <laughs> so, someone, I will say, there, like, sound clipping all this right now. <laughs> Marvel made the absolute right move when they made Thor's hammer Mjolnir a woman. Because again, just like hammers, women are property too. Say it after me. Women are property too. Do it. Crap, we'll be clipped. <laughs> and again, these are these are the same people though that like yeah, think that a woman can't enjoy Warhammer unless she personally is represented in it. Yep. Like me, I'm just lucky that like I can identify with the Dark Eldar because I just happen to clone uh my own foot soldiers and have a harem. Like it's that's you know I'm just I wasn't able to identify with Warhammer until they did introduce the Dark Eldar in third edition. Then I finally had someone I could identify You're with. You're like, ah, oh, slavery, beautiful. <laughs> Same. I mostly identify with the Chaos Dwarves because I too am a rotund midget with a uh Slave pen. Oh, I worship cows too. Yes. Flying oh, cows, mind God. though. I'm not Indian. Jesus. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, no need to be weird about it. <laughs> yeah, now that's just strange. Like, yes, we don't uh, run over cows in the street. And they just won't let them walk anywhere. Oh, I don't have that problem. My cow flies. So, the last thing in their risks and uncertainties, which the only thing that's actually worth talking about, and this one is just a quick throwaway sentence, but it's probably the most important sentence in this document. Uh, they say, Our biggest risk is senior management becoming complacent. I will continue to do my best to make sure it does not happen. That's code for we're going to fire someone important. Somebody important is going to run out of a job. But it won't that's, be me. Yes, that's where the... You say that to the board and the shareholders because you're basically preparing them. It's real subtle, and that's why it's a single sentence. You're preparing them because someone important is either going to resign amicably, quote-unquote, uh, like when a director gets fired from a Star Wars film. It's not because Kathleen Kennedy is a tyrant. No, no, no. They just decided the project wasn't for them. Uh, this is, you know, it could be the guy who came up with Warhammer Plus. They could have lost so much money on it, they said, you've got to go. This was a terrible idea. I don't know. It could be that that guy's getting to stay and someone who's got good ideas is going because that often happens in big companies. But they've got to warm up, basically. They've got to, they've got to lube up the board and the shareholders for when they announce that someone important within the company either steps down, changes job roles, something in the next sort of six to 12 months. That's generally the sort of way a company will say it. They'd be like, look, we have to get rid of the senior manager. They're, they're not pulling the line. They're not achieving the goals. Uh, this is not a worrying sign. Please don't drop our share prices anymore. Please, please still pay us money. The leftover uh, creative differences. That's actually the favorite one. That's the one I use for people I used to work with on my indie game. I'm like, oh, creative difference. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good catch-all. And it fires a lot of people for... And it's not reasons. alarming. It's like, oh, you know, we just had creative differences. They're dead in a the ditch somewhere. <laughs> it's... Yeah, it's kind of kind of where they're heading with that, though. You know, and then they go on to say, we consider that COVID-19 is not a specific risk that we can mitigate against, but we are managing our response to it alongside our operational risks. We also do not consider that we have material, solvency, or liquidity risks. So, nothing uh, too exciting there. Yeah, a bit boring. <laughs> yeah. Well, that pretty much takes us to sort of the end of the interesting parts of the document. Because, yeah, that, that last line there, really, it tells the biggest story. They have ongoing concerns. They have a future outlook, stuff like that in there. But most of that stuff just boils down to, we plan to keep making money. 
the important things that we covered off on were, yeah, really those previous ones, like social responsibility, crap, the fact that they're spending so much and have so many staff on their factory floor. Uh, it's, that's just insane to me that they've got like 400 staff. Maybe, maybe the 200 of them are employed just making resin for Forge World or, or possibly cutting up the old dies for Forge World and last chance to buy deals. Crazy. Who knows? It is a ridiculous amount of personnel, but maybe they just have a ridiculous amount of stupidity. We could automate this process, but we kind of like the person who does it, so he's going to continue stuffing a little watting into this tube. We don't know why, we don't know how, and we don't know why we need this, but we all agree that Kevin is a wonderful part of our community. It's because he's a good corporate citizen. Good corporate citizen? <laughs> Look at these buzzwords. You know, They're so good. <laughs> you know one that got passed on to me? What's that? And... Uh, this is this is a story I heard from inside there of one of the meaningless jobs that people have on the factory floor. So take it with a grain of salt. Uh, it was a very reliable source that I got it from. Uh, I won't name names. So yeah, take it with a grain of salt. That they had a person there whose full-time job was just plucking the heads off paintbrushes of Windsor and Newton and putting them onto Games Workshop paintbrush handles. Why not? In fact, that sounds like a profitable endeavor, considering the price of GW paintbrush. Oh, like 50 bucks. <laughs> and they're pretty shitty, too, by the way. At least last time I touched one. They are, I, I believe them, knowing the person it came from, I believe them. But yeah, that's pretty bad. That's really bad. And I mean, all the fun stuff that they used to do in their studio is gone. Like, when was the last time you saw like, a really cool diorama table? The, the like, Horus Heresy one started out with, like, you know, Isvan 3, like that massive city table, and they had the Isvan 5, which is, like, an 8 or 12 foot table by, like, 6 foot with, like, 6 different legions on it. By the time they got to, like, the Blood Angels book for Horus Heresy, it's, like, a 4 by 4 table, not even. And the Thousand Suns one was like eight guys standing next to a pyramid. Like all that, all that anymore. fun. Yeah, all you that fun stuff. You can see that stuff. in the fluff books too. Like back in the day, they used to release the, the Liber Caotica, which is an amazing series, a four massive ass book. They were beautiful. And now the latest fluff book we, we got was uh, the Sabbath World Crusade, which is this one tiny little thing. Like this was a huge event. The the focus of the entire Gon's Ghost series, it gets like half an Imperial Armor book. Really? It's a few uh you know nice words and a few paragraphs. It's like or the gathering <laughs> storm. The gathering goddamn storm of Oh, oh you Jesus. complained about that forever and I barely knew what that was. God damn it. <laughs> Terrible book. It inter introduces Belisarius Sue to us. Um yeah, you you remember like when they used to release an army, they would have like a table that was themed to that army in like old white dwarf and old codexes. They've stopped doing that now. I don't see them release like a a, a new faction or, or a, a rejig, and they've built a table from like scratch just to showcase them and stick at Warhammer World. You don't see that as much anymore. Like, there were some insane tables that you saw them come up with in Games Watch from the Puzzle. There's this there's awesome like Aztec theme one for the Lizard Men, I think they did in France, where it's like a group of Empire soldiers or something arriving at a Lizard Man settlement. And it's this full on Aztec city with like rivers, jungles, pyramids, the you don't see that. The last time I really took notice of a white dwarf um article, it was like September of 2019, I think, so, or August of 2019, and the page was like some like apocalypse style page, and they had just cut pasted the same units over and over again all over the page, but whoever had did it had fucked up in their settings and cut parts of the unit off, so they'd be like, just the legs would be like square cut off at the waist and stuff on some of the models on the table. Or some of the tanks in shot were just missing the back half of the tank. So it was like half a tank just floating in the middle of the table because they hadn't cut and pasted it when they copied the units to make it look like they'd painted a whole table full of miniatures. 
Like, it's just sad. There is no passion at it anymore. It's just a war. It's just a job now. It's just a job. Those 400 people, they don't care. This isn't their hobby. This is their factory job where it's they go to paycheck. pick the brushels off of uh, brushes. See, Arch is right about that. Like with us, with video game studios, and you see this all the time. Like in in the beginning, it's very much a passion project. Blizzard Interactive was very much a passion project. The team was driven by passion and cared deeply about what they what they were making. And now now it's may those people have either left or they're no longer in positions of power. And the people that are just look at uh, the statistics and go like, mm, yeah, you know, sales aren't as high as they need to be. We need to increase those. So we're going to add this mechanic because it's popular and uh, do this thing because that's trending, et cetera, et cetera. It's the meme where the suit stands there going like, add more hats for more profitability. You've Meanwhile, seen... Bobby got exists on the other side of the uh, the room, the secretary on each leg like, yes, mechanics. Eh. No, the secretary's in his lap, and he's petting it like a naked cat, you know? <laughs> Meanwhile, she looks extraordinarily uncomfortable. <laughs> he, he, he's doing that forever. Finishing his sentences with forever, just like they are. We will increase sales forever. <laughs> we will monetize our games forever. Bobby Kotick will be in charge of Activision forever. <laughs> Each time he emphasizes That's... his last word. <laughs> it just gets, like, creepier and creepier every time. So forever. Next week you open the door and he's got, like, veins bulging. He's all pale and pasty. Looks evil. It's like, <laughs> it's like that, that, like, Spruce Goose Mr. Burns when he's, like, running the casino with, like, the tissue boxes on his feet. The jars of urine. Oof. That guy will have to, like, he'll he'll have to die before he leaves that job. He's so committed to just making money, Bobby Kotick. What oh, he's already made world. plenty of money. He is, uh, he's received what we think is at least a $400 million buyout from the Microsoft deal, and probably more, as he is now expected to uh, vacate his position after the uh, purchase goes through. He'll be working at some other place. These people don't so. stop, by the way. These people keep going. Because there's never oh, no. enough money. You gotta remember, Bobby Kotick turned Activision Blizzard from a near-bankruptcy company to something bought by Microsoft for $78 billion. Uh, he will have a new job the day after, if he so chooses. Like Todd Howard in that case. And in the next next place he goes to, they won't have the problem with sexual harassment because they'll just hire a target for him to sexually harass. Like, this is your job now. <laughs> oh, sexual... What a great job. I like the uh, conspiracy theory where the sexual harassment happens, and conveniently, a Microsoft acquisition also happens on that same judge. And meanwhile, Phil Spencer's like, it is not Xbox place to morally judge Activision Blizzard. Everything is going according to plan. <laughs> it's not a bad job being his sexual harassment intern, but it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> and to be fair, I remember they they whinged about uh, there was a there was a professional model who was hired at Activision Blizzard. Like, okay, well, she's she's is she coding on the side or something? But no, they hired a professional model. What else could professional uh, models and actors be hired to do? I wonder. I see some kind of flag over there on the horizon. It's Israeli. Yeah. It's, I was trying to Weird. think of something like actually useful, and I'm like mocap. I'm like you wouldn't need a professional for that. Like you need a professional mocap like actor, but yeah, that's a good point. I can't even think of a devil's advocate thing. <laughs> so many flags. It doesn't sound they, good. They never, they never hire the right person for a job in video games. They're they're way worse than Games Workshop. They like, come on. They don't even hire voice actors. They think that they're talentless, low-skilled, yada yada, and they'd happily throw a voice actor under the bus just to get a single AAA actor who might be terrible at doing oh, God. You know, video game work. I hate that. So you bring that up, but that's something I deeply fucking despise. Anytime a video game, like, for example, ODST, where they use, like, live actors and stuff, and they pay to get their faces in there and all that, and I just think to myself, like, you could have hired a better voice actor who's actually good at this job, and also spent all that money on literally anything else. 
literally anything. More development resources, more music, more more enemies, more missions, more voice lines, anything. <laughs> Keeping Bobby, Bobby Kotick in his office. Yeah, like maybe a padlock for that so he's locked in there. <laughs> so I can't escape. Like, listen, Bobby, in... we, we need you to chill out for a second there. Just a shirtless Bobby Kotick and Harvey Weinstein having a jello wrestle. Good God. That... We hire a person whose only job is to bring Harvey new potted plants every day. <laughs> he prefers ficuses. <laughs> Very specific. <laughs> now remember, once you pot down the potted plant, vacate the premises quickly. Is it like you walk in with it, you can, you're only allowed to stare at the ceiling or something? Or stare at the floor, you're not allowed to like make eye contact? Don't make no eye matter eye what you hear, don't look down. Don't make eye contact with him or the actress currently sitting on the black casting couch. Oh my god. Remember, there was never anyone else in the room with Mr. Bobby as you were, as you visited. But so, I heard squealing. No, no, you didn't. You didn't. <laughs> Mysteriously much like crying, in fact. No, that was your imagination. How about you have a few days of paid vacation to rethink what you saw? <laughs> Here's another Maybe. free month of World of Warcraft subscription while we are at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, they were paying the employees in War and Warcraft gold. Like that's beautiful. Five hundred more gold plus a fifteen percent discount at your next purchase at <laughs> the auction house. The man stands there with <laughs> vacant eyes. Like you can still kind of hear the screams from Harvey's room a little bit in the background, and the executive, one arm around his shoulder, just slips a thirty-day subscription into his pocket. Like there, there. It's all fine now. Check your email when you get home. You'll have a free new mount that you can use in World of Warcraft. <laughs> it's maybe, purple. Maybe. Account bound. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what that like 15 grand uh, average per employee at Games Workshop bonus actually was. It was like 15 grand. And with like a little asterisk, it's like uh, maybe redeemed in Warhammer Plus subscriptions. Or Stormcast Eternal Surplus. <laughs> Um, yeah, they're, they're just sitting there with like Bobby Kotick's playbook just on the fucking bench. Like, all right, take everyone for everything. It's like the Ferengi rules of acquisition. See, I think he liked the Ferengi too much because he's he's copying their business model. <laughs> he just hasn't got the ears for it. He's in, they're not they're not bad. They're up there, but they're not Ferengi. Got to get the ears. That's true. The lobes. As, it, as it's called. The lobes for business. <laughs> uh, see, these are going right over Barch's head, but one day I'll force him to understand what a Ferengi is. One day. No, you won't. He will. Submit. Just just sit him down and just play him like off YouTube, just a super cut of like the rules of acquisition. See, he'd like the Ferengi. <laughs> he would. He would like the rules of acquisition. And he'll be like, this is so dumb if he watches like next gen and watches like the first Ferengi, first season one Ferengi in that. Whip like, this is so bad. <laughs> oh, electric whips. <laughs> Capitalism was... bad. <laughs> Capitalism bad. <laughs> and Capistan. <laughs> uh... And Cap Cap Trap excited. And Cap Cap Trap needs to stop now. Oh, he, now he's mad. Look at him. Coming out with the slurs now. <laughs> Ugh, hideous. We've, pro we've probably just... like yeah. There's definitely like some poor intern who, in between, like you know, having to like take advances from Bobby Kotick, is now sitting here like just scribbling down furiously all notes from this show. That poor poor intern. He's See, that's someone ideas. who should be on minimum wage. He works hard. Bobby's personal butt wiper. Like his job is just to carry around a roll of toilet paper. He does the cleanup. Ugh. It's got to be like some premium over the top thing too. It can't be like regular toilet paper. It has to be like US dollars or something. Alternatively, it's just literally like a lamb, a living lamb. It's so soft. It's so soft on the buttocks. It is. It bears. <laughs> Erotic bang. Ugh. It's like it's so horrible to think about. But you can't stop. 
<laughs> uh, can can I get the like brain erase DLC, please? Remember to clean up Emma Watson after you're done. Like, but J.K. Rowling's the villain. Mm. Mm. Yeah, she's trying to defend women's rights. Get her. <laughs> to be fair, that's a fucking cringe thing to do. Women don't have rights. Like, what? <laughs> what are you? What are you gonna do next? Huh? Argue for my wrenches right now? <laughs> One day you will understand that women are property. Uh, well, unfortunately, not in my reality. Unfortunately, at least you understand the concept. <laughs> right, let's uh, get to the, uh, the little pile of super chats then. Though I see there's one question in chat asking, are the Dark Angels gay? And I feel obliged to respond yes to that, just out of sequence. The, the diversity chapter. <laughs> bunch you of, don't bunch wear of, that uh, many cloaks unless you, uh, you're a little sus. Bunch of dudes hanging out together in a medieval church. Fortress very Monastery, sus. if you will. Very, what's that, very what's that sus. Joke that you're going around with, um, this picture of Epstein meeting with, um, the Pope. And it was like, great, now people are going to associate the church with pedophilia. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> to be fair though, the rate at which uh, priests diddle children pale in comparison to that of the left diddling children, so hmm. just a point of uh But by order how much? There. by quite a lot. I found the stats on this. There was like one percent of priests, and then you look at uh, modern day wokeus on the internet. Oh, how did you see the Brazilian streamer, Kyle? No, I don't know what is this well you deserve to see this oh god don't make me open something up <laughs> you deserve to see this he's Kyle. doing it i see there little typey things happening oh no there you go send it to marco make it <laughs> that's disgusting oh my god look at him life is like a video game it will undoubtedly <laughs> shock you to learn that this uh, left-wing Fortnite streamer was indeed diddling children. Look at how old he is. And he's like, oh, he colors his hair to be all playful, you know, and energetic and young. That's creepy as fuck. And it's Fortnite on top of that. Yeah, if you play Fortnite and you're, like, above 20, you're basically a pedo. I'm convinced that. Harsh. Some Mind you, though, some people are working very, very hard in the background of society trying to make it very acceptable socially. They're the people you got to keep an eye on. You're right. Because they're even worse, because they're trying to justify and cover the shit up. So, Let me see. We took a dark turn, chat. I know. <laughs> Chat's like, what? <laughs> I'll leave this up for chat. Oh, wait, we have a better one. Oh. God, he does look kind of creepy, though. Like, he's staring at me. Stop looking at me. Like, I just want to touch. It's like, no, no touch. <laughs> he was a Twitch streamer as well, so, you know, that's a double foul. I multi-stream, so I'm not technically a Twitch streamer. <laughs> yes, you are. <gasps> Evil Potato says, Finally, Arch has someone from more civilized country on. A breed and widen the fake gamer girl ANCAP anti-vax cat trap. Evil Potato clearly does not know the meaning of the word civilized. Hmm. Oh well. Inquisitor said, said if they had just had a digital archive of White Dwarf, that alone would have been worth the monthly price. <sighs> Complete White Dwarf? Nah, even then I wouldn't say it, but what I thought their vault would be to begin with, which was what they made it sound like it would be, was just a digital archive of everything like all of all of their books all of their novels all of their white dwarfs that's what i thought they were gonna do like that sounded like a great deal instead it's just a handful of source books with all of the fluff ripped out like it's a it's a third of a white dwarf magazine it's retarded Kelly Kriegsman says thanks for the death core of Krieg engineer law video the other day you are very welcome you know, it was literally yesterday. It wasn't even the other day. It was yesterday. 
This is an American thing. I say the other day. No, Kyle, it was yesterday. Quiet, Blondie. You don't have rights. Crazy Loon says, GW doing Nintendo strategy, make less of a highly wanted product to make the demand bigger, was professing you didn't know it would be this popular. Well, it was when Nintendo, they would also stop making things randomly and just be like, nah. Nah. Ah. Oh, the chat wants to not have the picture up on screen. Well, the only solution to that is to harass Kyle. Hold on. If you want me to remove the screen, chat needs to donate for me to remove. It could be any amount. To Arch. Send of that. <laughs> I, I just said in the chat that toxic animals always try and warn you with their bright colors. They do. They do. Good point. Oh, there you are. The outer circle. Yeah. yeah I was looking for a blue wrench. That was my mistake. Arch hasn't wrenched. You don't like outer circle. I see how it is. Good wrench. I think I've wrenched anyone. But then how did I get that wrench? How did Disco get that wrench? Like, shut a up, moment kid. of weakness, I guess? A moment of weakness. Wow. Wow. I mean, you are pretty weak, but still. <laughs> wow. Kyle, wow. entertain chat for a bit whilst I look for that meme I was thinking about. Easy enough. We could make kibby noises. That always makes them really cringe. Uh, so is Maka going to be picking up the new Total War game? Uh, I would like Total Warhammer 3, but I don't know if I'm going to buy it on release or just wait until they actually give me my bloody Chaos Dwarves. Ah, oh, the Dowies are. Yeah, it's kind of strange I... that they didn't launch with it. They gave us Cathay instead. That's mega cringe. I don't like that. Well, you think if you're going to make a, a a map that's conquerable, wouldn't you want to put Chaos Dwarves in since they're right in the middle of it? Next to the Ogre Kingdoms? Very and true. That way you would you would start your map so it finishes where the old world ends. And then just slowly start moving east, because then you can just every you know patch you can add a couple more um, areas in to the east. Instead, what's going to happen is you're going to release the patch, and in where the chaos dwarves are, it's either going to be blank. There's going to be question marks. There's going to be some crappy filler race. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, that's that's the thing I was wondering about it. Like, we only ended up deciding to get the game uh, purely be for the sake of streaming, because it's stream numbers. Like, Arch and I are pretty much of the opinion that it's just boring. Like, I put maybe 100 hours in Total Warhammer 2. It's still uninstalled. I can't, I can't summon the strength to reinstall it. And the only reason why I am is because I'm going to force Disco to learn. That's right, Disco. Because we're going to be streaming that stupid eight-player co-op thing. Because uh, my channel's got a really good stream format for podcasting sort of gameplay. And so it's it's one of those things that I'm hoping it'll generate the clicks and get the subs for it, but uh, it's not something I'm looking forward to. I I really enjoyed playing Total Warhammer 2. Um, the balance is a bit... How's it going, uh, in general, because usually what... The, the most fun part of playing Total Warhammer is the early game. Because by the late game, you usually just start steamrolling and you start building up these real... Um, you're sort of forced to build up these these big Death Star armies. Yep. And they rely on a gimmick. You know, every faction relies on a gimmick. A great one it would be uh, vampires. Basically, the gimmick is just make a horde of skeletons, feed them in a big blob, tie up the enemy with your big blob, and then just go around with some, like, tripped out vampire and a dragon, uh, firing uh, spells off that eat up, like, 600 enemy units at once. It's just such a, you know, blah strategy. Yeah. Meanwhile, like, you know, you have this awesome roster of units, like, you know, Black Knights and Vargeists and all this kind of stuff. And no one ever, nobody uses it. Yep. Because it's just such a suboptimal way to play. That's, that's the most annoying part. And honestly, like, I found myself going back to Medieval Two Kingdoms because of the uh, Botet mod, which is called Beginning of the End Times. It's a Warhammer Fantasy overhaul for the Medieval 2 game. It's a little unstable, but it works relatively well. And they have the Chaos Doors, they have the Excave, and they have it all. And I find myself pre preferring that. If it wasn't for the fact that the, you know, the mod's a little unstable and it crashes, and the camera and the performance of that older game limited to, like, a single core, like, God, it would, I would, I would just play that instead. Forever. I uh, play a lot of, we used to play quite a bit of the 
medieval to like Lord of the Rings mods. Mm, that was great. So I I'm big on RTSs. Uh, so some of the ones I got like Empire at War, Sins of a Solar Empire is sort of oh, this forgotten yeah. one that I absolutely adore. It's not forgotten RTS among us. Mods. Sins of Solar Empire is one of the top in my. It's one of my favorites. There's so many great mods. There's the Star Wars Interregnum one, the Star Trek Armada Three one. Fuck, it's so good. Uh, I I also really like. I got a good uh, Stargate mod. Yeah. So uh, I'm a yeah big Stargate fan among the many sci-fi's that I like to watch. Oh, so you get to play. You're aware of the new Stargate game coming out. Well heard about it i i haven't really been keeping track of it though because i'm like uh it'll probably suck because you might it's been be too right long it's also being developed by slytherin which is a company known for we make mediocre games they... hey <laughs> you know what they're really known for computer whiz max geiger that i don't even know what that is oh okay so there was this series on uh, uh discovery i think it was uh called deadliest warrior Oh, yeah. And Deadliest Warrior had this premise of taking two different uh, warriors from human history, pitting them up against each other, like comparing weapon to weapon type thing to see who would come out on top in a battle. And it was all simulated by computer with Max Geiger, who was just, you know, just some programmer uh, of Slytherin Studios. <laughs> and yeah, it was, it was a pretty entertaining show, but as like, I'm a professional armorer. And I come from the background of building and modifying like weapons. Like I've made swords and axes and armor, uh, and mostly dealt with firearms though. And then watching that show just hurt me on a fundamental level because of some of like the testing mistakes. And thankfully, with the rise of like historical YouTubers, now a lot of the things that happened on it are being debunked. And like that OCD sort of feeling of like I can't stand what they're doing in this show has, has been reined in. Because you're actually seeing YouTubers go out and show, like, hey, this is not how you test chainmail. This is not the type of chainmail you test, and yes. all this kind of thing. So you're a big fan of Shadowversity or uh, Scalagrim, right? Have I assumed? Because they do those style things. Or are you into some I other stuff? I don't mind them. Um, I actually would like to chat to Shad because he's in my neck of the woods, of where I think he's in South Australia, though, next state over from me. But I think my favorite's actually Todd's Workshop. Todd's Workshop. That I've not heard yep. of. So one of the cool tests they did on that was they had the head of the Wallace Society, or the Wallace Collection, that looks after like all the William Wallace Museum. Yeah. Uh, who's a professional jouster. They had him come down, and they had a guy who shoots actual full poundage European longbow. Com uh, so he was shooting full poundage longbow. They had a blacksmith who specializes in making historical replicas to historical dimensions of armor. Then they had a guy who specialized in making historical arrows and arrowheads. And then they got him with uh, to fire, I think at like nearly 200 pound or 180 pound longbow at plate armor to see what it did. Man. So not, not one of those tests where they're like, oh, here's just some like random archer firing a modern bow at a piece of like Chinese uh, stainless steel. No, no, this was like proper armor to the proper dimensions, properly tempered and heat treated. Really, really good set of videos. See, that's always interesting. <laughs> oh, now Barnch is back. Well, to close that note, I've actually been looking to try to get in tact contact with an armorer or somebody who understands like computer weapons just to have a conversation about because. When you when you do writing work or you do you know creation of fiction, generally you're not going to figure out or be an expert on anything. So you generally reach out and talk to people who work in those fields. And because I was making a damage system uh, for the game I'm developing, I'm trying to figure out you know the different armor types because I have like blunt piercing and stuff like that. So interesting. I'll have to put it on my things of things to watch because I'm always trying to expand my knowledge when it comes to medieval combat. I agree, Kyle. You need somebody to fucking slap you over the head and make you stop having everyone wear fucking heavy armor. He needs he needs someone to be his Bobby Kotick. He needs Jesus <laughs> no. is what he needs. <laughs> I don't want to be molested in my own studio. That'd be quite cancer. <laughs> Time to come into work, Kyle. No, I don't want to go. <laughs> the, the, 
the Activision employees had to. What makes you better than them? <laughs> <laughs> I'm me and I'm not them. <laughs> That's what makes me better than them. <laughs> so they make probably a hell of a lot more money. Well, maybe, maybe, considering some of them are fucking quite 80k a shabby. year, Kyle. 80k a year. That's a fair bit of buckaroos. Uh, Dark Dragon donates five Polish uh, money. They have money in Poland. Apparently. Why do we allow the Poles to have money? I don't know. Nobody knows. Oh, there you go. Not even Maka. Uh, without a message, however. Uh, Viking Kiwi says, I think people are also realizing that the miniature prices are a bullshit high. Much thanks to the internet and so are much less willing to buy them. Except for those people who are not only willing to buy them, but then fervently defend their overpriced purchase to anyone who disagrees because, well... Money's out of the account now. Mark Shane says, Yanovich figured out how GW came up with a misleading figure of 6 million views for the OnePlus YouTube videos. They used the click-through number instead of views. Oh my god. <laughs> People click through them. That's still a lot of clicks. Yeah, clicks through. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> I don't even know if that would account for their supposed 28 million views on that one video, honestly. Maybe they added it and they added all the different viewing types of clicks together. I, I genuinely think they <laughs> did that, yes. They added everything in and they did count things like they sent this out as a newsletter. People scrolled past it, didn't click on it. Well, that's a view. Technically, somebody glanced at it. That's a view. Somebody glanced at it. That's a view. Oh, it's Black Knight in 17. Asleep. When people fall asleep with their uh, phone in their hand watching YouTube, and it just plays it while they're asleep. That's true. That happens that's too. That's a That should happen more often because that's genuine revenue right there. Arch like, have it on my channel, please. <laughs> Black Diamond Seventeen says, "Quick and hail Arch Christ, our Lord and Savior." Also, hi Maka. Arch, I love the video on the Krieg engineers. Any plans to do one on the Tani Thurston and only? Mm, no. No. You know why? Because I was going to make a full-scale, large uh, lore video series on the Sabbath Crusade, and then they released that pathetic excuse for a fucking source book, and also started attacking everyone who made a Warhammer content. So now I think the Tiny First and Only are bad, and Dan Abnett is also bad. Yes, he can be ashamed of himself now. Hey, funny, funny you say that, because I've released a video said, what book would I release if I was doing an Imperial Armor? And I said, you should do one about the Octurus campaign with the Tyranids versus the Orcs. I said, Look, it's not involving the Imperium. It gives you time to work with these two factions. You bring out new kits for both of them. Win, win, win across the board. And then like six months later, Games Workshop's like, by the way, we're doing the Octurus Crusade. And nothing screams orcs and nids more than a Death Corps Krieg release. Of course. They deserve it more, though. Screw the orcs. Mark James says, So a question on the new Halo Infinite. Did 343i uh, give the franchise a return to form or more hashtag modern gaming? Kyle, what as was the this? rest of the what Halo the expert, question? I was partially paying yeah, attention yeah. on that when I heard three four three, and I was starting to get my blood boily. Kyle, <laughs> you're pay docked. Maybe Maka knows about Halo as well. Let's see, Let's see I am a big fan of Halo, but I stopped playing before three four three took over. We're a wise man, and I wish I was you. <laughs> it's good. It's good to live this way. Not Halo 3 was the last one that ever happened in my book. Call me an old timer. No, fetus. What's the question? Oh, so a question. The new Halo Infinite. Did 343 gave the franchise a return to form or more modern gaming? Honestly, it depends on what you ask. The, the, the multiplayer aspect is fun, but it's very much an early access game. It's missing a lot of core game modes. It's missing a lot of core features. The campaign's 60 friggin' dollars. You can try the multiplayer free, by the way. It is free to play. The campaign's $60. It's overpriced high hell. There's evidence to suggest that they're going to do campaign packs, which is really... Ugh. But uh, the story, if you didn't like 4 and 5, and you're kind of like me in the same shoes I am, you're going to hate Halo Infinite. Uh, because it's got 
more lore. I'm not going to spoil anything, but I, I really don't like what they did with the lore or anything in that regards. I absolutely loathed it. I found the gameplay and the gameplay loop to be fun, though. Hmm. This isn't what you told oh, me, Kyle. You one wished and whined about the sponginess of it. Yes, the bosses. The bosses can go straight to hell. I almost forgot about them. Oh, seriously. I, I've never shot a brute chieftain dude in the head as many times with rocket launchers, sniper rifles, and other guns th th uh, before. That skull is quite thick. You, you know why, though? You know why they do that in video games? It's the same reason they used to have really hard difficulty back in, like, the 80s and 90s in video games. Adding. In order to make up for your lack of content, <laughs> yep. you got to drag that shit out. Yep. Because, you know, in the cartridge days, they could only fit so much data on those cartridges, even the early discs. So they needed to be difficult. That way, the gameplay time it took to beat those three levels, each level took maybe like four hours. So you had like a, you know, 12 hour game all of a sudden, which was acceptable. Of course, those games also had something modern, modern games don't replayability. Right in the testies, that one. Mm, hurts, doesn't it? It does. I imagine for them. <laughs> hey. Hey, oh. Maverick Zero says, Good to see Maka on the Archcast. A friend of mine is a fan of the Out Circle and said that IG is getting no love in 9th edition. Can you please say, Ro, you are a silly baguette to cheer them up? Uh, Ro, you are a silly baguette. I guess I just insulted all of France. That's fine. Go. We have a tradition of uh, people saying stupid things on this channel. We're being paid for this, so we can't complain. God. But the only rule is that whenever White King Kiwi sends in anything like that, only Kyle can read it. What? What did he do? Send it. <laughs> Fine. He Don't just fucking it. wheezes at me. Like... BBTDLTD says, I want to hear about reality. Just watch Makovitz. That's true. We had uh, Sargon pop his uh, little head in here, his littering little head in here earlier, and said that uh, Maka true. was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. He's and then he went back fan. to uh, littering Ark and pay a place taming pens everywhere. He is well, a I think, I think he is phenomenal, and I followed his work for probably eight years or more. Oh, fangirl. Oh. Yep. Eight years. Oh, he just he just says yep, okay. I was expecting some kind of retort. Okay, well, at least you have a uh, good taste in that regard. Sargon is a good lad, even though he does litter in Ark and does deserve to be criticized. Speaking been... of, I built a new battleship, Kyle. We should visit Kyle's uh, Sargon's coastline at some point. You get me and him mixed up remarkably quickly, and this has to do with the fact of your obsessiveness of calling me Carl when we first met. Carl. And it's like, is that you? my name's not Carl. <laughs> Your name is Carl. Uh, when it needs to be. Like when he called me farm boy for a while. That was all why. Owned. John McKellar says, Dick Smith for Supreme Leader. I don't mind the name Dick Smith, but Dick Meister would be better. Dick Smith is actually a popular, um, he's like a famous person here in Australia. So he is all about like Australian made and owned manufacturing and sets up like Dick Smith Electronics and he had like his own uh, food company, which is all like Australian sourced products. Uh, unfortunately, his companies don't do too well. So, but he's, he's really famous and popular and yeah, as being all about Australian manufacturing and Dick Smith, he's a real person here. Okay. Dick Smith is pro prison labor. Cool, but necessary. Uh, Boag says, at least the Italians had Tifa in their Senate. That's true. I did see that. It was good. And I am sure that was not the first time something like that happened. This is what happens when you have lots and lots and lots of online meetings. Uh, Mark Shane says, their whoa oh oh music for their trailers is awful. Yes. Yes, it is. And they put it in everything now. Oh, that's right. You yelled at Sargon's mom. That is correct, yes. And then he felt The thing is, she has an excuse. It. 
She is literally an old woman. She is allowed to use taming pens. But when if I see another three call me down taming pen, a lot of structures are going to disappear in the next server update. In the previous stream, you should have seen it. We went into the, uh, what was it, yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. Went into a cave to do dungeon stuff. And Arch, we're, we're having a good time. You know, it's going horribly, but we're having a good time. And Arch sees some pre-built structures. And you can hear him, uh, like, slowly beginning to lose it. Like, he's like, eh. Like, he wants to delete it. The temptation is there. I'd be careful. Don't do anything Arch doesn't want in Arch, or you're going to be sad. <laughs> Goddamn taming pens. Revan Nor says, you and Kibbs get hit by Truck Kun. You will isekai into 40k pre-gathering storm. You will be chosen as aspirants by Astartes chapters, but you get to choose chapter. Which chapter and why? Whichever one will let me die the quickest. I'm not dealing with that shit, no. You probably want a chapter like the Raven Guard. You know, yeah, something but... rational. The Raven Guards are also pretty gay. That whole uh, sneaking uh, in the shadows emotion. That was a rumor started by someone who wasn't invited to one of their man sex orgies. Pretty disgusting. If it had to be any chapter, I'd probably pick. Uh, mm, let's just go with Ultramarines. Let's be nice oh. and really boring, right? We'll just sit in Ultramar and we'll just chill. Nothing will ever happen. It's fine. And then Girly Man will come back and then shit will happen. And I'm like, oh, God damn it. What do you think you are, Games Workshop, shoehorning Ultramarines even into this? Yep. Finds a way. <laughs> Just like GW. <laughs> Mark Shame says, If modding tools were released for Dawn of War 2 and The Last Stand, do you think they could have had their own version of Dota be created from it? Eh, probably not. I, like... There is some Ooh, modability for that. those games, but they never had that kind of scale. And you gotta remember too, the reason why so many cool um, things were created for uh, Warcraft 3 was because this had never been done before almost. Like everyone could be doing modding. It was so cool. And everyone loved the game and it had so much possibilities. I and mean, everyone's freaking out and making all kinds of cool shit. It's very much so a phenomenon of the early days, I think. Well, it's... Whereas now, modding has grown in a bit of a different direction. Modding has become more... That's back when Blizzard was very positive and pro-modding. And it, top it off, like our said, it's Warcraft 3. Like, you gotta remember, even if you weren't around for Warcraft 3, Warcraft 3 is one of those big-name RTSs that everybody knows. Everybody in school I knew had played it. Or had heard about it, at least. It's the big name. It was a big boy. You want me to put this up on stream, don't you? Tempted. Don't worry. We'll do, we'll do it. We'll get Arch demonetized. Sorry, Arch. Not really. No, I'm kidding. It's not sorry, entirely sorry. incorrect, plus it's mainly America. Well, you see, uh, the your, your, real risk, your real risk is not um, not being demonetized. No, no, no. It's uh, it's your social responsibility. Oh, that's your social real credit score. Social credit score goes up, social credit score goes down. There's Laurie Lightfoot, the mayor of some backwater American hellhole. Don't know the rest, but they all look terrible. And, oh yes, the Grizzly Dones have a very uh, generous $50 to say, I advise people to use alternative wargaming systems. I love Kings of War, Battletech, but there are others as well. Walking Dead, Elder Scrolls, and Fallout, Gaslands, which uses Hot Wheels as miniatures in Mad Max Gangs, Frostgrave, get out there. There are a lot of alternatives. The thing is, nothing is as large. And these are very different... See, I, I kind of empathize and understand the Warhammer fans in this case, because when you buy Space Marines, it's kind of like when I quit uh, Warhammer really early into me get, trying to get into it, uh, like, there isn't anything quite like it. It's very unique in its, its own right, and it has some a special place for a lot of people. But yes, he's right, though. You should look into other stuff. Just broaden your horizons a little bit. Yeah. I hear Fatal is great. I think that's dead, but uh, that's beside the point. 
Doesn't matter if it's dead, Kyle. That's Still, true. Uh, People a thing. should have the right to acquire it. I, I agree. I just don't want to acquire it. <laughs> One day. One day we will have a campaign. Oh. Over anal circumference. Oh. <laughs> Space Wolf Blackman says it just got here. See you in the future, gentlemen. Oh. I am the in the future. future. It's, it's, it's bleak and horrible. That's quick. It is. That's quick. And That's getting quick. worse by the second. That is really the most disconcerting part of it all. Uh, Lord of the Opossums, Arch acts like he's better than everyone just because he is beautiful. This is also true. Lord of Opossum said that. I know that. I didn't catch the first part, but I know that's him. Only he would say that. He's drunk You're again. just jelly, Kyle. He's drunk again, I can tell. Your jealousy is an ugly thing. You're just mad and angry. I'm right. <laughs> Opercoy says, Hey Arch, you should check out Corvus Belli's Infinity. Real neat cyberpunk-style sci-fi universe with a very fun Kill Team-style skirmish game. Maybe. Uh, Black Knight is MP. To my knowledge, the Space Marine SJW writer also hasn't been attacking, antagonizing the potential playbase, yet they must be holding far more than just money over her to accomplish that. Yeah, to be fair, I mean, she hasn't done anything yet, so good. Could be a legitimately nice person. We don't know. True. Doubt it, but true. <laughs> no, that's right. I'm not, I'm not saying uh, <laughs> it's a likely scenario, but, you know, look. Uh, what is it? We want to act in good faith, give people every chance, benefit uh, of the doubt. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's a good. It's Before a good they mindset. Disappoint us. It puts you on the high horse when you do that. You're like, well, I gave them a chance. <laughs> now to end this person's career. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're not kidding. But for the sake of YouTube, we are in Minecraft, right? Straight out of the left well, wing playbook. Never say anything so fucking cringe ever again. I swear we to God. We want their career to end in Minecraft. <laughs> Simon Hunt says, My favorite signed product is the face mask with the Nurgle logo on their website. Just because irony. I would have taken a plague of Nurgle at this point. Hell, it might be a plague of Nurgle. Primarily attacks the psyche and makes everyone stupid. Cyber Anime Alien says, Unknowingly, I was subscribed to an Adobe plan. Ugh. I haven't been using any Adobe apps, and not only have they practically stolen hundreds of New Zealand dollars, they want me to pay $15 early cancellation fee. I'm upset. Well, I'm upset that you somehow got into an Adobe subscription service. Like, that's a crime. I'm going to reiterate what I told him, because I responded to him as soon as I saw that donation, because I, too, used Adobe. And I really enjoyed After Effects, and I hate their charging thing. Like, you should, you should, I know you don't want to, and you said you don't want to, but you should definitely t call your bank and, you know, tell them to, like, not allow Adobe to charge. Second thing is, you should, like, be irate and go, go after Adobe and start, like, messaging them and whatnot, and try to get, get a hold of somebody and get your money back. Well, that's the thing. Um, if you actually want to get your money back, there's a very easy way to do that. Tell your bank to do a chargeback. Say that you did not uh, agree to this. Yeah, you didn't authorize these payments. Because, yes. in all actuality, you didn't. Adobe is really scummy, and they will take advantage of you, and you shouldn't allow them to do that. Pick and your yourself. bank can do chargebacks. They can literally just take the money back. Get that your is money within back. their power. Don't let them run off with your money, my man. You can get it back. What are they going to do? Bitch at you? <laughs> yeah. It's, do, do you care if they bitch at you? <laughs> I don't think you do. <laughs> Adobe's angry with me. Yes. Good. I've succeeded in doing something useful. You've climbed the social ladder, if that's the case. <laughs> Mark Shame says, Halo did a cyberpunk theme event. It's so fitting. Is it, Kyle? Halo and Cyberpunk. Yes. I've never really envisioned Halo Universe to be particularly cyberpunky. What about you, Maka? Because you played it. Uh, no, I don't think it's cyberpunk at all. It's just sci-fi. Yeah, it's futurism. It doesn't I don't feel like it clicks well. 
it's actually got some more hardcore sci-fi elements to it really because they try and actually explain the technology and try and actually use science fiction jargon like they've thought it through yeah, like their ships with uh, the mac cannons that was interesting yeah and they explain why like humans use armor and how thick it has to be in you know in order to have any chance of stopping weapons and how their uh faster than light travel works they they explain all of that away that's more like traditional hard sci-fi cyberpunk is like your blade runner type universes where it's like humans and technology and the story revolves around humans incorporating like technology into their lives versus in halo that's not the core story it might be a subplot like cortana and that but yeah definitely more humanity exploration and the struggle of survival yeah, it's a war story like a star wars yeah arch would like halo. you'd like halo arch you'd like the halo. initial halo yes you would one two and three you'd probably like He'd like the lore because it's Tizmi enough, and the originals especially. It's pretty grim dark as well, especially once you start getting into all the flood stuff. Oh yeah, infinite lying noises. Yeah, those fl flood. It, the one where they describe what happens to you when you get taken over by the flood is quite, quite unsettling, if I remember right. Mm. Speaking of unsettling, you should play Amnesia again. Again. Arch, you didn't know me back when I did try playing Amnesia. <laughs> That's the details. I know That's you like don't want That's like 2014. Oh. Like, we met in like 2016. You should play Amnesia. No. Actually, no, I did agree once I break 10,000 subs, because by then people have forgotten, and I'll be home free. Okay. I'll years. remember, though. But I'll turn it into Five Nights at Freddy's, because that'll be funnier. Oh my god, if that franchise is still going in four years, it'll be... No, it's probably... It's been going for like a decade now, hasn't it? Yes, I think it's fine. Aren't they making a movie for that? Or do they come out already? I, I don't know. Expert. I think it's... I know like they made the, the latest game, which is the one Kyle's going to be forced to play. And mm -hmm. I'm sure I can find like a furry pornography model for that, because I took one look at the new character's model, and I was like, yes, I will not be entering this word into any search engines ever you know it'll happen cyber army alien says anon you're still part of the adobe community salt on an already salted wound maca and kibbs do you prefer christmas or halloween tau are legalists well maca you don't <laughs> well because halloween is so huge in australia yeah. That country on the other side of the world. I imagine, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it, so, for the fact that I have to associate with less family, I'll take Halloween. Really? That piece of shit holiday has infiltrated my once pure country. I don't the, like it. Christmas is great for me, because personally I get to visit old family members, and I get a lot of free food, and I don't have to buy food for, like, a week. It's nice. For me, it's the it's the travel, like, I'm a oh, hundred plus Ks from the closest family member. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. I routinely drive, like, four hours to visit family, which I like driving, and distance driving in Australia is just considered normal, but once you've driven to, like, you know, see my dad's side, then we go and see, like, my wife's family, and then we go to, like, see her dad's uh, mother and all that, who lives in, like, another country town, it's, like, 800, 900 Ks of driving in a day or two. It's a lot. Yeah, I can understand your reluctance there. That's a lot of that's a lot of money, and you guys call it petrol over there, huh? That must be expensive. I I thankfully have diesel car, so it's not too bad. Okay. Yeah, savage Kyle, fucking petrol, oh, gasoline. They God call damn. it petrol over there. I'm pretty sure. Oh my yeah, God. I think get they me. call it diesel, like any normal God, civilized human being. petrol big. powered could be. Oh, that might be British. I get them both mixed up. It, well, it's not easy to using diesel at this point is a very bad person. It's yeah, it's hard for Americans to remember all those countries who joined both world wars before them. Hold on, listen. I play enough paradox games. I figured out where everyone is, especially the Balkans, the Baltics, Asia, Southeast Asia. I know where you are. <laughs> Accents are tricky for a kid. Yeah, it sounds like Games Workshop and their Asia store policies. I have a better understanding of geography than Games Workshop. 
look, we have a we have a map. They're all in Asia. We put in stores, question mark, then profit. Asia, lots of people equal money. I'm surprised we don't. They haven't applied that logic to the Middle East. I don't get it. Why aren't they buying uh, our sort of Catholic style models? <laughs> don't worry about it. Loaded Possum says, "Has the guest saw sworn loyalty to Arch yet?" Yes, indirectly. <laughs> yes, he swore the blood oath. Uh, he also gives two further super sense to say, I'm from Indiana, you can stay with me next time. And to guest, who's your favorite VTuber? Mine is Kyle. Is that Lord of Opossums? Yes. So, Maka, who is your favorite VTuber? Well, what, what do you mean in this uh, context? Kyle, you'll have to explain what a VTuber is. Oh, I, I envy him. A VTuber is somebody who uses motion capture software and uses that as like an anime. It's more commonly seen as like the anime girl trend that we've seen on YouTube where they play games and they're like, hee 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 hee. They're basically e-girls, but, you know, anime. Uh, I'm going to have to give you a big negatory on that one. What? Oh, my God. Your Discord server must be filled with boomers. <laughs> no, it's not. It's... it's... It's full of people who like anime and weird, like, hentai-looking stuff, but it's not my way, I'm afraid. I'm a bit of a boomer in that regard. I'm a lot of a boomer in that regard, actually. So your following is based and basically a good place to look into, right? Bas basically, I'm a false prophet. Maka. Maka Baka. It, see, the thing is, Maka. Is it based off of Maka from Dawn of War, or what's the name? Because I'm curious now. No, it's it's uh, Maka, because my last name is Mackenzie, and in Australia, that's how we do our nicknames. Damn it. So, you know, was... Jonathan, your last name's Jonathan, you'd probably be a Jono. Um, if your last name, or your name's Darren, you'd be Dazza, and then, of course, if your name is Taylor, you'd be Squizzy. Squizzy. <laughs> <laughs> Squizzy. Yes, that makes total sense. Oh my god, maybe that's why that person in my server calls himself Squizzy. It all makes sense now. Because <laughs> he's from Shreya. Yeah, right? yeah some with red hair is called Bluey. Bluey. There's a reason why they put you there, wasn't there? Generations ago. <laughs> Many reasons, actually. <laughs> Mark James says, you will buy your female space, sa female safe space marines with social credit, and they shall be stunning and brave. I look forward to this female space marines myself, frankly. Uh, Lord of the Possum says, I would buy a female space marine, but she would have to be a tomboy, a mummy, a non-lesbian, and a redhead. Not a long list of demands, but good that you've thought this through. Uh, Borg says, would you really be mad if the Primarchs were female and the Emperor was a big, dominant mummy? Come on, you've seen the fan art, and you know you want it. For once, I can say quite confidently that I have not seen the fan art and know that I do not want it. I have, but only because Boog shared it. <laughs> That's well, a Lord of the Opossum says uh, at uh, Borg, that is the dream, so you can share it there as well. He also says, women are so strong that if you call them bossy, they might start crying. We can test this right now. Disco. Kyle, you're bossy. Not fair. That's not right. Disco's right there. Yes, but she's not here to defend herself. Oh, yeah. Good one, Disco. He should... Yeah, don't call Arch Arch anymore. His name is Barch. He's been demoted. He lost that Arch privilege a long time ago. You haven't been informed of this, but now you know. Viking Kivy says, My older sister is a huge fan of Lord of the Rings, so the need for female characters for women to enjoy something is false. Well, Viking Kivy, I'm sorry to say this, but your sister is a uh, deviant and a mutant, as it turns out. Must be hard news to receive in such an informal way, and yet... We have been informed by lead social scientists that this is the case. Tragic. Truly. Marsh Shamed says, Bobby Kotick must know the second video game crash is coming and got out while he still can. 
Well, he can build himself a private island now. Mm, private island. Uh, Bollock says, if GW treated its fandom like Scott Cawthon treats its fandom, do you think the Warhammer fandom would betray GW like the FNAF fandom betrayed Scott? The difference is in the political leaning of the fandoms. The FNAF fandom was there because it was something they thought they could subvert. And Scott Cawthon, very much so, he played into that because he figured like, oh, this is kawaii. You think my animatronics are trans? It's weird, but... Sure. And so it went kind of crazy. GW isn't there yet. Uh, Skullgar Thane says, Zoom in instead. Probably in reference to the uh, horrible Brazilian streamer. Actually, that's what you should have done, Carl. Every second that goes without a donation, you zoom in a little bit closer on his teeth. Just thinking back to that Bobby Kotick buying an island thing. I think Epstein's island's for sale. There you go. It's got a pre-built temple and everything. And something tells me he would fit right in. Oh, we might have to widen the entrance a pinch, but... Nevertheless. Zyber Anime Alien simply says remove. He also says, could they have added them because they already had the Three Kingdom map and units? Maybe. I mean, hell, half of Cathay's roster are literally just Chinese people. If I see, like, Cow Cow and that popping up, then I'll start to really raise some questions. <laughs> you mean Cow Cow? It's Cow Cow. No, you got it right. You got it right. I mean Cow Cow. No, no, because it's Games Workshop. They will take an existing name and they'll just slightly change it up. Cow Cow, though. It'll be cow -cow. To be fair, he was the best character in Three Kingdoms. You should... Uh, actually, you shouldn't. It's kind of awful. The Three Kingdom TV series, the Chinese one... It's like 35% good, and all of the good is Tao Tsao, and the rest is just awful, and it's terrible, and it's sad, and no. I watched all of that, because I was kind of excited for Three Kingdoms, so like, I'll be prepared now. I shouldn't have. I really shouldn't have. No, you watch, it'll be like, Countdown, it'll be C-A-U instead of, like, C-A-O, oh. and that'll be how their, like, original character do not steal. Just like all their, uh, you know, like Sai Marbo and all those other um, characters that they've come up with over the years for like 40k and Warhammer Fantasy, like Mad Donna. The literal Lord of the Rings party. That one was good. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what didn't they steal from the Lord of the Rings? The company that loves to like sue everyone for <laughs> getting close to their IP. Meanwhile, they're like dwarves, elves, orcs, goblins, dragons. We go. Even for with days. 40k, they were like, mm, the Navigator Guilds are pretty cool when they're reading the Dune book. I'll be based. Well, with the God Emperor. They just took part, they didn't take the worm part. They just took the bits they liked. Yeah. They were to a little be fair, the worm part was pretty cringe. I don't like the art for it. I like the lore surrounding it, but the art where he's just like sitting there like, mm, I'm a worm now, with his little face. I like, have become a vast penis. It's oh. like Leto, is it Leto 2, the worm? Lego the leader. second, yeah. <laughs> God Emperor. It just looks like a human head, like sticking out of like one of those like peanut butter jelly time um, suits. That's disgusting. I disavowed the Dune I franchise mean, he's right. in its entirety. No, you don't. You lying rapscallion. I do. It is no horrible. Did you, did and you say probably homophobic. Film? Yeah, we saw I did see the new film, and it was all right, but I am not passing judgment until I see the second part. If the second one's good, it'll make or break. Like, the second one's going to make or break it once they wrap it up, the uh, arc for Paul Atreides. It sucks, though, when you hit, like, that really big high on the first episode. Of, like, Avengers Infinity War was way, way better than how they finished the Avengers. Mm -hmm. I can't comment. Didn't watch. You're a horrible human being. You need to watch That's the Avenger movies. I don't want to give Disney money, though. I don't care. Pirate them. We never said anything about buying the movies, did we? I can't yeah. pirate them because of my job. You can. It would be extremely weird and hypocritical of me to do that. <laughs> Kyle. There's plenty of ways you can see it for free without see, doing anything illegal. I have yet to be converted. I've thought about my, my evil line when I finally do. I'll be like, 
You know, Disney should have paid me. If they if they paid me to cover their protect uh, their copyright, we wouldn't have this problem, Disney. <laughs> That's cringeworthy. Man, you should be ashamed of yourself. I go full ANCAP at that point. Optimus Jedi says, Kibbs, when are you doing the Frozen Watch together? Can't wait to hear Artsburg out about the Indig Norwegians in Frozen 2, plus the song. I actually saw the first Frozen. I don't remember. Oh, crap. It was that girl I was dating at the time. That's why I was like, why the hell did I watch that? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. She's in the theater with you, you're acting like Bobby Kotick, and she's just singing Let It Go. Let it go. <laughs> I'm not Bobby. That's me. <laughs> right in the okay, feet. <laughs> so Kyle watched Frozen. That yes. that was all I took out of that. It was not pleasant. Now, anyone that still thinks that Kyle isn't gay, there is your definitive proof. Literally did it for pussy though. Literally. That's Literally not an just it's said... frozen. It's it's frozen. I think the worst thing Nothing that my wife has got me to watch was Hubie's Halloween. We did not know what it was going into it. And she's like, well, we didn't mind the water boy. Let's watch this. Mistakes were made. <laughs> I wish I had context for how bad this was. <laughs> how bad was Go it? Go watch it. No. <laughs> oh, really, really bad. Like, it's not even that it's bad Adam Sadler. It's just bad. Oh, like, it's he's one of those. nigh incomprehensible the way he talks in it. It's like Bobby Boucher dialed up to 100. It's so bad. Okay. Well, I understand that you were miserable. I have a con. That's, a little that's bit of the context. takeaway. <laughs> yes. Frozen just looks like bad MMD pornography to me from the pictures I'm seeing on Google. It is. It is. It's one of those things that just for whatever reason was sort of lightning in a bottle in terms of popularity and it exploded and it was everywhere. But then the follow up sequel, like there was no staying power there. Much like how I feel like the Avatar franchise, the Avatar franchise that they're trying to make is going to be like it's going to be it was lightning in the bottle for what it was at the time but the magic ain't there anymore optimus jedi also says oh and frozen 2 has a black norwegian no lie uh, to be fair we have many black norwegians now it's a thing uh Jaylon, roll it. you're wrong kids halo reach was the la best last best one but infinite is better than four and five hmm. there you go you've been told Shadon5582, five, five, Arch, join the Lamenters to die the fastest. Yeah, but then you'll have to suffer whilst doing it. Plus, they're a little bit whingy. Uh, Batad, Kibbs. That looks like kids to me. Like, Kibbs is best VTuber. Knight36, Arch would be a knight pilot. Valiant, because plasma fire is fun, and he'll have a giant harpoon. I could see myself enjoying that. Uh, Gaius Natius Caesar. I got into Star Wars Legion and went ham buying both Separatist and Republic forces to so just love painting my clones. Star Wars, though. I kind, kind of. I've looked at the boxes. I've unironically looked at the boxes for Star Wars Legion and I was like, I really like. I've always liked the Separatists a lot. I love the droid armies. And like, I kind of want them, but I, I live in the middle of nowhere. I'm not buying them, because they will just sit in the box and collect dust. No one to play it's it with. One of those, it's one of those really weird names, too, like Legion. It's the exact opposite, though. It's like the most skirmishy game, because it's really small scale. Yeah, it's like, like even the big games squads. that you see. Is, yeah, even the big games is like, you know, 20, 20 models on the table. 20 models. If you're lucky, it's like 40. <laughs> like, when you double it. Yeah, it's a small I kind of would like that. It's a cool little idea. I don't my Star Wars, but it's Disney. You know, it's Disney. It's Disney. Ugh. Wait, Barch, you can't see. Barch keeps. Well, Barch is a fan I girl. Can. Remember, I can. He never likes anything, and it always drives me out the wall. I'm like, Arch, you like this thing? No, if it is it Warhammer, I don't want it. Because <laughs> you keep telling me to play stupid things, Kyle. Gay things. Your Defense Force was not gay. It was pretty gay. It was based and very special. <laughs> it was pretty gay, like the roly-poly bugs. It was pretty gay. You were happy about the roly-poly bugs. You thought they were cute. I could be happy about gay things as well. And he's admitted it. Oh, he's... gay does mean happy. True. 
A Viking Kiwi says, well, you see, Kyle, now that you say that, now we will remember you promised amnesia. It's true. Amnesia or Final Fantasy Freddy's. With poor mods. Mock Shamed Kibbs, choose your fate. Infected by flood, assimilated by Borg, or eaten by Tyranids? Well, assimilated by Borg. The biggest. Or, see, the thing is, if I'm assimilated by Borg, maybe the Federation will save me. Maybe. The Tyranids no, because... will just bore me. <laughs> no, you're screwed because it's new Star Trek. You're just going to get blasted out some fucking airlock. Wait, what? Because, like, Picard and that, the new Star Trek. Like, no, no, no. Like, lofty ideals and goals for humanity. Screw that. It's all about war. What the hell? Isn't that what they say? See? It's all about war. It's all about war. <laughs> They've become... The... I hate J.J. Abrams. He made those Star Trek Star Trek movies, and I watched them, and I was going like, what is this? Is is this, like, a weird attempt to make Star Wars, but with a Star Trek paint job? What is yes. this? And I, it was hey. not good. No, do not open your mouth about this. This Earth. is the problem. I don't want Tom. your opinion here. You don't understand. <laughs> STD and the latest Star Trek movies are much better, because it realized that Star Trek was just a stupid action franchise uh... to begin with. See, we have Maca, Maca, you have no idea. I have to deal with this regularly. It's like, hey, Arch, you want to try this new thing? Like, it's not Warhammer. I don't want it. Like, he's just, he's got the old man problem where he's like, if, 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 if it isn't this one thing, this very hyper specific thing, it's not worth it. He, he, hey, I like Star Trek uh, Discovery, okay? It was excellent. You had a strong uh, female black main character who, was, who didn't need no man. No, see, we have Deep Space Nine. There we have a strong black character, Cisco, based. Cisco. Yeah, but is is it a woman? He commits war crimes and no, he just says, I'll he's have a to man. Work. Okay, Kyle. Well, there you go. You're out. We none of oh, that patriarchal God. bullshit here. No. Voyager had Janeway. Voyager was very um, war crime. Yeah, Janeway seven <laughs> seven and nine. Janeway is an interesting and, captain. She's yeah, got, Janeway committed a few war crimes. She's more like, than Cisco. One episode, she's like, we can't do that. And the next episode, she's like, there's coffee in that nebula. It's like, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. How many red shirts are going to have to die for Janeway's coffee this week? It's mm -hmm. like that. Uh, she's always like quoting the Prime Directive. And then like they have that two fix episode when she like marches him to his death. I forgot about that. So, like, <laughs> Arch in the show, they're like, we can't hurt anybody because, like, we're, we're not going to kill new life forms. An accident happens, which merges two of the crew members together to create a new life form. And she's like, you can't have your individuality. I'm going to have to kill you so I can get my other two crew members back. And then, he's, like, being dragged away, screaming, like, I want to live. I want to live. <laughs> like, I want to live. Throw him in the transporter. And, it's like, and then he kill him. And it was like, oh, my God. Like, it's pretty fucked up, actually. Like, Star Trek's not a kid show. Very yeah, that's much. what I mean. STD is where Star Trek was always supposed to be. No, no, because you do it smart like Deep Space Nine did. Oh, yeah. Art. It's overblown. Strong women, female character. Deep, Deep Space Nine was great with the fucking Kardashians. I like that. The Kardashians? Stop speaking about the Kardashians, Kyle. It, it, was, it was all about moral ambiguity. and You get, like, um... What was it? The, the Romulan episode? It's a fake! <laughs> oh, it's such a good show. SDD is a good show. Yes. Oh. Even, Even Enterprise had some good episodes. It did. The first two seasons are rough, but after that it got better. Yeah. I love that. Uh, is it In a Mirror Darkly, that two-parter with, um, where, like, they steal a, the Defiant, that Constitution ship in Enterprise, and they're, like, running around with, like, Kirk's ship, basically, in, in Enterprise era. Oh, yeah. Remember that, and they like superimpose them over it, right? Yeah, give it, give it a rewatch. It's really good. That was fun. Holds up well. Season four, that was their best season. I think everybody says that, but that's for good reason. STD. Now, Beskar Armor says, "Arch, I know you're rich, according to Kibbs, but here's a little more to add to your pile to encourage your jealous entourage to win at life like you." Why, thank you. I do want Kyle to work harder. You should donate more to Arch Beskar right now. If you want me to win harder, you can also donate to Arch more. Your pay has been docked, remember, because you did something stupid earlier today, which I've forgotten. Which I've forgotten. This is very arbitrary. 
He's like, it may be arbitrary, <laughs> but it is reasonable. Well, chat, you better increase the donos to make up for you, little shits. <laughs> Cyber anime oh. alien says, when will CA add Nippon to Total War Warhammer? Hmm. They should have added them already, because Nippon would be superior to China. Yeah, they could that add depends. Them. It depends if you, if you add Nippon, then you're adding the Japanese, which then the Chinese market's not going to want to play a game because you oh. added the Japanese into it. Actually, I hope Even Creative Assembly better. does that. I hope Creative Assembly does that. Then. Actually, oh. Kyle, when we're going to do that one co-op game, I'm going to play the Chinese instead, and I'm going to rename them to Taiwan. It's, it's, probably why, um, it's probably why they didn't like Three Kingdoms, because they'd already done Shogun Total War twice. They're like, oh, so now you care about China. Actually, Three Kingdoms is doing started to do pretty well, by the way, because I actually played it. And I hated the game at launch, but it was starting to get actually kind of decent. They added Korea to the map, and they're like, yeah, we're going to start adding more chunks of Asia, Mongolia, Manchuria. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is add Korea. Like, And they added Korea to the map. And then somebody up at CA, some of the higher exec, was like, nope, scratch that. We're actually going to start, we're going to take the Total War Warhammer formula, and we're going to break Three Kingdoms into three games. It's like, whoa. So Three Kingdoms has, like, it doesn't even reach the Three Kingdoms era. The game is just a lie. <laughs> it's almost and this it. is because of people like Kyle, who said, like, you're doing good now, CA. You, you're you doing good. You can screw us harder. And then CA did what CA does. What did I do, Arch? You don't even have anything to back up your You encouraged players. them. Encouraged them with what? You gave them praise instead of unsolicited, undaunting, unremittent hatred. The thing is, I give Three Kingdoms praise for what it is and was doing. Not for Precisely. what it became. A terrible mistake. Because they were taking the right steps. Whoever was making the decisions to basically make the game, well, into a game, <laughs> was doing a good job. Somebody else had to go and shoot him bang in the back of the head. Bada bing, bada bam, now he's dead in the ditch. So I actually hired um, former Forge World staffer uh, Anuj to work for them. Yeah. in developing their games. So he's the guy responsible for books 8 and 9 of the Forest Heresy. Did you say CA hired this guy? Mm-hmm. I did not know that. They did. He is working for them on Total War products. And he was the guy who, yeah, helped write, uh, basically wrote most of book 8 and book 9 for the Horus Heresy tabletop game. Is that good which or bad? Are not uh, they're not favorably viewed books. Not hated, but not favorably viewed, which in the scheme of a community that is thirsty for any content is damning. That's pretty bad, because that means that they're actually a lot worse than that. <laughs> or than that people are saying. Under Underwhelming and full of typos would be how i describe it best. Well, that's uh, concerning. But, that sounds uh, like CA material, right there. He does sound like well, he's cut out for the job. <laughs> it's kind of... Sounds like he's thoroughly qualified. So one of one of my favorite ones is um, in a White Scars army. White Scars. What would you say White Scars are most well known for, Arch? Being gay Mongolians with top knots. And what do they ride? Each Apart other. from men. Yes, yes. I knew it, and you were going to say it. But bikes. They are space Mongolians. Instead of horses, they have bikes. Well, their leader of the White Scars, Jagged Eye Khan, can't even lead an army of White Scars bikes because they didn't write that rule in. Whoops. <laughs> well, he took one too many to the backside and he can't ride anymore. Well, that's why he's off recovering in that Dark Eldar harem for the last 10,000 years. Damn. Billy little White Scar. He's like, I no longer <sighs> feel my pelvis. <laughs> They need to stop with the prime marks. Bringing back Gilliman was a mistake. Just stop with them. Just cease. See, cease. honestly, this is my opinion on the whole prime mark coming back thing. Every time I see people like, oh, they're going to bring back this prime mark. But I think this. Nobody's ever really gone. Star Wars thing. Nobody's <laughs> ever really gone. Sorry about family. Nobody's ever really gone, Chad. Like, nothing matters. The horse heresy doesn't matter. Everybody's going to come back to life. Everybody's going to be hunky dory. And like, <laughs> nothing mattered. They demystify the Horus Heresy by writing it. Well, it's, you can demystify it and, and make it work, but when it comes to some of like those key big moments, they're the things you don't expand upon. But that's exactly the things they went and expanded upon, and the Siege of Terror is a shit show because of it. 
And it's what's really hurting 40K is not bringing back Primarchs. Like, that you can live with if it's done well. The problem is, is they bring back probably the worst one in the form of Gilman to bring back. But if you brought back a Korax or maybe uh, a Vulcan and trying to have them or, or Khan trying to piece together the Imperium, that makes for interesting storytelling because that's exactly not the kind of work those guys can do. It's not yep. where their strengths lie. So you can have a lot of fun with it. Uh, same as like, you know, bring back Demon Primarch Magnus. Well, that makes no sense because now he's just been, they've totally changed his character. So he's now just a willing servant of Zinch. It's just kind of boring. Uh, whereas if you brought back like Perturabo trying to carve out an empire in the Materium, that might be interesting. Or Lorgar bringing back a bunch of religious fanatics. You can have fun with those. Characters that have a lot more strife to deal with. I mean, that's always better writing. A character that's already, what's the word? A Paragon character, basically, where they're, all their their qualms are solved and their, their story's basically over. They have no gro room for growth. But you're not wrong. Getting a character that wouldn't be fitting to restore the Imperium would be better because they would have to overcome the things that they're bad at and grow as a character. Well, there's nothing more grimdark than bringing back someone like this superhuman Primarch that's viewed basically as a deity by the people of the Imperium, and they can't achieve anything. The system is just so fucked, and they are basically powerless in the face of what the Imperium has become. That is the most like grimdark possible reality. Instead, with Gilliman coming back, it's like, and here's new space marines, and we're now stronger than the forces of chaos, and somehow they're still a threat to us because that's good storytelling. And yeah. <laughs> uh, Gilliman is in like six places at once, and if you check the timelines, he's in literally two places at once on the same timeline on the opposite sides of the galaxy. And he's, that is it's, terrible. It's an element of the left sneaking into Games Workshop, because this is uh, Fascismus 101. The enemy is always incredibly weak and pathetic, yet also always a constant overwhelming threat. Well, that's the way they're treating it. The dear leader will save us all. So yeah, you you could have had something really fun with it if like you had these Primarchs like yeah, like Corex or, or the or the Khan. What the hell is the Khan gonna do to the Imperium? This guy I ride out on bike, I chop things head off, yes? That is my that is what I can do for you, Imperium. I can ride out there and kill that thing. Like, oh no, but our government's in gambles, populations are starving, we have war across the whole Imperium. It's like I'm bike guy. I ride bike, yes. <laughs> just a total... Yeah, just how does the Khan deal with him? He'd probably just go back into the webway and just be like, fuck this. Like, I ride bike, cut wheat field? <laughs> we should reintroduce the bike and mice from Mars to the 41st millennium. Um, but they're not interested in that. a good it's... idea. Who, who wants to actually develop characters and write an engaging story when you can just have Rabute Gilliman? Well, I think part of the issue there lie in the fact that they don't sell stories. It's never been about Warhammer 40k or Warhammer Fantasy, well, at least not anymore. And it's it all about once. it's all about selling miniatures. Like they said uh, during the end times when the outcry happened, they basically like, we don't sell stories, guys. Quit fucking being, like, criticizing us and yelling at us. We just sell miniatures. That's all they sell. They've never, and they don't view it as a story. They don't really care about the writing so long as the model sells. Bit of, bit of member berries about it. I remember Cypher? No. Member berries. Hold them down. Hoon says, have you guys listened to the 40k Titan firing video on YouTube? In my opinion, some of the best sound design I have heard. I haven't watched, not listened to that, no. No, that was Kyle. His suggesting timeline is too full of the shit I make him look up on YouTube these days. True. Tragedy. <laughs> uh, Viking Kiwi says, why not both Amnesia and FNAF just become a horror channel? This is what I have advised Kyle to do for all eternity. For some not reason, advising he hasn't you, to me. He's advising you. I. And you. No, this is definitely you. This is you. This no. was for you, and you can't shift no. that. 
I don't want it. You have <laughs> become a horror channel. That's oh, that's been your destiny. To squeal loudly. Oh, mean derogatory terms being slung. <laughs> Mark ashamed. How much for commission of flood infected kibs? Don't want it. I refuse it. I don't want it either. But you can find artists on my Discord under the portfolio section if you're looking. Uh, and then he encourages it. Well, you know, artists are looking for work, and I'm not going to be mean about it. Okay. Well, I'm going to start sending you furry stuff now to remind you of what you're inviting. What? I'm trying to give people work. What are you doing? Some gay porn at you because that makes go. sense. I'm not opening that. Okay, let's look. I'm curious. That's the spirit. See? It's like, <laughs> I'm not opening that. Hold on. I'm curious. Okay, it's not so bad. It's like an 80s cartoon. I'll pull it up for chat. Crazy Loon says that the Elizabeth Warren meme team, Warren's Wagons, approve of Kyle's forced botch meme. Ah, it's pretty pathetic. I agree, Crazy Loon. You should be ashamed of himself. Biker mice. Optimus Jedi says Babylon 5 was far better than Deep Space Nine. They're both different. Though I do like Babylon 5 a lot. They're both different. Yeah, like they're they very different, different shows. God, one, God damn it. Like one's about a diplomatic space station. And both of them kind of have similar themes, but like Babylon 5 is different. And in a good way. You should watch it too. You should watch both. I just like him. I like it in Babylon 5, like, the whole reason, like, humans have the ability to get out into deep space is basically because someone thought it would be funny. Yep. <laughs> Which caused an let's... interstellar war, but don't worry about that. Yeah, let's just give them some, like, crappy old hyperdrives, so, like, crappy spacecraft that they can make. What's didn't, the worst that could happen? Didn't they buy it from the Narn or something? Because they're, like, peddling, like, crap to the humans. Like, here, have some guns, dude. And they're like, oh, thanks. Yeah, but it was... <laughs> It was like total crap, though, that like they got. It's like the Gen 1 hybrid, like no one else is using it. And they're like, oh, wow, we didn't actually think you would use that stuff. I do remember that. Ah, oh, it's a good show. Shame what happened Don't to his uh, sequel series. Uh, what? Shame about what happened to you, Kyle. <laughs> Skullgar Thane says, almost forgot, I was perusing the Android App Store recently for shiggles. Shiggles. And also these five different Wormer games, so GW has been busy there. Good. More shovelware. Always a beneficial thing. In fact, I want a franchise that is just nothing but shovelware. That would be fantastic. Mm, like uh, Star Trek. Yes. Yeah. Merch. Don Pete XX says, Let's remember that Gilliman solved a rebellion on Terra, talking out taking out highlands and military officers without breaking a sweat. Well, of course. It's Gilliman. It's what he does. That's the problem with returning the Primarchs. The Primarchs are a force of overwhelming power. That is the goddamn issue. The Imperium was supposed to be losing, and now they have an infinite supply of super-er, super space marines, being led by a Primarch, who have basically forgotten about his entire teachings. A Codex Astartes says you shouldn't have more than a thousand space marines at a time. Anything more is too risky. Leads a hundred thousand Primaris marines on a crusade. God, I hate Gilliman. Well, details are, and they forgot him. <laughs> Again, the people who make 40k have no idea what 40k is. Mako was the one who sent me this one, I think, where he sent me the uh, the Ultramarine Standard Bearer. Like, the 8th Legion Ultramarine, sir. Yes, yes, the 8th Legion. Famous. Oh, hey, yes. People get really antsy in the comments, and I had a lot of, back when you could see it, a lot of downvotes on videos where I talk about that stuff. Because I'd say, like, how can you screw that? And they go, oh, but, you know, it's just some poor guy in marketing doing it. It's like, I don't care. You got one job, and if you can't get a detail like that right, how can I expect you to get important things right? Yeah, if no, you're you good. Point. The thing is, this isn't a mistake that a that an interested party would make. That that is that is my key thing. Like, is it an insignificant detail? Absolutely, it's not going to affect anything. But this is not a mistake that a passionate developer would make. Like, it is like Total War putting out a an ad for Total War Three Kingdoms and then using the cover art from Total War Warhammer. Yeah. And honestly, these people are being paid for that. So it's not even a, it's not even a legitimate skew. Even if they're, let's say they're not passionate, they, it's just a job. Well then, okay, 
It's a, just a job. Do your damn job right. We're paying you money for X product. Don't fuck up X product. Yes. It is a sign of a lack of giving a shit, in my opinion. That is a severe thing that needs to be pointed out. Instead of just, it's just a silly mistake. It's the, la it's the latest silly mistake in a long line of silly mistakes. People turned around and they, it's, it's probably my, my most hated, like, if you want to actually get me to rage, people, when they turn around, and they say, oh, but it's just a game. Who cares? It's just some silly oh. tabletop game. It's like, okay. Then fuck it off. Is still a, Leave me it to is... my fucking tabletop game. Well, let's just think about it, though. Like, it's a f actual good being sold for real money. Like, like the end I'm, of the day, I'm not, I'm not even going to give them the benefit of the logical argument. Like, it's just a silly video game. Well, fuck off, then. My yeah. hobby. Go away. But, like, if, if, take it to court. If you took it to court, and imagine that. You're in the courtroom, and they're, they're arguing. Games Workshop turns around the lawyers to the judge, and they're like, oh, you know, it's just some silly tabletop game. The judge is like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Uh, we find in favor of the plaintiff. Games Workshop paid the damages. <laughs> it's good goods and services, regardless of whether or not it's a silly game or it's a piece of digital media or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's money being exchanged for a good and or service. Then it's got to apply certain qualities. It doesn't just get a free pass because, you know, it's escapism. Yep. Uh, what That's the right. The, like, that is, they, don't, they don't get a free pass there because then that logic could be extenuated to People who sell bananas, like, oh yeah, well the banana killed the kid. Yeah, we should have, you know, tested him, but you know, it's just a banana. <laughs> it's it's it might be an extremity, but it's the thing that you know these laws exist for a reason, right? I can't sell you, like, oh, you pay, hey, mock. I want to buy this space marine, and then I, it's like a picture of like a space marine, right? And then I just send him the picture of the space marine. But I I yeah. made him led to believe that it was the actual miniature. But it's just a piece of paper. So you're paper. selling NFTs. They yes. they released the Spacewolf <laughs> Codex in was it seventh edition or eighth edition of Spacewolf Codex? I uh, forget which one it was. They released the Codex and it was just outright missing pages from printing. Did they refund people or anything like that? No, no. They just released the pages that was missing in PDF and said, "Here's some missing pages." What the hell? See, that didn't happen to me when uh, I I had to return something from GW back when I was getting into it. So I was buying like a Lizardman book, right? And I got the I got the super rare one, and or not the rare one, but the collectible one. It's got the hard cover, magnetized, and it's got like constellation on. It looks super cool, but there's like a crack in it. I sent them a picture of that crack, and then they just sent me a new book, and they didn't even ask for the other one. <laughs> I have the amount of people that tell stories like that. I get so jealous of like, you know, people that are like, oh, my Titan had a mold line, so they sent me a whole new Titan. I had a uh, Blood Bowl miniature from Forge World. And I was like, oh, it's arrived with, like, all its fingers have broken off its hand or weren't molded on or whatever. And they're like, oh, okay. So they got that Blood Bowl miniature, like a spare arm, stuck it in an envelope, and then mailed it to me. And by the time they, it had arrived in my mailbox, all the fingers on that were broken because it was just in a paper envelope. <laughs> in transit because it wasn't protected. Oh, no. Yeah, and then, and then people, like, turn around and they're like, oh, I don't understand why you're so salty about Games Workshop. You should be, because you, you are being scammed. Because your region, for whatever reason, has decided to not treat you fairly, to not give you what basically they promised. Versus me, in my case, they gave me what I asked for, except they forgot to ask for the broken one back as proof, and just took the picture at face value, whatever. But still. I can totally see Kyle just breaking it right then and there. I have, it's on my phone, actually. My old phone in my drawer. Like, it's just my finger pointing to the crack like this. This is why I want, like, I want a replacement. It's, look at it. It's broken. Like, it's it bends 90 degrees. <laughs> That's the binding. It's not supposed to do that. Well, luckily, Games Workshop has understood that they can indeed and should treat Australian SAS third class citizens they're doing something right jokes on them we're just gonna mail them a box full of spiders oh that's cruel and speaking of doing something right four hours and 40 minutes later arch is hungry what well, no we're just getting You're... started so yes kyle you go away 
Marka, thank you very much for uh, showing up. It's been lovely having a uh, conversation with you. Oh, thanks very much for having me. It's been a ball. Kyle's been silent most of this, which is also good. Oh, you're just encouraging the wrong crowd again. Bad old Barch. This is lovely. Hot stir. And until tomorrow, where Kyle will be much more uh, vociferous, because he's going to throw somebody off a tower again, probably. Everyone should uh, have a happy day. Good day, even. Yes. Thank you all very much for your generous donations, and we will see you all again, hopefully, tomorrow with the Skaven RP. Until then, have a good day.